Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast and a joint uh, broadcast with uh, with Kyle Ashworth of Latter Gay Saints. Hey, Kyle. Hey, John. How are you? Latter Gay Stories. Latter Gay Stories. We should know these things. My brain. I don't know how I'm surviving this morning. I will say thank you for calling me by the right last name and not Kyle Hancock today. <laughs> That's why I forgot the name of Latter Gay Stories stories because i was trying to make sure not to use the wrong last name you have way too many kyles in your life i guess so i'm happy to be here happy to have our audience uh join in with the mormon stories audience as well to be able to bring uh what i think is probably um one of our um I, I don't often say historical, but one of these important topics uh, when we talk about excommunications, when we talk about the governance of the church, um, and then mix that in with the real lived experience of the LGBTQ community uh, within or without Mormonism, it makes for a super fascinating opportunity to do to really dive in and discuss kind of the inner working. So happy to be here, happy to uh, to be able to contribute and share the story for sure. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for all the work you do. And, and we welcome your audience for sure. Um, I also want to uh, welcome my, uh, my co-host in, in righteousness and goodness, mm -hmm. Gerardo. Hey, Gerardo. Hey, hey, John. Hey, everyone. You've done a lot of work to prepare for this episode. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Do you want to, Gerardo, do you want to kind of introduce it and kind of set it up a little bit? Yeah, I can. Um, all right, let's do this. So um, my friends, uh, Brennan and Douglas. So I went to BYU Idaho with Douglas um, and he was a convert to the church. We became roommates and fr really good friends. Um, I never knew he was gay. He was not out to me, but I was out to him. <laughs> and then he served a mission. Um, and after his mission, you know, I graduated and married and everything. And then he came out to me and told me that he was gay. And he started dating. After graduating, he married the love of his life. And then we are still really good friends. And um, they recently received a letter for a disciplinary counsel for his husband, Brennan. Um, and I thought it was kind of like a very interesting case that I'd never heard about. I um contacted a bunch of people like people that had been stake presidents before my dad i told him about the case who's a bishop and, and uh, they were all by how this thing was being handled so well, i told brandon and does that they should record every conversation including the disciplinary council um so you know they can they could know like what they were saying versus probably changing stories later um and that's exactly what happened you know they've been gaslighted and after disciplinary council the story about why they were brought in about why they decided to uh excommunicate him uh all the story has changed and it's been quite interesting to listen to the conversations so um they decided they wanted to come on mormon stories and latter gay stories and tell their story yeah and so so what we have today is an example of the LDS church, the Mormon church in 2022, proactively going after uh, a legally same-sex married couple to excommunicate them when uh, they were just living their happy, healthy life in a, in a legal loving marriage. And, in, and what, uh, what I think is kind of interesting is they weren't, trying to advocate for anything they weren't even trying to pass off as actively participating devout members they were just living a quiet um loving life i mean that's kind of how i'm seeing it kyle well, well and i think the other interesting part of the the story is we should also discuss i mean maybe two factors one with the latter gay stories podcast we've been following uh, a dozen couples who are in this very situation and as we can often talk about leadership roulette bishop roulette and, and what it looks like when a uh, one bishop will uh do or move forward with these witch hunts while another bishop will not um and as the church clarifies or an area authority comes out and discusses this how those uh excommunications or those opportunities of not having uh, these discussions uh, diminish and go away. 
so there's one aspect of that that we can talk about. The other aspect that we should also talk about is uh, the, the historical side of this. In April of 2019, the church uh, overturned or dismissed, uh, dismissed or uh, got rid of the November 2015 policy. And when they got rid of that November 2015 policy, they, uh, Elder Oaks specifically in that meeting in April of 2019 specifically said, we are now going to treat uh, heterosexual and homosexual um, relationships. relationships exactly the same. And so this is a question of, uh, or a story of leadership roulette, how a bishop or a stake president or a branch president um, handles same gendered married couples that reside in their boundaries. The second is, how do we define treating heterosexual and homosexual couples the same way in, in the church when we know there are not active witch hunts out there rooting out active or inactive cohabitating um, or even polygamous marriages or um, if you look at our more the the mom talk the mormon swingers that are happening um, these are all all different like varieties of of relationships that are not sanctioned by the church where are the witch hunts for those couples as well so i, I think this is a multifaceted opportunity to really dive into the subject i love it so without any further ado uh douglas and brennan welcome to mormon stories podcast how did that intro feel to hear your lives <laughs> being summarized and talked about by three people <laughs> it felt great yeah. um do, do you do you want to begin by maybe giving us a little bit just a brief background maybe to both of you and and then you can now, now that we've kind of given the audience kind of an overview of what maybe they can expect and this is going to be multi-hour interview today because we're going to be playing the audio from at least five different four or five different conversations um because it turns out it's, it's a real mess uh th there wasn't even a lot of coordination apparently between the bishop and the state president or or they were trying to walk back and create some uncertainty and doubt about whatever coordination there was and that's going to be part of what we can or we could look at or both right <laughs> So it's going to be a multi-hour episode, but it's for the historical record. And so, um, you know, why don't we have maybe Brennan, do you want to start and give a little background and then Douglas, you can give some background and then we can maybe introduce you, you, you all can introduce each of the audio clips and we can analyze them. Yeah, right. no, I def I definitely want to um, introduce ourselves because uh, I feel like getting a picture of who we are is going to be in important to this. Um, I mean, Kyle said that we're not, out here seeking the church. Um, we're not trying to persecute them. We're not trying to go after them. Um, so I, yeah, I really uh, do want to take the opportunity to introduce ourselves. Um, so my name is Brennan Fan, um, formerly Brennan Porter. Um, I was born and raised in uh, Meridian, Idaho, um, and grew up there, uh, went to college, um, met Doug uh, while I was in college. Um, I met him online and you know, we, uh, um, he asked me out, which I was very impressed by because usually I'm the one who will initiate and ask somebody out. Um, did you grow up LDS? Can you talk yeah, a little bit sure. about that, your so, parents and mm -hmm. so I grew up in the church. Um, I, uh, am, I have a huge family. Um, I have, uh, 15 brothers and sisters, um, seven in my family and the nine step siblings. Um, so I guess you're, you're classic, uh, you know, LDS Mormon family. Um, was raised going to church, uh, went every Sunday until I was 18. Um, served a lot of callings. I was a Dietrich's quorum president, priest quorum, uh, you know, advisor to the bishop. Um, I how did about, a lot in the church. How about the Melchizedek priesthood? Um, I never received the Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, I knew by the time that I was graduating high school and when I was turning 18 that um, the life that I wanted to lead was not um, in line with what the church wanted me to do. Um, so I felt like if I was going to be uh, going to get the Melchizedek priesthood, I was just going to be digging myself into a, a deeper hole um, that I need to because I didn't feel like I needed to have the Melchizedek priesthood. I didn't plan to go on a mission. Um, I knew that if I were to go on a mission, I would make covenants to... Uh, not pursue a same-sex relationship um and then if i were to just come back from my mission and do that it just seemed nonsensical 
So I'm, I'm glad I knew before I went on my mission um, that, so. Kind of dodged a bullet a little bit. Yes, I did. Yeah. I think this is a really important part of his story because, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk a lot about my dad because all of these things about how the church works, I learned them from him. Who's an active bishop. Who's an active bishop, yeah. yeah. And he served in state presidencies? Yeah, he's served in state presidencies, mission presidencies. Um, He's always talked about how there's the written rules of the handbook, but then there's also these unwritten rules that are talked about in uh, when when stake presidents and bishops are receiving their trainings. And one of these unwritten rules is that someone receiving the Melchizedek priesthood um, has made like a higher commitment to the church and has like higher covenants. So before you receive your Melchizedek priesthood, Disciplinary councils are rare, are very, very, very rare, uh, because the understanding of the gospels is known to be probably less than someone that you know it's an elder or has served a mission. So that that is part of like you know what the bishop should consider when thinking if they should even call for a disciplinary council. Um, so yeah, I just want to bring that up. Like he's still a priest, not even an elder, and well, as we were gonna know. He, he was called for a disciplinary council. And I've, and I've heard that a lot, that that you you really don't go after and excommunicate people if they haven't been through the temple, gotten out their endowments, and made that extra level of commitment. Correct. And then we can add on this layer that we're not excommunicating based on same-sex relationships either, uh, which is the, the edict from the church coming from April of 2019. So not only you, you have all of these layers, it's like, how many more gates do we have to to spend time unlocking and fiddling with to walk through in order to get to the point where we're holding a membership council if it's not just for this overall witch hunt or seeking someone specifically for a certain topic and, and i think that's kind of what i want to focus on and discuss throughout this this opportunity or this this episode today because um when we have church leaders that go rogue that kind of distance themselves from uh, the handbook of instructions. And I, and I get what Gerardo is trying to say here in terms of the spirit of the law and letter of the law. But it, it's interesting to me that Mormonism has created this fail safe within its doctrine and its policy to say, well, if, if the policy and doctrine and the handbook uh, isn't sufficient, then the church leader as a judge in Israel, and we'll talk about that later in the, the episode, the church leader is the judge in Israel has his own personal res revelation and and is able to make those decisions. So the church will win regardless of of which side of of that policy and handbook or personal revelation discussion we're having. Um, under both circumstances, the church has developed a way for them to be right and correct. And, and I think that's the problem when we get into the real lived experiences of the LGBTQ community in or out or nuanced within this space in, in Mormonism. And, and, and that's, to me, a, a pivotal, a pivotal part, part of this uh, episode. Well, one more thing I'll, I'll add on to this for, from my story that applies um, is once I realized that I didn't want to receive the Melchizedek, Melchizedek priesthood, it was around that time I, I knew I didn't want to um, uh, be attending church either. And not, we'll go more into depth of this, but um, by the time that I was called to this disciplinary council, I had been inactive for four years. So I hadn't attended church. Um, and You also the, moved. I yeah moved out moved boundary. out of stake boundaries. This was the first contact I had had from any church authority um, for four years. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. after not having attended church for four years, um, there was a conversation three years ago that we'll talk about. But and I think Doug brings up a, a really time. important point. We're not talking about a bishop in your current ward where you live or your current boundaries. No. This is a bishop from years prior in a old ward who's now making this disciplinary council a reality for you. Unbelievable. Yeah. And we just got a comment from Jennifer in this. I think this helps drive the point home. Jennifer writes, I've been with my partner for years, not married, never had anyone from the church come at me. So, you know, how many heterosexual couples out there are, are living with partners? Is the church hunting down and proactively finding out of ward boundaries and excommunicating heterosexual couples that are single, 
left the church. And so there, I think, Gerardo, part of why you chose the title persecuted by the Mormon church is this idea of hunting season, where the church is like proactively, literally hunting down legally same-sex married couples that are just trying to live their own lives. You know, And let's not pretend like this is just so new that we haven't been able to implement this policy yet. <laughs> April 2019, April 2020, April 2021, April 2022. So we've had multiple years now for the church to institute this. We will treat heterosexual and homosexual relationships the same in terms of discipline. I just, I know, I know the church slow rolls on a few things, but that seems like a long time for the bishops to get all on the same page. <laughs> well, same-sex marriage was legalized in 2015, so it's been seven years. So I'm, I'm saying after they changed the policy from oh, right. homosexual relationships okay. being apostates to okay. we're going to treat them the same. Yeah. If the argument is, well, uh, okay, I see. Yeah, uh, well, we have hetero. We haven't yet found all the heterosexual uh, cohabitators in our ward yet. I mean, how many years is it going to take right. you to? We can get funeral potatoes delivered in minutes, but we can't figure out who's cohabitating in our ward, especially the way Mormons talk. So to me, I'm just saying, like, we've given the church plenty of time if, if that was the true uh, answer yeah. to that question. Yeah, I want to uh, give Doug the opportunity to introduce himself, too, because he, he is my other half and he plays a, a big role in this story, too. So. Welcome, Doug. Hey, um, yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, I was born and raised in Vietnam. Um, I left to go to school at BYUI in um, 2013, the end of 2013. I was baptized and a convert to the church um, in early 2013. Um, and so I went to BYU Idaho and then met Gerardo. And then I think he kind of helped me introduce uh, that part. Went on a mission in Houston, actually, because I know Yay. you used to live in Houston. Yay. <laughs> um, it was a great time, uh, but that's where I kind of figure out my sexuality, and that's when I came back from my mission. So um, you came out to your mission president, right? Yep. That was the very first person that ever said it to that, hey, I think I'm gay. Mm -hmm. And how did he react? He was super loving. Um, I honestly love both of my mission presidents. Um, you know, I think it's because of them that I was active until I, you know, otherwise I would probably just left the moment I could. Mm. get off my mission but they they help guide me through and you know i i stay active for like about a year or after until my you mission. graduated yeah yeah so. as a missionary what did that do for you in terms of um your ability to work and focus on the mission now that that big revelation was out now that not only someone else outside of you knew that you were gay um was there was there a mental shift was there a feeling of peace was there something inside that changed after being able to come out um yes uh, so when i came out to my mission president i thought i was like i'm gonna get sent home but with his response um and how he just kind of was sticking on my side the whole time for the rest of my mission it just felt like okay this is not a horrible thing i can still be active and being gay you know but you know as as i came home from my mission that does not last, you know. That's right, and I think this is a good. This is a good point. We see this often on the latter gay story side of it. We have uh, re, uh, missionaries currently serving who pay attention to our podcast and listen to these episodes. And I think maybe this is just a, a, a case in point that if you are serving a mission currently, listening to episodes like this, trying to discover who and what you are. Um, almost all of the cases unanimously where missionaries were able to come out to their mission presidents have been positive. And, and I think that should be noted that the church uh, or at least mission presidents, um, and maybe it's because, maybe it's because they're close to the missionaries. Maybe it's because they have a relationship with them. Maybe it's because they do actually con are concerned about care and love uh, these young elders and sisters and where they're at the grassroots of this topic, they're interested in them. And I think that's important to note that, um, and in your case, um, Doug, to be able to have a mission president show forth a, an extension of love and, and care and concern to you, I, I think that's super important. And so for missionaries out there who are currently serving or, or preparing to serve and are still closeted, my personal recommendation is if it feels right to you in those president interviews, have those discussions. Um, because I, I have seen very positive outcomes come from it. Not only just the, the revelation of being able to come out and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm gay and, and 
being forefront with that that discussion, but also it, it does increase the ability to to work and and maybe move on a little bit. I don't know if that was part of yeah. your overall experience as well. Most definitely. I love them both and I you know, I still do. Um so what you're saying, I can definitely attest to that. And, um, and, and in, the era, in the era of COVID, where missionaries are locked up in their apartments, and, and we're now kind of moving away from that, but a lot of missionary work currently is online. It's on Facebook. It's in the marketplace uh, ad section of, of these online portals. That's where a lot of these elders and sisters are, are doing their missionary work. But it's not out knocking doors, and it's not out forgetting about who and what you are. So many missionaries went out into the field to say, I'm just going to lose myself in the work, forget about all these things, and then hopefully this all goes away. And when they're locked up in an apartment, when they're cooped up and, and only with the internet and their thoughts, that becomes really, really disastrous in terms of, of overall mental health. So that's my point in, in having this discussion about coming out and, and being more transparent about who and what you are. Often I don't like calling it the coming out. I like calling it the letting in and letting people into your life and seeing you for um, all of what you are. I I want to say that I, I'll forever be thankful for his stake president for being that person for him because... Mission president. Uh, sorry, his mission president um, being that person for him because I, I know that if the experience wasn't as... didn't go as well as it did, I don't know if we would have met. I don't know if you would have felt comfortable exploring your sexuality after after the mission. Mm -hmm. We might not even be married if the mission president had that kind of, you know, a, a negative reaction and really made you feel terrible about yourself. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that um, he was able to be that person real. For sure. Well, let's, uh, let's hear the story. I think let's where, do where, it. Well, Doug, Doug, do you feel like you yeah. um, shared everything mm -hmm. you wanted to share? Okay. We're so grateful that, I mean, we are we are mindful that anytime you're telling your story very publicly it comes at a personal cost emotional cost stress potential family relationships friendships just psychological load and so we appreciate it's not and it's not your job to educate all of us and it's not your job to fall on your sword and sacrifice your privacy and your well-being so that the church can do better and so that we can all understand what's going on. So I just want to say we don't take that for granted. And we really appreciate that, that you're willing to do this. Because um, it, uh, I think we, we have a sense for how hard that might be at least a sense. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. So thank you. Okay, where should we begin in terms of uh, today's story? Where is our Genesis one one? <laughs> <laughs> I can start a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we're just hanging out in our couch this one nice Wednesday evening, and then there's a knock on the door. And I, I just, sorry, I just oh, want to make this clear. So you had moved out. How far away from your home ward where you grew up? So I was raised in Meridian and went to church there. Okay. I, I moved to Boise, mm -hmm. the capital of Idaho. He's in college. Um, at this in college, going to Boise State. Uh, and you were living together at the time. Living mm -hmm. together, um, small, remote apartment uh it's kind of got like a back entrance like you, you gotta go and find it for sure um like a student apartment <laughs> yeah yeah um you never transferred your records from your old ward because you never attended church you hadn't attended church in four years yeah. um so after after i graduated high school i did try going to singles ward okay because that was but the record what, what you were supposed to do but my records we you know learned it never moved over okay. um because i was only there for two sundays um, yeah. Okay. And just so people that are not from here can just get an idea, how far is that where you were going to college from your home? Um, ward? It's about a, a, for me, it's a 20 minute drive. If you're driving, you know, <laughs> at a normal pace, it's like 30 minutes. Okay. You know? And it's about, and it's a different stake. Yes, that right? completely yeah. different steak. Okay. Definitely completely different, different steak. Probably right. like three steaks over two. All right. I don't know exactly. So, okay. Continue. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, hanging out Wednesday night, knocking on door, um, and then Brennan comes out and opens the door, and there's these two men. I was just sitting. I was like, there's two dudes, it, you know, soliciting a, at an apartment complex it was at, 8 night. at night. Yeah, yeah this was 8.30 at night. <laughs> that was weird. Uh, and then 
they deliver a letter. I heard, I knew that they were from church because they were talking, like, we're from so-and-so mm-hmm. ward. And then I, rec- I recognized one of them. Um, the other I, I didn't recognize, but um, they introduced themselves and um, uh, they... I asked, you know, what I was like, well, you drive, I, I actually said, well, you drive, you drove all the way across town. You know, I think I said, I think I said, thank you for taking the time, which <laughs> I was trying to be polite. Um, but I, I took the letter and I, I started opening it like and, right in front of them. Yeah. And they kind of had this look like, oh, maybe we should like go away now, you know, um, <laughs> before he starts reading it. Um, and I saw the, the, the line, which said, you are being called to a membership disciplinary council um, on the basis of your conduct related to same-sex marriage. Um, and so I, I didn't say anything to them. I, I let them go and, um, and then we closed the door and kind of looked at each other and I was like, babe, you need to, you know, you need to come and look at this. Um, Did they make faces? Was, was there any verbal reaction from them? Were they just standing awkwardly as you read it? Oh, so, um, uh, so I was opening the letter I I'd, I'd briefly skimmed it, but before I went to, you know, call Doug over, I had let them go. So okay. they so they headed out. Um and we read it and it took it, we talked for a little bit about like what it meant and I was like what, you know, what is a membership council because I I'd, I'd heard of disciplinary councils before, but I didn't know if the membership council was the same thing, so we talked about mm-hmm. it and it took us a, a a a bit of conversation to figure out like the the weight and the immensity of like what this meant right and so we were like oh my gosh we need to call Gerardo and no, so I like, text Gerardo right away <laughs> so so the two people who came to your door um I'm, I'm assuming these are members of the bishopric they are yes uh first and um uh I don't know it was the ward clerk and then the second counselor I believe but not um, the bishop himself no no not the bishop. or anyone that you even knew I, re- I recognized one of them but I had no idea who he was. Like I couldn't put a name to him. So, and, and for those who are unfamiliar with the way these ward and state boundaries work, um, this is like equivalent of someone crossing state lines in mm-hmm. order to find you. It's like jumping on an airplane and flying to from Utah to Nevada in order to go deliver this letter. When when you're in different stakes, that is a completely different jurisdiction. A stake is like a diocese, so it, it's it's this different arena different area that you're completely unfamiliar with and and they really are out of their territory they're they're out of their location and so you hop on a hop on an airplane jump in a car and drive to go find somebody to deliver this letter people they've likely never met before they've probably never met you brennan um or at least the relationship isn't there so I, th- I just think this is fascinating. This is mm-hmm. so strange the way this starts to unfold. Yeah, because and Brennan was so confused too of how they got the address because we'd never give this new address. It was not in the church record or anywhere um, to be found. Mm-hmm. It was my immediate reaction. I was like, "There's no way that they would have been able to know this." And I so I, and uh, that night I went to LDS Tools and I looked at the address. It wasn't the address that they had appeared to us at. The, our, our apartment was not in LDS tools. Um, and so I was so confused. I was like, how would they have gotten it? Which, which address was in LDS tools? Um, it was, okay. Give them a fake address. It, it was, it was, it was an old address, but I changed the house numbers because I just got this feeling that I didn't want it to be accurate. I, I grew up in a conspiracy theorist family. So like <laughs> anti-government kind of thing. So I was like, mm, maybe I shouldn't put my actual address. So I switched it around um, to an address that I, you know, technically wasn't living at um, but it was close it was it was yeah it was on the same street it would have been the same zip code same ward and stake boundaries but yeah um so how did they wasn't one of your first questions how did they have fa- find your actual address mm-hmm, no. yeah um and uh, i can't remember if it was that night or not but i yeah i called my um older sister um uh, because usually when stuff goes down in our family we call most of us will call her this older sister. She's mm-hmm. like the go-to for like, you know, I don't know if we can curse on podcasts, but um, <laughs> stuff's going down. Um, <laughs> uh, be, be natural. You can yeah, be natural. shit's going down. <laughs> um, and so I called her. I and, am out of here. I cannot handle this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I called her and I told her that I had received this letter. And I was like, uh, my sister, um, I was like, I, 
I don't know how they got this. And address. I, I don't know how they got this address. And I, I got scared because the only way that they would have been able to, the only con the person of contact that would have my address that's near them is my mom who still attends that ward. And so I told her and I was like, I'm really scared that mom like threw me under the bus, you know, that she knew what was going on and knew that they were going to hold this council and still gave them the address. You know, that, that was something that was really scary to me because we're going to be having our, our wedding reception in her, in, in my parents' backyard. And so it was, it created this like this dichotomy and dissonance of like, it, it didn't make, it wouldn't have made sense, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure if she would have done it, you know? Um, and it was really scary. Um, so did you ask her eventually? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I tried to call her that night. Um, but it was too late. Uh, and, um, so I called her the next day and I was like, mom. Um, so I, I got this letter and there's no way that they would have been able to get my address to, you know, deliver this to us. Do you know, did you, did you give them my address? And she was like, I, I did. And I was like, so did you know anything? And she's like, no, I had no idea. She told me that she, she had thought they were coming to update records. They were coming to update my membership, you know, as I would think that is routine, but, um, she had no idea that it was for the reason of the council. Um, and how long before you received the letter had she given them your address? So we got the the letter on May May fourth. May fourth on a Wednesday. May fourth on a Wednesday um, of twenty twenty two. Twenty twenty two. Yep. They had gotten the address three days prior that Sunday, mm-hmm. May first. So, yeah, it's pretty soon after. I'm telling you, the church is now finally running at lightning speed when it <laughs> comes to something they really want to do, right? Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, and, and if it's okay, do you mind if I ask a question from one of the? It, it's it's not a fun question. It's it's probably an insulting question, but I want to get really clear on this point before we spend time talking about the disciplinary council. Of course, our resident believer viewer Dan Hardy. And I'm just going to summarize what he basically is saying. He's saying is you didn't want to advance in the priesthood. You didn't go on a mission. You weren't active in the church. You didn't want to be a member. You probably knew this marriage. Um, and, and you got same-sex married anyway. Why do you even care that they would hold disciplinary counsel at all? And I guess Dan would probably say, why should anyone care? You didn't really want to be a member. Anyway, I, have a, I want to respond very strongly, but I, I don't want to... I don't want to be the first to respond. <laughs> so do you have a response? And then I'll, I'll want Kyle and Gerardo if they want to add something. To clarify why we cared enough about the membership council to attend. Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. Give, given that you'd already gotten rid of your association with the church in terms of mm-hmm. activity levels. So right. so why, uh, why not just fall over and let the church get what they want when you weren't even a believer or all in um, like... Dan and others. So why is it that you're different? Right. Why right. why put the church on such a pedestal? I think it's like yeah. why why do you care even if the church excommunicated you? And why should anyone else care mm-hmm. that the church excommunicated you? I think those are the right. two answers. Yeah, I'll just say right now, I I was before before receiving this this letter, I was comfortable going on my own time to remove my records, to, you know, meet with the bishop, send a letter in um to remove my records. But the the fact that I was sought out and and found for this that all this work was done to find me it it made me feel like i needed to respond in some way or it's like i was called to court so i'm gonna go to court you know um to kind of state my case um because if if they were going to take the time to i was going to 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 see it through um and i think people should care about this because this is evidence that the the church even though they say that they're not and they're not going to go after same-sex married couples that they are Mm -hmm. and so if i if i could go in there and um get proof and and show that um then i i feel like i can help um other gay people who might be at risk for being called to a council be aware of it so they can know going in or know what to do um and so 
my my real thing is to to make sure that other gay couples or gay people cannot be persecuted by the church yeah, um, that they know that this is happening yeah and because, so oh sorry yeah because i mean a lot of some i mean some of my friends they, they're bishops and they, yeah will welcome you and to them they think oh all bishops are like that you mm -hmm. know but this is also kind of our way of holding the church accountable because it's it seems like whether they do this in the political sense they make countless attempts to try to remove themselves from being held accountable from anything. Um, they do everything in their power to make sure nobody can fault them for what they do inside disciplinary councils, inside the church, whatever they do, because it's a religious exemption and because they're a religious organization, they are completely absolved from um, anybody, you know, saying that they're wrong or, you know. And just to be clear too, you were not intending to go public about your story, about the conversations, up your decision to come out publicly about it was just recently made from the last conversation with you had with the state mm -hmm. president last ambition. Yeah. And so I, you were recording all this, but I remember talking to you guys and you were still not sure if you wanted to talk mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, I remember you asking us, um, because I think you understood kind of the, the weight of this. I, I, like and especially after the disciplinary council, you're like this. This is like worthy of a, of a podcast. Like people should know this already at this point. But even a, even at that point, I was like, I I don't know because um, I didn't I didn't want to make this a personal vendetta against my bishop and stake president. Um, so you knew him. Yeah, you wanted so I wanted to give him. them the benefit of. The I doubt. wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I didn't. I wasn't convinced fully of all these atrocities um the gaslighting was getting to me but um i wasn't convinced of everything until the, the last meeting that we just had um last sunday so and i've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of latter-day saints who are um still trying to make the church work or feeling some level of nuance and I think the thing that is often lost in this part of the discussion um, from believers, active Orthodox, um, traditional Latter-day Saints, is that they believe this is their church, that they're operating the church um, the Orthodox way because that's the way the church should be run. But for so many of these gay Latter-day Saints, LGBTQ Latter-day Saints, it's their church too. And even though they identify as, as queer somewhere along the spectrum, this is their church too. This is their community. This is their belief. This is their support system. This is their sense of community. This is their family. This is their tradition. This is their history. These are all things that are intrinsic to them as well. And so it isn't just Dan's church. is isn't, isn't just an active Latter-day Saints church. It is the church that belongs in many different factions and facets and pieces to all of us. And isn't that the, the part of being... Zion, isn't that what the church is, is trying to, to promote? Is this idea of inclusion of all? And that many, I mean, the coat of the, the, the coat of colors, this, this rainbow pattern of this tapestry of many voices and, and the, the church is calling it the chorus. The, the church really needs a, a variety of voices in order to make the choir work. And if we isolate, as, as many Latter-day Saints believe, we isolate these factions uh, that, that don't look like us, don't act like us, don't speak like us, if we isolate them out of the church, and, and your bishop brought this up in, in your membership council, and I want to talk about it a little later, but if we get rid of all the voices that are different, then, then we have an echo chamber, and we have lost the revelatory power of what the church claims it is. And, and I think that is part of this discussion that is so often lost by traditional conservative Orthodox Latter-day Saints who just say, look, you don't look, talk, act, or, or believe like me, therefore get out and, and just dismiss us and let us continue um, believing the way we believe. But then I say, doesn't that violate an article of faith? Don't we allow all people the opportunity to worship how, when, where, uh, or what they may and and it's just this constant circle of dissonance mm -hmm. and then it, oh go ahead i was going to say I, I was just going to lead into the the first audio oh, file but oh no I'll, I'll just trail and just say one quick thing just um i think it's uh, i'll be echoing a bit but i think it's important for um lgbtq latter-day saints to understand that if they try to remain active and faithful in the church that they're not they're not safe that if they have the wrong bishop or the wrong stake president, they're going to they're going to be hunted and excommunicated in a barbaric way. That's number one. So they're not safe. 
Number two is the church is, you know, it's a, it's a, a half trillion dollar organization at this point, hundreds of billions of dollars. They're great at collecting tithing. They're great at defending people, you know, the sexual predators, you know, they're really good at doing what they need to do when they care about it. Um, but they are this, this whole process that we're going to show shows how careless and thoughtless and irresponsible they have been with, uh, with this issue of legal same, same sex marriage and how mm -hmm. they're treating you. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing that I just want to say is this is, a this is, you know, the church through its PR wants to give the impression that the church loves gay people, that the church is friends with David Archuleta, that the church cares about LGBT people that they're not discriminatory they want to make all this press about how they collaborate with lgbt people to make laws that don't discriminate they want that public perception but behind the scenes they're quietly hunting down and excommunicating people and i just want to have i want to ask you all the viewers to listen to the bishop and the stake president and the system that they've been put in because we're about systems not people Look about the the system that the bishop and the stake president have been put in and just ask yourself, would Jesus, would the Prince of Peace, would Jesus hunt down and excommunicate two people for getting legally same-sex married and being in love? That's a great point, John, because I think at the end of the day, every time I publish one of these excommunication stories and we bring up this topic, the comments that are that are most prolific and duplicate are where is christ in this where is christ in this and i think that's a valid question when you listen to this say where and and in terms of mormonism the baptismal covenants of mourning with those that mourn and comforting those in need of comfort where is the mourning where is the comfort where is christ in all of this great something that's gonna it's really interesting about this case too is that brennan being a priest not an elder was sought out for this and douglas who has served a mission has done temple covenants but his records just happen to be in a different ward which by the way his leaders know that he's married to to brennan is that right mm -hmm. yeah he was not sought out uh so it just shows the bishop roulette that it's just yeah how 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 much like depends on how homophobic your bishop is um right. i guess yeah. and how, oh how you're gonna being no, being a go. being a church attending gay person risks you're you're by attending church you're you're risking the muskets yeah um it's kind of show that Elder those, would say, the but, holy spirit doesn't work all the time like to, yeah. to all the bishops not consistent um yeah. and that's a very that's a really valid concern because a lot of people will say well um i have a higher chance of being excommunicated or or found if I'm attending church actively, therefore they try to worship on their own. And, mm -hmm. and I think COVID gave a lot of Latter-day Saints some some latitude at being able to still worship how, where, when, and, and what they may, uh, because it was home church or Zoom church. But that some really isn't, room. yeah, that, that really isn't the case anymore. Um, the church is now excommunicating for same gender relationships or same gender marriage, whether you're active or inactive. And, and I think that's a, another, ounce of this that is yeah. so mind-boggling to yeah. me mm -hmm. i i, I want to be able to really get into this because a lot it. of a lot of these topics we're going to come over in these let's do it um let's do it all righty so um once i'd received the letter and had read it um the, a lot of questions had kind of my mind we have a slide with the letter if you just want to yeah so people can read it we're not probably going to read it so but, these are the mm -hmm. dates for what we're going to be covering mm -hmm. so here's yeah. the actual letter is that the letter yes yeah. it is okay um so i'm reading this letter and a lot of questions are coming to my mind about what this is about why now um should we read who i can bring yeah uh we can yeah read it real quick all right uh may 3rd 2022 to brennan from bishop dear brennan the bishopric is holding a membership council in your behalf the council will be held on may 26th at 8 30 p.m at the chapel um the council will consider your conduct related to church policy on same-sex marriage. You are invited to attend the council to give your response. You may provide written statements from persons who could provide relevant information. You may invite such persons to speak to the council in your behalf, if approved in advance by the bishopric. Upon arrival, please be seated in the chairs outside of the bishop's offices on the whatever side of the building. 
Anyone who attends must be willing to comply with the respectful nature of the council, including its procedures and confidentiality. Legal counsel and supporters beyond those referred to above may not be present. Brennan, I loved working with you in the Aaronic Priesthood Quorum several years ago. While some of our present values may differ, I am hopeful that we can find mutual respect, beliefs, and understanding respectfully, Bishop so-and-so. Um, you can tell just by reading it that the 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 first three paragraphs are boy, auto generated. Boy, yeah. Um, the only thing that the bishop actually wrote directly to me was the last one, and he spelled my name wrong. Um, if you B R E N N A A N, which it's E N. Okay. Um, so that's how you can tell that's oh where he goodness, started. That's crazy. Um, but you know, uh, adding in that that personal uh, connection and factor to, you know. I guess in his mind to make me feel comfortable. See, for those um, of us who serve missions, we call this build relationships of trust. What we're doing is that, we're creating this friendship. For people that don't don't know better or members that haven't had enough experiences um, with with the church and its leaders, they don't notice this kind of. I remember Douglas calling me even after this disciplinary council or right before, telling him telling me like that Brennan was falling for you know, the, the love and whatever um, nice words the bishop was telling him while at the same time, the bishop's telling him, we're going to excommunicate you. Yeah. So I, um, I'm just dying to ask the bishop, what values do you are, are different? You have different values. Are you describing so, to? Yeah. Like your, Brendan, I'm assuming your values are just like committed love, mm -hmm. right? Legal, legal committed love. Are those your values? Yeah. And I, I, and, and I, I Sorry, I, I trust the people in my life who show me love and who show me compassion. And so to me, the bishop and the stake president before have both showed me that. And I know that. Um, and that's what was, you know, um, uh, kind of put me off on not realizing what was happening around me um, because I, 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 I trusted them for, you know, um, the goodness that they had showed me in the past. Um, so anyway, um, I had all these questions from the letter, and so I decided to uh, call the bishop to um, answer all these questions, and um, we'll just hear from it now. So this is the recording of your first conversation with your bishop after receiving the yep. letter. Is that yep. right? It is a phone call. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. and he called the bishop the same night that we got the yeah, letter. Yeah, same night, uh, okay. like two hours later. All right. He probably wasn't able to get his passport approved to make it over to your... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to give the bishop the benefit of the doubt here. Yeah. Exactly. And we were for a long time. All right. So here's uh, that recording. Uh, okay. Uh, May, and this is May 4th, 2020. Here we go. Um, I got your letter from uh, brother. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, brother. And, um, about the the membership council, um, yeah. it looks like you wrote it yesterday. Uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah, um, I guess I had a couple questions. Um, sure. So uh, um, I'm not really sure what exactly a, a full membership council is. I think it kind of explains it. Um, and it talks about you know inviting persons to also be at the council. Um, so yeah, I guess I was curious what the membership council is, and then sure. it, who you know I, I have people that I would like to bring, but I wanted to talk to you about it. Sure. Okay. And um, that's one that. Um, so with these types of things, it's anytime there's if someone has I know that you and I have already talked about some of this before. Um, anytime someone has something that may um, put what they do at odds with kind of those certain standards in the church, then we hold a membership council. Um, with that, it usually is one of those things where sometimes people come and say, you know what, I don't really want to be a member of the church anymore. Or someone can say, I do want to be a member of the church. Um, and so it's really one of those things where we look at, um, we look at that and then there's really kind of three possible outcomes with it. Sometimes people after a membership council, they'll just remain in good standing, you know, no change. Sometimes it can be, um, they can have a withdrawal of membership, um, where they're no longer a member of the church. And then sometimes there can be um, some formal discipline, which is, um, you know, maybe they say, well, for a year it changes things. And so really this is a chance to come in and say, hey, you know, this is where I am. Um, so it gives you an opportunity to say, this is where I am. This is kind of what I'm thinking. Um, 
in the case of um, kind of what things are going on right now, it might be one of those, um, you know, I, I'm not planning on changing any of the things that I'm doing right now. Um, I'm happy with where I am. And, and that's one where um, it kind of gives you an opportunity to say, hey, this is really what, what I'm looking to do. Um, and I don't really plan on changing anything or I do plan on changing things. And so it's really kind of that, that type of a thing. In saying that, there are some people who say, you know, I don't really want to come into it. So do you have to come to it? The answer to that is no. Um, but I, we always like to give you a chance to come and say, hey, this is kind of where I am personally. And um, so it gives you an opportunity to just kind of talk about all of that. Right. Um, I, I guess I, I've had intentions of kind of clearing cl or clarifying my relationship with the church. Um, I just haven't really gotten around to it. Um, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, so I think I I think I will come in for the for the council. Um, uh, um, th I appreciate you explaining more about it um, and kind of what comes of it and you know what's happened before and what people do and yeah. Um, so with with coming to the council, um, I mean because it's it's in, it's really in relationship to um, my relationship with Doug. Um, I mean, as, as my, my husband, because we're married, um, is it okay if, if he's there as well? He can certainly come. Yep. Okay. And that's, that's one where, um, with that, um, same type thing, you know, he's welcome to come. We just, um, one thing that I like people to know is these things are all done confidentially, right? So sometimes, uh, I don't know if this is one of your questions, you can always say, are you going to be talking to my mom about it? The answer is no. Um, you know, that's one that um, I don't talk to anybody about it. I don't talk to my spouse about it. I just talk with, with you. The other members of the bishopric are there. It's, um, when we say it's a confidential thing, it's one that um, it's really kind of nobody else's business. It's really just just you. And then, um, you know, Doug's welcome to come too. Okay. Um, that's, yeah, that's good to hear. Uh, um, because, yeah, for, for me, he is, he is my other half. Yeah, I'm pausing for just a second because I think Doug wanted to speak yeah, up. Yeah, um, when I heard this part, I felt like, Okay, he he said I could come, but right after that he said, "But usually, for these kind of things, you don't talk to your spouse yet. So like it's kind of discouraging that I come. But I guess because Brandon wanted to bring me, he could bring me. Was he saying that he doesn't talk to his own spouse about it? Yeah, mm -hmm. these are these are the yeah. kind of thing that even I wouldn't talk to my spouse or my mom about it. It's an interesting thing why he followed up with that because later on his reasoning for allowing Doug to be there was so that I could feel more comfortable. But he doesn't say any of that in this call. Mm -hmm. um, he only says that when we're, you know, going after him and uh, because uh, it seemed, anyway. Um, but he said that it's because he, wa he wanted me to feel comfortable, but instead he wants to say, well, we, we need to keep this confidential. That's really, you know, the precaution in you coming. It's not because we want you to feel comfortable. We just, you know, you can be there, just you need to not, you know, keep it between you two right. basically and the reason i brought this up because i know that with these kind of counsel a lot of time it's like five four men's in a room that are church <laughs> leaders and then the one person being you know ass and that one person that's scary has no you know like it's based on that one person word so i feel like that's a lot the reason why a lot of people don't come out about excommunication because it's their own word no one else was there to testify and that's really why why I want to record all of these things because we come back and it's completely different than why the feelings we were there, yeah. you know? Well, and it's something that maybe people, we haven't talked about this at all, but you were brought in for same-sex marriage. And one, and after you started pointing out the policy and when the handbook said, the story changed and they started saying that you were coming in for apostasy. Mm -hmm. And no, that's the, to changed. me, this is yeah. the done, done, done moment. Because once they realize, because your letter was specific. It specifically said because of same sex marriage. So it, it wasn't, it had nothing to do with apostasy. It had nothing to do with, it, it was once they realized, and we'll get to this point, as far as once they realized that uh, heterosexual relationships and homosexual relationships were treated the same way. And during this course of time, I know there were some back channel discussions with leadership to the stake president and the bishop. And then they said, oh, no, we have got to figure out something. Uh, we have to shift this. The narrative must change because this isn't going to work anymore. Um, 
and I think that's another fascinating part of this, but there is no, there is no love like Mormon hate sometimes. And this is just to me, uh, fascinating. All right. Should we, should we keep going? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Yeah. Um, and sure, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. Um, the, the only other thing I was curious about because I, I don't really have anybody else that I would, I don't think I would want there, um, or need to be there. Um, um, it says, it says in your letter that, um, I, I said, I can, I can provide written statements from persons who could provide relevant information. Um, what, what kind of relevant information are we are, like, are, are we, are we talking about? Sure. So Brandon, that's, um, some of those things are kind of a formality where sometimes people will say, um, someone may make a, an accusation where someone says, I never did that. Um, and so I want people to be there that can confirm, you know, that it never happened. And some of those people can't be present. So they'll say, um, well, I can't be there, but I can send in some written testimony. Right. Um, so if you want an example, someone can say, Hey, I, um, I think that that person over there had an affair with someone and, um, persist, I don't know, I didn't. And so sometimes again, in those types of situations, sometimes some people would want to come in and say, Hey, listen, this is what it's most of the time. That's really not an issue. So, um, right. with these are more, it's more one of those, um, if it was a, you know, someone saying, Hey, um, I actually never did that or I did, or, you know, there were extenuating circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if there was something that I wanted to bring written wise, would, would I, would I just like, is that for reference or, or would I read that? Would it be okay for me to read it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, um, I mean, I, I've already had the intention of kind of clarifying things, but I was curious where, um, what, what the origin of this was like um who, i guess why now um why now oh, yeah that's a great question yeah so it's one that um i had a conversation with the state president and i know i was supposed to for a while um but i quite frankly didn't really want to um the uh it's it's one that you know i've got that internal conflict um i loved working with you and young men's i um in fact i can still remember some things that you said i don't know if you can remember this but there was a youth conference one time where you stood up and um people would be nice and i remember you saying you know i sometimes wonder if everyone here would be friends with me if my dad hadn't died and i thought i don't think brennan realizes how um how much people dislike being around him um, yeah. do you remember saying that okay brennan did jordan say something there yeah so ap after bishop had told me this that he had one had an internal conflict himself about this topic is what he said being topic being same sex marriage that he had an internal conflict. And then, you know, he followed up by kind of a, a personal anecdote that we had had together growing up to me that, that honestly, it made me feel like he was more on my side than anything. You know, if, if he had been having a personal conflict, then maybe he himself was thinking that, you know, uh, this council shouldn't have been called. I was thinking that maybe it wasn't him. It wasn't him, the one who had organized or called this council. What I heard is that the stake president maybe told him to do this. That's that, what I, that's how I interpreted that's that. What we that's what I was suspe suspecting as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it sounded very clear. He received instructions from somewhere else. And I think to, to not believe that it doesn't make a lot of sense because then he starts bringing in uh, distant memories. Oh, I loved working with you in young men's you were. And so he starts building this. How about his dad passing away? Yeah, yeah. Bringing in all of these emotions and, and drawing you and saying, I love, like, I love you and I'm connected to you. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to hurt you because we have so many ties together and we've had such uh, history together. So just know that this isn't me. This is, this is just the, the handbook or the stake president or my, my hands are just tied. I, I can't do anything other than uh, follow what my my other leaders are telling me to do. There's a quote I once heard by uh, Margaret Toscano, who was excommunicated for apostasy, and um, she recorded her reactions to her excommunication on a PBS series called The Mormons. And it's a bit of a graphic term, but this is, I'm quoting her. She described excommunication as being raped by care bears. In other words, it's a violent act that's wrapped in kind of pseudo love. And I, I, I apologize for the graphicness of Margaret Toscano's quote, 
but I think what we're touching on is how confusing it might be to say, I'm hunting you, I'm coming after you, I'm about to do something very psychologically violent to you, but I really love you and, and I remember when we were you were younger and your dad passed away. I, I'm wondering how that was for you. I mean, it it convinced me and I it was all of this was building up just to be torn down later. Um, I re I really was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt for these reasons because I truly believed that they had or in this case right now, the bishop had good intentions and he wasn't out to get me. Mm -hmm. But it's, I, it, but at, you know, at the same time, it still felt like I was being sought out. But I was like, oh, it wasn't him. You know, he's just maybe this, 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 he's following directions and that's why I was sought out, you know? Um, and so. Almost good cop, bad cop, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, okay. and then the overall Mormon vernacular has changed over the years. We used to call these, well, not only we call them membership councils now, they were called disciplinary councils. Uh, they were previous to that church courts. Um, there was even the vernacular uh, the court, court of love. Right. And so that I think that brings into better perspective the Care Bear comment, how mm. um, there really is the shift in this the Mormon language to try the barbaric nature of excommunication, and especially in terms of a church that uh, is all for forgiveness and repentance and striving to be your very best, but also acknowledging that perfection does not exist within Mormonism. Mm -hmm. But then to excommunicate somebody who is not perfect. So just again, this is, this is a mm. circular merry-go-round again of, 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 of problems. This is prob problematic for the church. Because yeah. they're, they're active and inactive Mormons who, who violate the word of wisdom, who drink, who smoke, who do illegal drugs that are in, that are unfaithful, that are married, you know, in relationships, domesticated partners without marriage. Uh, all, you know, there are child molesters, there are rapists, there are spouse abusers, hundreds of thousands of these people collectively that the church doesn't go after, that the church leaves completely alone, doesn't even try to go after them. And that's, that's part of yeah, why this is and that'll definitely come up again. Okay. Yeah, and it was, but now we have people who are crossing ward boundaries, stake boundaries to find you who's inactive, not participating in church. The, the second point that I wanted to bring up, too, is that uh, often an active Latter-day Saint, Orthodox uh, believing Latter-day Saint will say, well, the excommunication process helps release this person from their covenants. They made these covenants. Therefore, excommunication is a good thing. These membership councils where we take away their their membership releases them from all of these obligations that they had. Well, what happens if you're an Aaronic priesthood holder who has not made covenants in the temple, who has not endowed, uh, as is your case here? Where is the logic in that? Because that is that is probably the most used excuse that's thrown at me as I highlight these uh, these LGBTQ excommunications throughout Mormonism is the church is doing this out of love for their covenant. They are protecting them from the eternities by releasing them from their covenant, so they are not found uh, guilty of that. But you hadn't been to the temple. No. So where are my responsibilities as yeah. a covenant keeping? Your, co yeah. your covenants at this point are to mourn with those that mourn and comfort those in need of <laughs> right. comfort. Because that's are, the baptismal covenant. That mm -hmm. is your baptismal covenant. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Should we keep going? Yeah, let's keep going. All right. Um, <laughs> I was probably very emotional at the time, but I, I do remember saying something along those lines. Yeah. Anyway, I just think that, um, so it's kind of that same thing. The, um, the other was just, um, I, I'm not really on Facebook or most social media things. And so I heard that you had, that you got married to Doug and it's one where from that one standpoint, I say congratulations, right? Um, it does put things at odds with church standards there. Um, but that was kind of the other, the other end of it. But I actually don't know when you got married. Yeah. Uh, Doug and I got married last year on, uh, April 14th, April 14th, oh, really? 21. Yeah. So it's, it's been, wow. yeah, a year. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Well, I, uh, if there's anything else that I can be doing until the 26th, uh, uh, feel free to text me or call me. Okay. Okay. And vice versa. It's the same. You know, if you, um, sometimes people are hesitant to call and go, oh, I'm afraid that because I work nights, they're afraid I'll be sleeping today. Mm -hmm. I'll just, um, you know, mute my phone. I just put it on do not disturb. And so feel yeah. free to call anytime. Sounds good. All right. Okay. I will talk to you later then. Okay. All right. Have a good okay, night. Bye. I'm Bye. not sure if we should off on talking about that topic of knowing when we were married until later because i was okay. just gonna say i don't yeah. want to be matt lock or perry mason that one in the room but i just want to say 
May 4th was the date of this conversation. <laughs> May 4th be with you. Just, just remember, May 4th, 2022 was when this conversation was had with the bishop. And uh, just for the audience, what, when were you married again? We got married April 14th of 2021. So you'd been married a year and a month, and you had this conversation on May 4th, 2022, and your bishop, you just informed your bishop on May 4th, 2022, that you were married. Mm-hmm. And he just found out via a social media post. Yeah, the the and social the, media post that he would have been talking about was uh, the one I made in January of this year of 2022, saying that we got married publicly to our friends and families and invite them to a reception this summer. And on May 4th, 2022, a conversation with your bishop, he's now saying, I just read a social media post that said that you were married. He even said that he didn't know when we got married. That's right. So I just, I mean, just I'm just throwing that out there, just. But that's really important for people to keep in mind yeah. that because the we're bishop ask him about it. The bishop found out about the marriage through a Facebook post that was not even post that the Facebook post was not even made at the time of the marriage was made eight months after in January, um, and and the bishop said that he had just found out recently about it. That's very important via social media. That, so we, that story is going to change later. So we know mm-hmm. for sure if if you made the public post in January of 2022, we know for sure that is the the very earliest date the bishop could have found out that you were married. Right. Because he, by his own admission, says, I found out via social media that you had just gotten married. Mm-hmm. And he does offer congratulations. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. it seemed wildly sincere. Yeah. So he he offered that nice congratulatory. He said, yeah, well, in some ways I would congratulate you, but, but in other ways <laughs> it goes against the church. So I'm kind of, you know, pulled both ways. Um, we yeah. do we do have that post that we can show later. I so, love right? conditional love. Okay. Uh, congratulations. But yeah. <laughs> and prior to this post, the only people that known were our close families and friends, not even all your siblings known, right? By by this point in the uh, by when the we were time called that we posted Oh, on January. when we had when we had posted, the only people that would have known is four or five of my friends and my parents. That's it. Yeah, that's it. If it's OK, let me let me just ask, how does it feel to be living a, a legally um, law, you know, a lawful, loving marriage to be living your life together and then to have why are you guys smiling? No, because it's true. Because it's it, great. Yeah, it's a <laughs> I, great life. We 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 love living a, a um, our, our, we love having the opportunity and the the privilege of one getting married under law, but two, getting to live with one another, to love one another, because so many people around the world either don't feel comfortable or are not allowed at all to have our situation, and so I don't know. We 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 feel really lucky. Yeah. Very um, privileged. Yeah, sure. very privileged. And yeah. And that's wonderful. beautiful. And how does it feel to just be loving that life, sitting on the couch, and then find out that a church that's supposed to be about love is now like hunting you down and trying to hold a court or a disciplinary council to kick you out? A church that you've not been attending for the last four years. Mm-hmm. How does yeah. that feel for both of you? I want both of you to answer that if you don't mind. For me, it was a complete interruption of what we feel like was our the most ideal life situation that we can be in and the, the happiest that we feel like we can be in this present moment in life. Um, and then to have the church come and seek us out, it it puts a huge stent in that because now we're we're having someone call into question our relationship that we feel is the best version of what it could be right now. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And for me, it's it's a whole story of like we're still surrounded by active members of the church, loving um, active. Members. Yeah, we we love them, and so when. You know, I personally made the decision to not go to church or attend church anymore, even though there's feelings hurt. There's a lot of traumatized stuff I went through. I didn't I choose to not speak it publicly. I, I there was no social media posts. I, po- I mean, I was friend of Gerardo, um, but I don't post anything. I don't share anything on social media that was, you know, defaming church or talk about how church policy is stupid. Like I talk in these closed door conversation with my husband and my close friends who left who, the church. Who think the mm-hmm. same, yeah. Yeah, who left the church, but I don't bring it up to any active members. I don't try to disturb their... And to um, give to give my side of that, 
I've I've never up to the up to this point in time I'd up never to like four hours ago. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, up up to the point where I'd been called to the council, I'd never really had a major negative experience with the church that I would feel was even worthy to be public, um, because I I was I would never really I never had somebody. Um, I mean, called me to a council. I never had a bishop call me like a, you know, the the F word or um, the F slur. I never had those experiences that a lot of other gay members of the church have. And so I didn't really feel like I, um, I had no reason to even to come out of the, yeah. come out, out mm -hmm. after the church. Or... Yeah. I'd never had any reason to fault them. Yeah. Well, what about the idea that there's these men who are now, have their eye on you to kick you out and they're going to hold a council to judge your worthiness before God to kick you out of their organization because you've legally and lawfully, you know, demonstrated your, your loving commitment to each other. For me, I still wasn't under that impression. Oh, okay. At that time, okay. I wasn't under that impression, but Doug, he, he knew something was not right. And he's like, you know, I want, I want you to know, um, you might believe that this is done with good intention, but I've heard in the past that it's not with good intention. Uh, how, how would how would you describe it? Yeah, I would, that? Like, I would say be cautious, kind of thing. Because I I was very <laughs> deep into you know being active. Like we went on a mission. I serve all sorts of callings. You, you gave know, two in, years of your life to the church. Yeah, in and out. Of you paid, or someone paid for you to yeah. be like the church's salesperson for two years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I was in depth. I was served in all leadership callings as a missionary, um, and and so I and plus I also listened to Mormon stories with previous experience of excommunication. So I know that these things are not as lightly as they are made out to be. So I was like Brennan, hey, I, I you know I know you probably never heard, but this these things are serious. Um, even though this bishop is trying to manipulate you into thinking that, oh, this is done out of complete love and he just wanted to check in on you, you know, which I think that's what Brennan was on the Im impression of, like, oh, this is Bishop just checking in and making sure that he's, you know, and then clearing, you know, uh, clarify, uh, clarifying his membership status, but that's it. So did you feel I, I knew it wasn't oh, just ahead. I knew it wasn't just that. Um, I, did, I knew I, it wasn't him just clarifying because I knew there was something else going on, I mean, but yeah. I, but I still trusted it wasn't coming from him. Right, you know, right, the bishop, right. the bishop was uh, absolved and he was removed in my mind, he was removed from it at the time. Um, so, but Doug, did you feel fear? Did you feel sad? Did you feel afraid? You know, um, angry? not so much fear, more, a little bit angry because like Brendan has not been to church. Like if anyone gotten that letter, it makes way more sense. I was the one that got yeah. um, a, a letter, but he's but it, just having but, such a happy life and just. But it could have made you feel like you might be next. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Yeah. Oh yeah. The other thing is, I'm at the the cusp of graduation, into becoming a nurse, taking a national board exam. Um, we're we're buying a house, wedding reception, like all these things that are huge accomplishments and like huge life events that. Can be stressful now now i have i have this on my plate yeah. of um you know yeah everything that we're talking about now okay so. mm -hmm. all right so the next audio clip is the actual disciplinary council mm -hmm. is that right yeah this would have been because uh, may 26 22 days later um and before this i because i had asked him about the written statement um i kind of wanted to compile the reasons why and we'll go over this um why i felt like the church the church's teachings on lgbtq issues are not inspired by god and why they're not healthy for gay people and so i compiled this whole you know um i'll have it here and we'll read it in a second um when we start listening to the clip uh um and i compiled all this so that i had it in front of me so i could you know tell them where i was coming from and uh, my thoughts on the topic because it says bring written relevant information. And to me, this was relevant information to the case. So. And before we jump into that, can we just add one piece of rele relevant information? And that's how these actual councils are, are set up because I think even for active Latter-day Saints, they don't really know the structure of a disciplinary council or in today's vernacular, a membership council. Uh, in this case, typically with a, 
um, someone who's if if the shoes were on D uh, Doug's feet at this point, where he was um, uh, endowed and and uh, served a mission, held, holds the Melchizedek priesthood, he would have to go in front of a stake presidency, which is. Uh, the leader of the stake and then uh, 12 counselors. In this case, um, because Brennan is not a Melchizedek priesthood holder, he goes into a room with a bishop. The bishop has two counselors, a first counselor and a second counselor. And then there's also a ward clerk who serves as a record keeper. Um, the ward clerk does not have any decision making responsibilities in the council, but is there just to maybe advise and consent, but also keep record of, of the events. The uh, many of these they often will tell you aren't recorded. They uh, they don't keep a record of that, but yet that's the job of the ward clerk is to keep a record of, of what happened in that meeting. So you're in a room with a bishop, two counselors, a ward clerk, and then um, the person who's being accused or the person who's on trial, literally, and then a, a handful of witnesses, or in this case, a singular witness. So that's kind of the scene. That's, that's all the people who are in this room uh, during your uh, membership council. Any idea why the church makes a lot of emphasis on ward clerks not um, writing word by word what's happening on the council, but rather just like a summary? Because that's part of the instruction in the handbook. It says that the ward clerk is not supposed to write word by word or quotations from what it's said. Yeah, ha having served in the ward clerk position, um, it's not word for word. But I mean, if you were a stenographer, you could pretty much get word for word you you and really what it was is then the bishop could then refer to notes uh, I think the the second part of that is uh, this uh, council is not binding until the bishop makes a call and a, has a meeting with his his leader the stake president so the bishop can then refer back to ward council notes if he didn't remember something correctly mm. but in his meeting with the bishop with the stake president then the bishop can refer to the notes that were collected by yeah. the ward clerk in order to bring further light and knowledge or remembrance of that meeting. What is so interesting is that, I mean, we're going to hear about this later. He reads a statement and the bishop gets some things from that statement that he read that were not there at all. Um, so who gets the fault? Is it the bishop, the counselors who are, you know, putting things in his mouth that he didn't actually say? Is it the work clerk who's like, because because, you know, like everyone has their biases and then you have a work clerk not having a real recording, but just his notes, probably with his own biases. So like this is just so arbitrary. And yeah. So you're saying you're saying that the bishop in this circumstance is putting words in Brennan's mouth. Yeah, he would later. Yeah, he did later after the disciplinary council. He said, well, in the statement you read, you said this, this and this. But that, that was not on the statement at all. But taking the minutes would clear that up like right. you know somebody recording the actual word for word thing there would be no interpretation or misconstruing of words if that you know if a ward clerk did have that responsibility but they don't in this case so mm -hmm. um i think the biggest danger for for doing this uh, having an actual recording is that it shows that the decision that was made based on inspiration and on what the bishop got from the spirit that Brennan was saying was not what actually Brennan said. So then how to justify, yeah. you know, spirit, Holy Spirit inspiration. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think they would want to be held accountable for logic or reason or evidence. Yeah. I think that, I mean, the thing that I realized is these decisions are always made beforehand. They come from the top. They come from general authorities, area authorities, usually down to stake presidents, down to the local leaders. That's the reason and and it's everything from there is just kind of rationalization I mean, and sure so the the less evidence the less they can be held accountable the better because it's not it, it doesn't make sense and it never does and if Which the accountability I, comes and there is a problem there then it's well he must have been acting as a man it was mm -hmm, this mm -hmm, was just mm -hmm. the fault of the bishop who yeah, made yeah. some mistakes but all of this is the reason for is one of the reasons for their plight of confidentiality yeah. so that they can't be held accountable. Yep. And I would want to say two things before we play the disciplinary council. Um, Brennan and Douglas consult, like they asked me for references, you know, and what kind of things they could write, write on the statement. But this was pure Brennan. I sent them references and Brennan wrote this like beautiful, written, amazing statement that I was just so impressed by. 
And one of the things that I asked Brennan was, do you want to include things about the, you know, blacks in the priesthood and stuff like that? And Brennan said, no, I want to keep it just purely about LGBT issues and just talk about LGBT because that's what, what I'm being called for. And I thought that was like, at the time I was like, well, you had the opportunity to show them, you know, that other doctrines can have changed, but then it then ended up being the smartest decision because he was talking specifically about LGBT teachings in the church. All right, should we roll it? How how long is this recording? Just so people know what how long to. It's expect. about forty minutes, but we're gonna probably pause it and talk, just comment. Okay. Yeah. So we'll. It's one point five too quickly. It's too one, quick. One point five speed, or we'll start at one point two five and okay. we'll increase it if. Okay. okay. So here is the disciplinary council, May twenty sixth, twenty twenty two. Our second counselor. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of everybody here. H have you ever been, um, Doug, have you ever been to um, the Church of Jesus Christ Legacy? Yeah, I have. Okay. I have. Okay. Yeah. I've been, done that. been on the mission, actually. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. You're in our end. Great. Mm -hmm. Perfect. We're so good. you actually know a lot of this stuff. Yep. <laughs> okay. I did not plan for that when we met. I, I mean, I wasn't specifically looking for an RM to marry. Yeah. Um, but then I figured out, I was like, well, I guess I, 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 I got my RM. <laughs> yeah. So. Very good. Yeah. When were you, when did you um, serve? Um, 2017, 2019. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where did you Houston, go? actually. Houston. Where went. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you speaking English or Spanish? Vietnamese. Oh, Vietnamese. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, listen, thank you for coming in. Um, the way that a council goes, I'll kind of talk about the procedure of it. Um, We'll start with an opening prayer. We'll talk um, about uh, what's going on right now in your life. Um, and then everyone is excused, including Jeff, um, while there's some deliberation with um, with the counselors and myself. And then everyone's invited back in. We talk about decision, have a closing prayer. Um, you always have a right to appeal to the state president for any decision. Um, no participant in a membership council is permitted to make an audio, video, or written recording. Um, the decision that we make actually isn't final unless it's approved by the state president. So that's one of those things that you need to do. So, um, so that decision will be talked about yes. at the end today, yes. but it won't be official Correct. until yeah. stamp of approval. Yes. Cool. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. No. Um, and then on the possible outcomes, there's really only three possible outcomes. One mm -hmm. is remains a good standing. Two, formal membership restriction. And three is a withdrawal of membership. Which would be uh, disfellowship. So the use, use I know, I know the use disfellowship and the yeah. excommunication. Okay. Okay. Let's make sure I understood. Yeah. Um, and then any questions about any of that stuff? Uh, no, not that stuff. Okay. Um, are you okay? Let's go ahead and start with prayer. And yeah. Well, talk, okay? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. we give us prayer. All right. Our dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this time that we have to meet together. We pray for thy spirit to be here with us, that we may seek for thy guidance, to know thy will. We're grateful for uh, for this time with Brandon and Doug, and, and for this time we have to counsel together, understand each other, and to uh, have a feel an outpouring of, of thy love for, for each of us as, as our children. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, okay, I, Brendan, you wanted to say yeah, something? Yeah, I just want to say really quick. Um, even even now, an, an opening prayer, closing prayer, a prayer still, it still has that feeling of it being, you know, a reverent spiritual thing for me. Um, not not as much as it once did, but it, I, I can still feel it even now, just hearing that. Um, but nothing that is going to happen from here on forward is spiritual or reverent or divinely inspired. And mm. it's, it's, you know, it's, it's sad because I, I wish I didn't have to feel that, but it's, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think we can do 1.25. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's disorienting the yeah. juxtaposition of things that your condition to feel mean spirituality mm -hmm. versus the actual it's not spiritual yeah okay yeah. okay all right i'm sorry for that let's continue um 
I don't know that you guys know this. Oh, and then one other thing, everything that we have, everything we talk about in here remains confidential, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes people wonder about that. And sometimes wonder that at work too. I've had people that I've seen that have been virtual. They then talk to my wife thinking that I spoke with her about it. I said, uh, nope. Thing. It, there's there's HIPAA in there. <laughs> and this one, while it's not HIPAA, it's one that it remains confidential. Right, right. Um, so I met with Brennan, it's probably been two years ago, at the first time that we talked about um, you being in the relationship with Doug and planning on getting married. That was actually before you were married. I don't actually remember the conversation. I remember, I mean, we've, we've seen each other in passing, but. Um, yeah, re remind me of what, of what we talked yeah. about. So we just talked about that, and um, I asked you, and I, I may have even offended you in the way that I asked. I'm sorry if I did. I don't. Um, I don't remember. Yeah. So I wouldn't yeah. know. I'll, I'll um, tell you all about it. But one thing I should say is I work with many people who are gay, and um, I actually love working with them. Um, that's one where I have a level of comfort with that 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 doesn't bother me. Most of my partners are not members of the church. Most of them drink coffee or alcohol. And if they want to be a member of the church, they would have to stop, right? So they can't be members of the church, but it doesn't mean I don't like them. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we talked before, I asked you, I said, um, I asked you if you had previously struggled with same gender attraction. You seemed bothered by it. I said, I don't struggle with it. I'm embracing it. I do remember that. Remember that. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, that that's one where, again, I want to make sure that I'm being respectful with everything there. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I ask a quick question? Uh, so do you mind if I ask a quick question? Sure. This is not to pile on the bishop in any way because it's systems, not people. But I do want church leaders to learn how to more effectively handle these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I, I remember kind of, you know, in, in kind of, let's just say the racism domain, there's kind of that joke, like, I'm not racist. I have a gay friend. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not racist. I have a black friend. Right? Right. Right. Like, when when he when he says, "Hey, I have friends at work, and I'm okay, gay friends at work, and I'm okay with that," or whatever it was he said, is that like it seems like what he's trying to do is say, "Hey, I'm not I'm not a homophobe. I'm I'm cool with gay people because I have some coworkers, and I'm what I don't I'm not homophobic, ex, ex, you know, towards <laughs> them." But, like, he'll, he'll but also, I'm wondering how that's experienced to you, and whether that's helpful or not, or if it's experience is condescending. Um. With the amount of, I don't know, I've I've had that come from people, and I feel like that's a trope. Like, well, I have a gay friend, so I can't be homophobic. That's what it, that's kind of how it felt to me at the time. But something that I felt like was more valid about what he was saying was, um, in medicine, as as a doctor, um, and as healthcare providers, we have a plight to care for our patients equally, no matter what, mm. um, what you know, whatever factor um, or whatever characteristic or Thing that they have about them, whether it's ethnicity, race, age, sexual orientation. In this case, um, we are you're as a healthcare provider, you're supposed to treat everyone equally, and that's you know I was hoping that would be the case for him as a doctor, um, yeah. but it seems like because of the church, they they feel like they can not do that. Yeah, um, he's yeah. choosing the church over his healthcare provider responsibility. <laughs> Can I also just add to, so I don't like the struggling either. And, and ironically in this uh, particular room, um, John is outnumbered. I mean, there is, he's the 20% minority here with <laughs> four gay guys sitting <laughs> behind microphones. Um, so I don't like the idea of this, this struggle either. I don't struggle with my sexuality, but the part that I think aggravates me even more is he likens sexuality to an addiction. Well, I also have friends who drink coffee and are alcoholics, and they would have to change those behaviors if they ever wanted to join our club, our church. I didn't even think about that. And I think that's super problematic in, in the way Latter-day Saints view topics like this. Well, if you overcome, if you change, if you're no longer addicted to your sexuality, then yes, you can become part of us. Just like my friends who are alcoholics, just like my friends who drink coffee, I associate with them every day, but they wouldn't be able to join our group until they got rid of those habits. Mm -hmm. They got rid of those addictions. And my sexuality is an addiction is not an addiction. My sexuality is a reality. And mm -hmm. someone I should never, no one's sexuality should ever be likened to an addict, 
uh, something that can be overcome or changed or fixed via some outside influence. Something that you struggle with, quote unquote. And the fact that you struggle with that. Yeah, I do know alcoholism. People can struggle with alcoholism. But in turn, like we brought this up over and over again with this bishop. I didn't, and, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of the other gays in the room, but I didn't have to sacrifice my values or morals to, to live authentically and honestly and happily. It, that wasn't something that I needed to do because living my truth and living to the fullest measure of my creation was the, authentic, the, the most authentic part of me. It right. was the most honest part of me. And it wasn't a struggle and it wasn't, the struggle was the church's way that they dealt with me. <laughs> yeah. That was the struggle. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I often li like the phrase, I don't struggle with same sex attraction. I, I struggle with the church's homophobia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, I mean, what he was saying in, you know, uh, just now, um, three years ago, I was in church for, I think it was a, um, a mission call or maybe a baby. No, um, one of my siblings was giving a talk um, and I wanted to be there to support them. Um, and so I, I was there in church and um, uh, I think the bishop saw me and he's like, oh, I haven't seen him in a mm. little bit. I haven't, I haven't checked in with him in a bit. Well, he's here already. Let me call him in, into my office. Um, so he, he called me in and that's when he asked. He's like, you know, I know I've been updated and I know in the past that you have, uh, you know, you, you have had um, uh, issues regarding, you know, same-sex attraction. And I was like, they're not issues. I don't have an issue of same-sex attraction because to me it's not an issue and i made that very clear with him and that's what he was talking about right, so right. yeah okay all right let's go ahead and keep rolling i'm sorry second counselor so mm -hmm. um that's kind of everybody here H have you ever been um Doug, have you ever been to um the church of Jesus christ Latter -day? yeah i have oh, okay. it started all over yeah. again I've been there, done that. Been on the mission, actually. Okay, yeah. gotcha. You're in our end. No, not that stuff. Okay. At the first time that we talked about um, you being in the relationship with Doug and planning on getting married, that was actually before you were married. That's good. I don't actually remember the conversation. I remember, I mean, we, we've seen each other in passing, but um, yeah, re remind me of what, of what we talked yeah. about. So we just talked about that. And, um, I asked you, and I, I may have even offended you in the way that I asked. I'm sorry if I did. I don't. Um, I don't remember. Yeah. So I wouldn't yeah. know. I'll, I'll um, tell you all about it. But one thing I should say is I work with many people who are gay, and um, I right. actually let's love jump. With let's them. jump. Um, that's one where I have a level of comfort. Probably another, that about another minute. It doesn't bother me. Most of my partners are not members of the church. Most of them drink coffee or alcohol, and if they want to be a member of the church. That's they would have to stop, right? So they can't be members of the church, but it doesn't mean I don't like them. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we talked before, I asked you, I said, um, I asked you if you had previously struggled with same gender attraction. You seem bothered by it. I said, I don't struggle with it. I'm embracing it. I do remember that. Remember that. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, that that's one where, again, I want to make sure that I'm being respectful with everything there. Yeah. Um, in, in the conversation, um, you know, we just talked about what are the long-term objectives with it. Um, when I spoke with you on the phone um, just a few weeks ago, you said, you know, I've actually kind of wondered what I, what to do as far as being a member of the church is concerned. Have you had further thoughts on that? What are your... Yeah, my, my it had kind of been on my to-do list, I mean, um, to eventually remove my records at some point um, because, I mean, Currently, uh, I mean, our relationship is at odds with the church, but I mean, we uh, a number of other things that um, we just don't really believe in the church, um, as at least either of us once did. Um, so it was on my like list of things to do. I just hadn't made a point of it. Um, I mean, I uh, who was I talking to? It's probably talking to my mom about it. Um, something along the lines of like, oh, you can just send a letter and then remove your records, you know, and um, yeah, I just hadn't made a point of it yet. Um, but I, I had intentions, I guess, okay. to do so. Um, so, and I actually can help you with that. That may make the rest of this council actually obsolete, right? Usually a council is held if someone's saying, I want to remain a member of the church, if someone's saying, I don't really believe it, it's not really anything, then um, that changes. 
Is that what you have there? Is that a letter? Uh, no, statement? you said I could bring a written statement. Oh yeah, sure. Um, and so I typed a, a thing up about Beautiful. you know where my my thoughts lie on this, and um, so we can you know share and stuff. Sure, so, please do. Sure, right now. Awesome. Absolutely, you got the floor. All right. <clears throat> So if, as I understand it, Harder, you've cut out what he read and he's just going to read it live. Is yeah. That right? Yeah. I just thought it would be better to get him with better audio reading yeah. the beautiful statement and here. emotion yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before I read this, uh, there was a, um, there was a point, I would think it was like three fourths. I was just about done where the Bishop interrupted me to answer a question. So at that point, you, we're going to keep playing the recording. Yeah. We'll just that. switch back to yep. the audio. Um, but, but it was cut out of the audio. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. He knows where to stop. Too. Mm -hmm. Um, oh look, you numbered it and everything. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I started this with a cover page APA. You can tell I just graduated from college. Um, <laughs> I just want to make sure, did you cite your sources because... Oh, yes. Okay, good. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and if anybody uh, watching wants to see this and see all the references that I have, you can go, you'll, you'll be able to see it. Um, I'm not sure if it's already available, but... Yeah, um, it is. I have all the references. And Show notes already. Yeah, so from a college student to you. <clears throat> so here, here it is. I'd first like to thank you for giving me the opportunity of bringing a written statement today. I've had a number of thoughts on today's meeting that I've been wanting to share. I provide this relevant information on same-sex marriage in the church, not because I think it'll change the course of today's council, but so I can explain why I believe the church's teachings on same-sex marriage are not divinely inspired, why I believe the church is harmful in its actions towards gay sons and daughters of God, and why I think today's disciplinary council is unnecessary in my current circumstances. Across the years, the church's teachings and doctrines regarding same-sex relations have changed extensively. For example, on whether or not same-sex attraction is curable. Spencer W. Kimball said, We know such a disease, homosexuality, is curable. Men have come dejected, discouraged, embarrassed, near terrified, and have gone out later full of confidence and faith in themselves, with self-respect again, the confidence of their families, their home ties strengthened, and ready to manfully take their part in society and even in the church on an approved, cured basis. Boyd K. Packer said, Finding the cause of this condition is an essential step in developing a cure. It, homosexuality, is not desirable. It is unnatural. It is abnormal. It is an affliction. Dallin H. Oaks said, Homosexuality can be cured if the battle is well organized and pursued vigorously and continuously. Today, the church states that for some, feelings of same-sex attraction, or at least the intensity of those feelings, may diminish over time. But in any case, a change in attraction should not be expected or demanded as an outcome by parents or leaders, even despite previous attempts to do so in the past. They also state, quote, the intensity of same-sex attraction is not a measure of your faithfulness. Many people pray for years and do all they can to be obedient in an effort to reduce same-sex attraction, yet find they are still attracted to the same sex, close quote. Spencer W. Kimball contradicts this in his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, that if your knuckles aren't bleeding, you're not trying hard enough to be faithful and reduce your same-sex attraction. His book only stopped being sold in Deseret Book this past January after there was pressure to remove it from circulation. Another example is the church's ways to cure same-sex attraction. The church recommended that gay people should marry someone of the opposite sex to fix their same-sex attractions. A study was conducted that gauged, that gauged, gauged a member's quality of life in a mixed orientation marriage. There were 1,500 LGBTQ church members surveyed. The members who were single or in a mixed orientation marriage, after being encouraged to do so, reported an average quality of life less than that of someone with lupus erythematosus. Later on, President Hinckley stated that marriage should not be viewed as a therapeutic step to solve problems such as homosexual inclinations. But by far, the most notable change in the church's teachings on homosexuality was the 2015 November policy. The policy stated that children of gay couples were not allowed to be baptized until the age of 18 and could only be baptized with first presidency approval and after they had disavowed their parents' relationship. The policy also labeled same-sex married couples as apostates. Even murderers are not labeled as apostates. The, police, the policy overall was very contradictory to the second article of faith that men shall not be punished for another man's transgressions. Children of gay couples were being punished for the supposed sins of their parents. President Nelson, senior apostle at the time, said that the first presidency and all the apostles had received confirmation on this policy and that it was, quote, the mind of the Lord and the will of the Lord. 
but four years later, the policy was redacted completely, and children of gay couples were allowed to be baptized. Same-sex married couples were also no longer constituted as apostates. During the press conference held to announce the reversal of this policy, Elder Oaks said, quote, The immoral conduct in heterosexual or homosexual relationships will be treated in the same way. The church's teachings and doctrines of Jesus Christ are said to be unchanging. The church says that they do not sway with the changes of society, yet the church has changed their teachings on homosexuality time and time again. Homosexuality was taught to be curable, but now the church disavows that. We used to be told that you could cure your same-sex attraction if you married a woman, but now the church says it's not a solution. Children of gay parents could be baptized, but now they can. Same-sex married couples were labeled as apostates, but now they're not. If the church's teachings on same-sex relations are really divinely inspired, why do they change so often? Does the Lord, the, does the Lord change his direction this often? The church's teachings are also contributing to high suicide rates among gay members of the church. While the church is concerned about suicide in its community, there are still teachings that exist in the church that belittle and persecute the identities and life decisions of gay members. An example is President Oaks in 2017 telling gay members of the church, don't label yourself as gay, lesbian, bisexual because it, quote, inhibits your growth. Or President Hinckley telling Larry King on national television that, quote, Gay people have a problem. But the most raw teaching that has contributed to a culture of suicidality among gay members is a famous quote from Bruce R. McConkie where he says that, quote, a loss, of a loss of virtue is too great a price to pay even for the preservation of one's life. But you're dead. And quote, I would rather have you come back from the mission in a pine box with your virtue than return alive without it. The church continues to stand by this belief by teaching that a gay person must not act on their natural born attractions. Love and companionship are some of the most basic needs for a human being, yet the church teaches that a gay person needs to live a life of celibacy in order to be worthy in the eyes of God. Even Russell M. Nelson in his most recent devotional to the young adults said that it's not good for a man to be alone. President Nelson remarried 14 months after the death of his wife. If our current prophet couldn't bear to be celibate for a year, why is it okay that the church recommends gay people to be celibate for their entire lives? Countless members of the church have ended their lives over this issue, that they're only worthy if they don't act on their attractions. One Mormon teen in Utah died by suicide and left a note saying specifically that the church makes her feel that she's better off not alive. Suicide continues to be the leading cause of death for teenagers 10 to 17 in Utah and Idaho. According to the, pedi according to the Pediatrics Journal, LGBTQ teens who have been rejected by their parents or caregivers are eight times more likely to, to attempt suicide, five times more likely to report high levels of depression, 3.4 times more likely to use illegal drugs, and 3.4 times more likely to have unprotected sex when compared to those who have been accepted by their families. Much of this rejection that we see in families, LDS families, has stemmed from church teachings on homosexuality. During a PR interview in 2006, when asked about family acceptance and inclusion of homosexual children, Elder Oaks advises parents of LGBT children to tell their children this, don't expect to stay overnight, don't expect to be a lengthy house guest, don't expect us to take you out and introduce you to our friends or to deal with you in a public situation that would imply our approval of your quote-unquote partnership. To contrast this, Quentin L. Cook states, let us be at the forefront in terms of expressing love, compassion, and outreach. Let's not have families exclude or be dis disrespectful of those who choose a different lifestyle as a result of their feelings about their own gender. So which is it? Are we to follow what Elder Oaks said or Elder Oaks's or Elder Cook's invitation of love and compassion? Up until now, I've never been disciplined for seeking out my soulmate, or in other, or in other words, for, quote, acting on my same-sex attraction. This is the first time I've been sought out by the church to answer for any such conduct. I was under the impression that when someone has been inactive for as long as I have, they would not be called to a council like this. The general handbook states that a membership council is not required, for, is not required to be held for cases of same-sex marriage. So my circumstance of not being active in the church and only having received the Aaronic Priesthood makes this plan necessary. And this is where I was um, interrupted. Yep. Okay, uh, that was beautiful. 
and really powerful. And um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And Gerardo, I can see why that was so moving to you. Yeah. And I just can't imagine what, what these guys are. I mean, what was the reaction, Brandon, if you want to talk about oh, as, so, as you're reading this? Thank you so much for asking, because this was something that I immediately uh, told Doug and um, Gerardo after it happened, was while I was reading this, everyone in the room but the bishop was looking away. Um, the the second council, the first council, and the ward clerk did not look at me once at all. And uh, two of them had this kind of look on their face of like, like um, indignancy of like, I can't believe he's even reading this. Like the audacity of him to come in here and read this written statement. That that they truly had that face, that look on their face. Um, but I was really, I was really glad that the bishop was, you know, he was the only person in the room that was giving me his undivided attention, and that made me, you know, feel heard. But I could tell everyone else in the room did not, did not seem like they wanted to hear what I was saying. There we go. I was just say, let's just talk about that for a second. The audacity to bring up the words of prophets, living prophets. The, the audacity to read statements from the next prophet in line, President Oaks, that's what they were worried about. They, they were upset yeah. in this council that you were reading the not, and we're not talking about old history either. We're talking about 2006, 2006, 2019, 2018. I, I'm familiar with all these quotes. I've, I've, it, especially as a closeted Latter-day Saint, I ingested all of these messages, but here, it, I, I just want to frame this for context. Here are a group of Latter-day Saint leaders, ecclesiastical leaders, leaders that are responsible for hundreds of members in, in a geographical area who are upset that you're reading words of a living prophet, words of apostles, words of general authorities that contradict each other. The audacity is that that exists in Mormonism. The audacity is not that you're bringing it up. It's that this is the reality for gay Latter-day Saints. They hear the next prophet in line say one thing. They hear a general authority, another apostle, say it, something completely different. And I'm, I'm just referencing the Dallin H. Oaks quote and then the Quentin L. Cook, Cook quote that are wildly different, but they're not decades apart. They are contemporary with each other. Who do we trust? And you bring that up. Who... Which of these quotes do I believe in? Do I believe in the next prophet? Do I believe in the future next prophet? Which of these general authorities, which of these apostles do we listen to? And it, this goes to show the problem in this whole excommunication issue, because you have upper church leaders saying one thing, you have a gen, uh, area authority saying another thing, you have a stake president who says one thing, and then you have a bishop that's doing something completely different. Where do we turn for authority? Where does, an, where does a Latter-day Saint go for the truth? Because in this instance, we're re, we are using quotes directly from prophets who lead the church today, and neither of those quotes can be trusted because one negates the other, one cancels the other out. I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sorry, and don't forget the same general authority say two different things at two different times. Like, it's not about just different people. It's about the same person, too. Yeah, we didn't bring point. it up, but you know, even just 10 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, Dallin H. Oaks was in hot water for a long time because he's kind of been at the forefront of this LGBTQ issue, you know, fighting for Prop 8 in California, all that stuff. Um, I think he finally had to come around and be like, okay, you know, we're going to treat them equally because he was yeah. kind of under fire. And eventually, you know, he did say um, uh, that you know, the, the, this no longer applies, you know, mm -hmm. don't do this anymore. Even though I said it like 10 years ago, don't do it anymore. Kind of thing. Well, and, and maybe this could just be a side tangent, but uh, in April of 2019, Oaks was the voice of the change of the right. policy. So right. I don't know if that, if that was a, a nudge, a nod, a prod to the fact that since the, I mean, conservatively, the 60s, 70s, Oaks has been at the forefront of this topic, pushing against the, the LGBTQ community at every turn, every place he could do it. And then was it ironic? Uh, was it just happenstance that it was Oaks that then had to come out in a public way and say homosexual relationships and heterosexual relationships will be treated the same in the church? And if so, did he actually mean it? 
did he actually mean what he said when mm. he when he came out with that statement in April of 2019? Because if he if he meant it, we wouldn't be sitting here uh, collectively today discussing excommunications that right. are happening. Mm. Right. Or was it just good PR? Was it good PR? Hmm. So I'll so a couple things. I I want to call everyone's attention to an amazing document, Kyle, that you compiled called On the Record. I went ahead and pasted it into the live comments on Facebook and YouTube. We'll include that in the show notes as well if it's not already there. But Kyle, you put together a PDF of like what eighty pages of the history of the Mormon Church. LGBTQ members and uh, prophetic utterances. And it's a real contribution if you want to dig into the history of prophetic uh, contradictions and uh, prophetic psychological violence, frankly, and backpedaling. It's all there and on the record. Yeah, I and mean, when I created on the record, it wasn't even my creation. It was just an assemblage of the quotes. And I wasn't trying to pin the church anywhere other than to show a chronological order of what has happened from the 1820s until uh, to 2022. A history of the comments, a history of the change. And, and really, if anything, I should be accused of doing this for the benefit of the church to show exactly what Brendan just talked about in this disciplinary council, that the church indeed has changed. The church has changed not only its policy, but it's also changed its doctrine in terms of how LGBTQ people are treated in the church. And I just wanted people to see the historicity, the, 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 chron the chronological flow of where the church has been, because... I guarantee you, because the, the, uh, on the record has been downloaded nearly 50,000 times now, I get the same reaction from people, Latter-day Saints, who read on the record as those who sat in your disciplinary council, those counselors who sat in your disciplinary council. They first say, this can't be, this can't be the truth. There's no way our church did these types of things. Castrations, uh, excommunications, literally take, pulling people out of their homes and shipping them to other countries, shipping them to Hawaiian islands to get rid of them so that they wouldn't have gay people in Salt Lake City. All of these Don't things. Don't forget electroshock therapy to genitals at BYU. 100%. Yeah. All of these things are in our Mormon history. And nobody talks about them because the church has done a really good job at keeping those LGBTQ closets closed, locked, and put behind granite vaults. But I put the work together to pull those out. And I knew the audience that I was going to be providing the on the record to. It wasn't necessarily the LGBTQ society. It was the act of Latter-day Saint who would then look at me and criticize those quotes and say they aren't real. So then I had to source everything. So not only are you going to get the quote, but you can click on the source below it and you can see where it comes from an official LDS spot or a recording or something is verifiable. So a Latter-day Saint absolutely could not say, well, you just made that up or took it right. out of context. I want you to read, to read it. I want you to dig into the years and years of history behind each of those quotes. I want you to see how it unfolds. So yes, thanks for the plug for On the Record. You can, you can find that at lattergaystories.org backslash record. Uh, it's been downloaded so many times now, you can just Google On the Record LDS and it'll pop up and you can download it and read it for yourself. It's over 90 pages now. We have another update coming up in a, a couple weeks with some of the transgender stuff that's happened at B. YU. So it's a constantly updated uh, volume that allows the people to see the chronological layout of where the church has been. And we should also include something about excommunications again and update and show where the church has come out in 2019 and said we're not doing them. And here we are in 2022 still covering excommunications. I was going to say that on the, on the record was very helpful for me too with even just writing this written statement. Um, a lot of the quotes uh, you won't be able to find on main church websites because they've been redacted, hidden, you know, put 10, t 10 pages deep into um, a, a, a church website. And so uh, a lot of a lot of the, the links that I reference in my own written statement, I was able to get because of on the record. Um, so and that's absolutely right. I've had this happen before where someone will say, your this whole Boyd K. Packer little factory thing doesn't exist that I looked for it all over on the church's website. And he said <laughs> nothing about the little factory. And I say, you know what? Not only do I have the video recording of it, but you will not find it on the church's website. You will not even find that Boyd K. Packer was in the building in uh, October of 1976 <laughs> because they've gotten rid of the fact that he was even on uh, the speaker's list in that general conference, in that priesthood session. He's not there. And that's where he gave the, the talk. That is the extent that the Mormon church has went to hide some of these and shove some of these 
really difficult subjects into its closet. The Hartman Rector, where you wouldn't want to be a homosexual. They're the the dis, the the dis, so that um, addiction like alcoholism. It's exactly right. That is completely gone. If you look at the talk he gave in, in general conference, which was 22 minutes long, you now look at what's on the church's website. It's 11 minutes long. What happened to 11 minutes of worth of content? Where did that content go? Those are all the things that I was able to find and put back into on the record. So we, we really can see what was on the record. And it, and it all stems from the fact that the Mormon church teaches its membership that the prophets speak for God, literally speak to God and speak for God. And so the church is in this double bind of wanting the members to obey everything the prophets say. But then when time shows the prophets to have been wrong or bigoted, then they want to be able to redact what they said, but they don't want the members to question whether the current prophets are still speaking for God. So right, the right. church is in a real pickle. Um, I, I just really quickly, I want to jump back to the audio, but I will say I've been excommunicated. I sat in front of 15 men, not three. And they were all, when I was reading my statements, they were all looking at their watches, staring at the wall. There was zero eye contact in the building because it's a barbaric, violent act and everybody's uncomfortable and it's not loving. If it was loving, they would be looking at you connecting, listening, validating, nodding their heads, tears would be coming down their eyes. That would be the sign that it was a loving, connected, emotional act. So I just want to say that was my experience as well. And then finally, I just want to thank uh, The Ripe Ruin for sending a super chat. Um, she writes, please let us have a copy to share with our fellow LGBTQ+. They need to know they have community who love them and support them and understand them. And yes, all of this will be included in the show notes. Thanks for the super chat. They help us um, finance this whole operation. Okay, should we jump to the next part of the disciplinary council? Is that all right? Yes. So they they interrupt. Is it right that they're about to interrupt what mm -hmm. you're reading? So I start reading the next paragraph and then I get you know cut off halfway through. So okay. we're gonna hear the, the paragraph. Okay, yeah. so you'll hear them cutting you off. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I know we talked about this on the phone, uh, but I'd first like to thank you for giving the opportunity of bringing a written statement. Um, I had a lot of thoughts um, on uh, today's meeting that I wanted to, to share. Um, I mean, since so this, uh, this is I me got reading. Letter, yeah. and Were you able to cut it to it, so. where it just jumps forward? There. There it goes. There's a, it's a couple seconds. President Oaks also said that immoral conduct of heterosexual and homosexual relationships should be treated the same way. Would an unmarried cohabitating heterosexual couple be called to a disciplinary council like this? Why isn't this council following that instruction that heterosexual and homosexual relationships are to be treated the same way? I the can fact actually answer that if you want. They are treated the same way. And so if someone is cohabitating and they're not acting, then um, some should have membership councils in that case too. That's good to know. Thank you for clarifying. But the fact that I was sought out for this meeting makes me feel a little bit upset. The general handbook also states that if a member moves out of the stake, the stake presidents of both stakes would confer about where the council would take place. Was the stake president for my home in Boise contacted about the council? Yeah, okay. as well as your bishop. In um, fact, we recommended, we actually called them, um, I was going to send your records over to their word just because even if someone's not active, Right. Um, and uh, they actually requested not to have the record sent to me. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, so I'm a tiny bit lost about what just happened there. Can you restate Gerardo? Yeah. So this is actually really, really important. The handbook of instructions has this section. Uh, and it it's, it's, again, it's really important. It's about jurisdiction and where council is supposed to be held when a member moves out. What the handbook says is that the bishop of the old ward, um, if he know where, where the membership uh, record is, um, if he finds out about a sin that merits a disciplinary council, he's supposed to contact the new bishop from the ward where the new member was moved to coordinate where the council is supposed to be held. Um, the only that that that's the the only way this happens is if 
the couple or the person has moved inside the same stake boundaries. In other words, it's a, it's a word inside the same stake. If the couple or the person has moved outside of stake boundaries, it's the stake president who is supposed to call the stake president from the new stake and coordinate where the council is supposed to be held. This is really, really important. It's really clear, several paragraphs long on the count, on the handbook of instructions. And that's what Brennan is saying, was this procedure followed? Did you bishop contacted the bishop or the stake president from you know, the, the stake where I currently reside on? And the bishop says, yes, the stake president was contacted and we also contacted the bishop when we wanted to transfer the records and they said that your records should remain here. Um, later, we're going to find out that that's probably not true. And just to follow up for those who are just joining this part of the conversation and didn't catch us in the very beginning, the bishop who is holding this membership council is not Brennan's bishop where he currently lives this is a bishop from years prior this mm -hmm. is four years prior his home ward basically his home ward basically grew up. yeah yeah this is the bishop where he grew up who's holding this membership council he's went to school he's graduated he's now married and lives in a completely different area and and so that's what Gerardo's trying to say is the bishop the bishop where he currently lives now that he's married years later should be holding or at least involved in this discussion but it's not. It's his home ward bishop yeah. who's taken upon himself this opportunity to initiate a membership council. And then the second part of that that Gerardo brings up really well is that that bishop then should be coordinating this between the two separate stake presidents, the stake president from the home ward and the stake president of where Brennan lives currently. And we're going to find out that didn't happen at all. There was not even a mention of that. And my understanding is the wherever you currently live, the bishop is supposed to like reach out to you, get to know you, see how you're doing check in with you and like build a relationship with you. And then sort of like after he's had that chance, then give you kind of a chance to make your decision, let you know the implications. I don't want to say a warning because that sounds, um, you know, a bit ominous, but like some relationship building there and a chance for you to make your yeah. own decision before a disciplinary council is ever called. Totally. Right? Totally, totally. And it sounds like that didn't happen at all. At all. Yeah. <laughs> Later, the bishop tried to claim, well, we did meet three years ago uh, where you told me that you, you know, you were going to live a homosexual lifestyle. Um, but a lot can happen in three years. Yeah, exactly. No, it, that doesn't count. That's yeah. not how it's supposed to work. Yeah. It also makes it even worse. The fact that the, the sin that they were being called for, for um, the same sex marriage happened outside of state boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, that's weird. I didn't think about that either. Yeah. But but just if you did, take all the legalism mm -hmm. away, just like the love of Christ, these are humans it's... you're dealing with. Your current bishop should reach out to you, get to know you before he's calling you to his disciplinary council. And this happened with me. I had a new stake president who I'd never met before. And he sends, you know, my previous stake president was okay with my mm -hmm. Mormon stories and what I was doing. New stake president gets put in, is told to excommunicate me. And before I'd ever met him once, I'm getting a letter saying, you're about to be excommunicated, show up to your disciplinary council. And I'm like, I don't even know you, bro. <laughs> like, where's Jesus in that? Yeah. Ooh. And that was the point that I just wanted to bring up over and over again. When we highlight these discussions, it is, where is Christ in this? Where is the comfort, those in need of comfort? Where is the mourn with those that mourn or need uh, the that need that comforting and mourning. And where is Christ in this? Where is Christ in saying, well, you told me three years ago that you were gonna live the homosexual <laughs> lifestyle. Therefore, not without any contact for three years, I'm gonna make sure via the letter that automatically says that you're in a same sex relationship, that you didn't live uh, up to our standards. Like you the church's the, policies were different three years ago. You were the <laughs> That's exactly even, right. Even the church's policies had changed. You know, like, mm -hmm. can you, like, that's crazy, right? And that's my point is like, that that is the standing that this bishop has taken that is the foundation yeah. that this disciplinary council yeah. was built upon mm -hmm. and it's it's shaky yeah. at best so yeah. this is where it starts you know mm -hmm. showing if it's a personal vendetta or like someone yeah. call, telling you know you of need course. to do this to yeah. the bishop mm -hmm. would you say something yeah i was like to be fair um 
in our last conversation with the bishop and sick president, the, the sick president did say, sorry, it was like informal, but we want, you know, can I use the COVID card? It was hard to meet people. It was hard to, okay. you know, do that. That's what that's. He's like, you know, there's, cut, there's us, cut us a little slack. I mean, there's FaceTime, said. there's Zoom, you know, there's the phone, right? Well, yeah. and there's, they could still meet with them before sending them a letter. Yeah. Why had the letter, why What's was the, the letter sent? Contact. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If, if your bishop is concerned, I've had six uh, gay couples that were excommunicated during COVID just just for the record right so mm -hmm. i i'm still certain mm -hmm. quite certain the church's uh, wills of justice as they oh, perceive right. justice stop. we're still working quite <laughs> fluidly during covid because i you're not the only ones that faced a membership council yeah i think we'd, we'd heard about that in, in utah that there was some 70 going around utah to excommunicate gay couples that's just what we heard in idaho so yeah. Um, Can you imagine having that job? Go get the gays. Go get them. <laughs> Take care of them. You, I, I, I bless you with the priesthood power to hunt down the gays. That's the new calling. Kick them out of it's, the church. Yeah. I you really imagine. say you say that though, tongue in cheek, but literally, yeah. Is that happening? Yeah. I think be. that's a very valid question. Yeah. Are there general authority seventies who have been called from Idaho that are walking around Zion, meeting with stake presidents, and saying, "We need to clear this out"? And is that in the church's history? And that's rhetorical because it is. The church has created committees to hunt and root out people. Uh, one of the most active committees that exists today is called the Honor Code at the church educational schools. That is their principal job is to root out uh, evil, root out apostasy and sin uh, within their institutions, and then expose that, bring it out to the light, and then publicly flog those people yeah. and, and then get them to change their behavior. But that's, this has happened for decades, especially yeah. in Idaho. You should look up the Idaho states in the 1950s, where all these sting operations were happening, and these gay people were being mm. exposed. And then the church went, uh-oh, these people are Mormons. These are members of the church. These are bishops and stake presidents who are being caught up in these uh, these these gay stings. Now what do we do? We have to ship them out and get rid of them. So is there a witch hunt out there? Absolutely. And it, it still exists in 2022. So back to the point, I think it is terrible that we're in a situation where we're even laughing or joking at the fact that there is an area authority or a general authority 70 who is out there discussing this with stake presidents saying, find them, get rid of them. And, and so my question is, what is the threat? Where is the threat in having queer couples within your uh, congregations? Why is the church so afraid of LGBTQ couples? Why is the church so afraid of this topic? And in, in my experience in meeting with, with queer people, the church is losing the best and the brightest by excommunicating them and by turning them against the general membership of the church. The church is losing the best and the brightest. Are you saying straight people suck? Is that what you're saying? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying I'm if we had more queer people in church leadership, could the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints look differently? Mm, would okay. there be levels of, in no, I get it. <laughs> but would there be better le levels of inclusion totally. and diversity? It's, it's, it's and just like the fact that over uh, how many were now 200 years in the existence of the church and how many African-American or of black descent uh, leadership uh, roles have been given? Oh, yeah. Very, very few. And I think the diversity of the church, uh, the overall general health of the church has suffered because of its lack of diversity. Totally. thousand percent. I was just kidding you. No, I this know, I know. Fun. Yeah, it's like having not having a brass section or not having a string section in the orchestra. It's you're you're missing out. Yeah, everybody's singing in B flat, and it's just not appealing. Yeah, it's not good. And it's back to that echo chamber we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue, shall we? Mm -hmm. All right. It just feels like there was a witch hunt, and I'm the witch. But what really hurt me was when uh, my family was approached. My mother was under the impression that you were just updating member contact information, when really it was so you could find me for this meeting. Call me, you can text me, or even email me. My email is in LDS Tools. If this was truly an individual matter, I would appreciate my family not being brought into it. But you, you told me, Bishop, that you'd had an internal conflict regarding the church's position on same-sex marriage. I'm not sure if it was the stake president that instructed for this council to occur, but given your internal conflict, my circumstances and our past relationship, it's hard for me to imagine that you were the one pushing for this meeting to occur. I'm married to a man who I love very much, which is in opposition to the church's current teachings, but I don't believe I am sinning and as such, I don't feel the need to repent. Hopefully by me reading this, you can understand more fully where I'm coming from. 
and why I believe the church's teachings on homosexuality are not inspired by God, why I believe the church is still harmful for the gay members, and why I think today's council is unnecessary in my current circumstances. Okay. Well, and Brennan, with, with having said that, um, I can tell you that I really appreciate some of the more recent, you know, um, direction we've received from the church. Um, one thing that I hope you don't feel, and obviously you do, is um, I don't feel like I'm on a witch hunt for you. I actually, um, I really have always enjoyed being around you. I've enjoyed conversations that we've had. Um, the, uh, when you said you were considering having your name removed from the records of the church, that's something that we can certainly do. If, um, usually when we talk about a membership council, that would be more for someone who says, I want to remain a member of the church, um, or I believe, you know, the church is true. And what you've just said, it sounds like none of those things really apply to you. Is that correct? I would say so. Um, I think my council has been along the lines. I mean, they, they were called disciplinary councils in order to provide some consequence for in performing certain actions as a member, still having the records in the church, that some kind of discipline would then be applied. Um, so usually it was more for um, if someone wants to remain a member of the church, this is what process has to happen in order to get into a position where you are. So, for instance, um, if you have a, a married person who has, um, you know, commits adultery, has a relationship outside of their marriage, um, they would have a, you know, back then it's called the disciplinary council, now it's called the membership council. Mm -hmm. And it would be where you have one of those three outcomes that may be that. Um, you have withdrawal of membership, but you usually would also include recommendation of these are the things that can happen for you to become a member again. Um, and so I actually am aware of one of those that has happened with someone who was previously, previously had their membership with, withdrawn from the church, um, join the church again. Mm -hmm. And it's one that I hope in all of this, as you were reading that, I could just feel this wave of, I feel like I'm getting pinned down. Um, and um, that's not actually the desire of any of this. Um, the other that I hope with all of it, you don't feel a sense of um, that I dislike you in any way. It's quite the opposite. I think you're great. Yeah. Um, and I hope that you're happy in your relationship. And I mean, that's that's truly what I believe. And that's why I said that at the end, that it's, it was hard for me to believe that um, that you would be the one pushing for the membership council, um, considering all the factors. But um, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, um, I feel like it does feel like it. I feel like we're out of the church for a while. Like inactivity, I feel like should be like, you know, is there a thing where are we start cleaning out church membership? You know, or you know, because we live all the way in Boise and we're just enjoying our life, and then. You know, I was, I was we got ask, our address, and I was going to ask about that. That um, if if membership councils really were to kind of clarify the um, whether or not somebody would like to remain in the church, um, then why aren't membership councils held for the forty, I think, percent of the church that's inactive, in order to clarify those feelings? Um, be cool if we could send a letter to them saying, would you like to have your records still remain in the church if that was truly the intention of a membership council? Yes, yeah, so with that, and actually that does happen. So there are a number of people that, um, I think you know, the reason someone was upset they were contacted by a member of the church that's in our work boundaries. They say, I'm really not interested in being a member of the church. And so the follow-up was, do you want to have your records removed? Um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to contrast if if it is to clarify a person's willingness or want to continue having their membership records in the church, mm -hmm. then why would the church not then go seek out everyone who is inactive to clarify their intentions about the church? Oh, I would say they probably are. I was going to say. Yeah, um, within our ward, the Relief Society president and the Elders president, they try to um, contact every single patient, every, 
just like every single person who's a member of the church in the Warwick Foundries. Yeah. And in that conversation, that's one of the things that they say, hey, I really am not interested in the church at all. The follow-up question is, are you um, looking to have your name removed from the church? So um, you're asking the question, and kind of that is happening. Well, do they come to their door and then bring a letter to, to oh, you? So, that yeah. says that you need to do membership council because it seems like with inactive people, you just call them like, hey, are you still interested? Which this does not happen. Like you got our address, I which guess, is, yeah, you know, kind to... of in our bubble a little bit, you know, and then sure. that's why he said at the end, it's like, why don't you just email me or text and why yeah. Why there's a letter already says this disciplinary council without even talking to us first, like, you know, it's truly to clarify the intentions yeah. of our membership. Sure. So, um, yeah, it so doesn't. The, the answer to your question is actually kind yeah. of two answers to it. The first one is when it comes to any sort of a membership council, the handbook does uh, stipulate you have to send written notice. So, and it has to be delivered in person um, if it yeah. can't because of proximity or other things, then you can send it by certified mail with the return address. But um, that's one that um, there is no wiggle room on that. Mm -hmm. The other question that you asked is really, you know, what about um, getting into our space? That's actually not the desire. And that's one of the things that we have when we meet with people who are not active in the church here in the ward. If you knock on their door and they say, hey, I haven't been to church for 10 years and I'm not interested in going to the church. Um, that's one where sometimes they'll say, I really don't want to be contacted. And if that's the case, we put them on a do not contact list. And saying that, they still remain a member of the church. There are some people that take it one step further. We say, not only do I want to be contacted, I don't want to be a member of the church. I want to be out. And so that's one where um, that you know they work with me and I have to make that happen. Yeah, but the thing, sorry, the thing is, was that if they're inactive, they you they you would get clarification with them before you send out a letter, um, right? Or do you just send out a letter straight to them? Or do the Relief Society come to their house and, and deliver a letter? You um, know, because sure. if everyone deserve a disciplinary council except for us, that's why it feels like a membership council. You know, You're feeling kind of a persecutory. A little bit, just okay. because we're gay. You know, like well, no. not specifically because that we're gay, but our actions and being married contradicts church teachings. That's what I'm trying so, to get at is that this it, it feels less of a membership council and more disciplinary council because of the topic at hand. Less of clarifying the membership. It's not the same as being inactive is right. what I'm trying to get right. at. So being inactive, again, you'd never have a membership council for someone who is um, inactive. That, that actually doesn't happen at all. Mm -hmm. In the case of, um, so let's say someone was um, okay, I'm going to pause it. Um, heterosexual and. Okay. Did you want to say really, something to that, Brendan? Yeah, really quick. He just said, when someone is an inactive, you do not hold a membership council. <laughs> I've been inactive for four years. <laughs> Why I am I being he, called to this council? <laughs> I think what he meant is no one can be excommunicated on the basis of being, being inactive. inactive. Yeah. I think that's what he was um, saying. But I mean, just a but he's talking because they're pressuring him to say, are you going to enact the people and handing them out letters? Yeah. Is that what you're doing? And he's saying, it, he's like, he's, right. he's trying to paint this picture that like everyone who's inactive in the church is being treated equally, you yeah. know, right. that, that uh, we do go and check in with you and, you know, but the fact is I was never checked up on. I never had a really society or elders quorum, uh, uh, uh Brother, you know, yeah. yeah, come to me and you know, check in with me or, or we my, call you. yeah. They say, you know, we, we do that. We go and we check in with our members. I was never checked in. My first approach and interaction with the church in three years, because I had talked to him three years ago, yeah. was a letter. That was it. And let's keep this in, in just in good context. This bishop is so effective at his job. At, at contacting members that he was able to not only contact all the members in his ward but he was even able to go contact members in a stake clear across the other side of idaho and and follow up on those members too i just wanted to say kudos to that bishop he's on top of it where he's able to have <laughs> all of the time and energy and effort to not only take care of his ward and follow up on every inactive but also start hunting down inactives that don't even live in his ward right that haven't been part of his ward for years and years and years and and bring them into i just think that yeah. that is a, a story of success we should see this on a Mormon ad really quickly. 
The second thing, this whole time, I just wanted to just like scream objection, your honor, leading the witness. He just, how many times is he going to try to push you to resign your membership in this right? conversation? He just kept bringing it, this it up gets, over It gets even over worse. And here over a again, like, no, you just want to resign, right? You just want to just, you don't want this to happen. You just want to get rid of your membership today, right? Right, right, right. Your honor, stop this. Like, quit leading on the witness. Just let him answer the questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that's really, and I didn't find out this later, but after the disciplinary council, after the uh, calls with the bishop and sick person, I actually went and read the whole handbook section. And <clears throat> there is this very, uh, on the resignation section, there is this sentence that says that bishops should not recommend members to resign to avoid a membership council. But all of his line of questioning and what he's saying to me is basically him recommending it yeah. to me. And this is this goes back to our discussion about is there a general authority out there walking the streets of Zion, speaking to stake presidents and offering them certain pieces of advice? And the answer to that is, I believe it's yes. And I believe I know who it is. And I believe I know where he's been because that very option has been given and to multiple people throughout Utah, Idaho, uh, Nevada, and Arizona with those options. Either you attend the the uh, disciplinary council and face excommunication or membership withdrawal, or you resign your membership, or sorry, uh, attend the, I should back up. The first is always um, divorce or separate in your arranged, in your marriage. So they offer you the opportunity to uh, disentangle yourself from this legal and lawful wedding. Mm -hmm. So if you're a gay, gay married couple in a relationship, in a marriage, it's legal and lawful. The church gives you the first option of divorcing, of separating, uh, creating distance between that relationship. That's option number one. Option number two is then if you don't choose to do that, then you can come before the council and receive this court of love, the Care Bear experience in this uh, membership experience, membership disciplinary council. Or number three, they offer you an opportunity. And this isn't on an official church record, but I keep seeing this pop up in stake after stake. It's contradictory. They, like it's, it's against it's the handbook. completely against the handbook. But the, these stake presidents are now saying you could just resign your membership remove your name from the records of the church, and this all goes away. And what that's about is the church knows, well, first of all, why did they change? I mean, is there any difference between a membership council and a disciplinary council? No. Is there any Is there any difference between, you know, excommunication and removal of membership? No. It's exactly the same other than the optics, which is it makes the church look medieval and barbaric because the Catholic church was excommunicating people in the 14th or 15th century and the Mormon church is still doing it in the 21st century. So it makes them look barbaric. They don't want those negative associations. So instead of actually improving, they change the names. Name. Yeah, and, and right. somehow that's going to be different. It's not an excommunication. It's a removal of membership, but they, they want to avoid all that. And so they're going to want to pressure. They, and they do this every single time. I've never seen them not do this. They always pressure the people to resign first because the church knows that it's embarrassing. It, it, it's, it looks bad. It's bad optics. It's not Christ-like. Where did Jesus say, for behold, my brother, and I say unto you, go ye out therefore into the world and anyone who is not living my word, make sure and excommunicate them through a membership council. Like nowhere did Jesus ever say anything about excommunication or disciplinary councils. So, so it's embarrassing. It's cringy. It's medieval, and so they want to pressure you proactively to, to resign so that they don't have to be hung. And I just want to make sure this is on the record. So Jesus did not say, brethren of the Isles of Patmos, please excommunicate <laughs> or seek out those who are not active here and in the American continent. <laughs> Take it upon yourself. To, so, And again, that's back to where we're at again. We have a single bishop who is who is hunting people down in outside of his, his boundaries. Back to the optics side of it as well. I mean, this does hurt the overall. Sometimes we say some of the greatest change happens. Well, the Latter-day Saints will say it's because of revelation, but mm. it's probably likely because of a survey. They have been surveying Latter-day Saints and the optics, the survey results regarding excommunication are so dire and, and result in so many mixed uh, negative feelings the church can only turn away from excommunications. And I think that's part of this optics that we're talking about. Getting rid of the court of love, getting rid of the bishop's court, then moving it into a disciplinary council, and then even softening that language to 
this membership council. Yeah. This yeah. is soft and this is nice. This is like a, a family home evening get together where we sit together and just discuss the, the right. issues of your family. Right. So when the church changed the, the wording, uh, membership council, you know, and instead of disciplinary councils, my first thought, one of my first thoughts was that the, one of the reasons why they were doing was to confuse the language and make it so similar to removing your records, withdrawal membership, removing your records, you know, so that there's so much confusion that they look the same. When you actually, when you go and, and read the handbook, they're completely separate things. Like there's a real process for member resignation till today that the bishop is supposed to meet with you, try to solve your concerns. Uh, he needs to get like a signed letter from you and then he has to give it to the stake president. The stake president has to submit it to the LCR. It's like a whole process completely different to the actual disciplinary council. But my one of my thoughts was that they were changing the wording so that members would be confused and merge those two together. And that's exactly what happened to Brennan. And I didn't talk to them about it. Uh, and and ex I didn't explain the terms to them. So Brennan, when the bishop is saying this and using all this wording, that's what happened to Brennan. Brennan was confused. We're going to hear, hear it later in the, in the conversation, but okay. Is it like, do I res like, remove my records, but you're going to remove my records or but with the membership withdrawals, or you're going to withdraw my membership. Should I, should I withdraw my membership? <laughs> right. yeah, so I, it's just like very, very confusing. I just love how the gospel is so plain and simple. Well, Jesus, who did Jesus condemn? It's all the legalistic Pharisees and Sadducees, right? That were making the gospel so bureaucratic, so legalistic. And just hearing how bureaucratic this entire conversation is where's the love where's the pastoral nature where's the emotion where's the empathy it's just it's missing oh well, it definitely was missing from boise yes <laughs> yes it was um and i mean we'll hear it but that's what i started to ask because i was like is this what excommunication is because the uh, i mean the before terms were a lot easier to understand yeah. Res resignation disfellowship excommunication people can be able to pick those apart and they exactly know what it means but like Rado said, the the wording now is very confusing. So, yeah, let's. let's. I, I I'll just I just received an email uh, that I think is relevant. It's kind of breaking news, but the email says Elder Quentin Cook recently had a training in a certain region of the United States, and during the training, he mentioned that the First Presidency has noticed that the number of membership councils has declined recently, and that this is distressing to them. Elder Cook encouraged um, us not to share shy away from membership councils, um, that we should not be fearful of people leaving the church if we hold councils. He said the First Presidency stated that we should be compassionate and loving, but also bold and not forget justice is also important. Hmm. <laughs> Don't forget your muskets. That's that's all I got from <laughs> yeah. that. So yeah. that's bre breaking news. Okay, wow. should, we, should we jump in and keep mm -hmm. going? Yep. All right, here we go. Um, they were married and they left and they were now living with someone else, right? So mm -hmm. I, I just like to clarify because it seems like that's one of your questions. Am I being picked on because I'm gay, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the answer. So if someone was in that same situation and they went and they were living with someone else, um, then once it's once it's clear that they are doing that, then yeah, you'd have an option counsel. Yeah, I don't I, I don't think it would um, at least in, in my point of view, it was anything to do with us identifying as gay it was well, it's kind of is i i mean being gay but also it's being not married my point because is that it's, it's not if for we were celibate and you know whatever it Sorry. might be then we wouldn't have been contacted let me let me so, make this point here yeah, it's so. not to clarify and clear out church membership it's for disciplinary council like specifically because we're in a gay marriage uh, right? well no, I mean, if someone said, hey, I am gay, I don't actually agree. So if you had read me that same letter, um, you know, three weeks ago, I'd say, oh, well, Brennan, it sounds like you don't want to be a member of the church. It sounds like you want your name off the records of the church. And then we don't have a membership council. This is really only if someone still wants to remain a member of the church. I mean, I, I, I did tell you over the phone that I had intentions of removing my records. So I maybe feel like that would have satisfied my intention or you know my 
like lack of belief in the church, whatever, maybe you could assume why I wanted to remove my records. But even with that, we're still having this counsel, even though I expressed that to you over the phone. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be here. And my, my, I, 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 I would have been fine just in a letter and removing my records, but um, being, being called to this council made me want to come and state my case um, and why I disagree with what the church does. Um, and again, why I feel like the council wasn't necessary and yeah. you know, what we talk about. Um, so well, and that's kind of what we were saying at the very beginning. If you're already there, then I think that you probably kind of stopped the whole thing. Um, when I spoke to you on the phone, you seemed to say you seem to be hesitant in your decision. You said, well, I've been wondering about that. I've been thinking about it. Um, just so you know, we would never remove someone's name from the records of the church if they just say those exact same things. In fact, oh, yeah. usually they have to give a written letter saying they want to have their name removed. Right, um, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, um, I mean, can't go in the past now, but that would call for some clarifying questions of, do you still wish to, I mean, I, I, I still did say that I've been having the intention of removing my records. Um, and so if, if, if that was enough, then right, again, I, yeah. then we wouldn't have this counsel. Well, and that's um, actually what I'm asking you right now. Right. It sounds like that's the, that is your answer, right? Is, you want your name removed from the records of the church. Is, is that not what, you had gotten over the phone when we talked, or was it? I mean, you said you you felt a feeling of hesitancy that it, right. So when we spoke case. on the phone, it wasn't this direct. It was one of those. I've been wondering what to do about it. I think that was that was the way I recall that conversation of yeah. I've been it's, wondering what to do. It's I mean it's it's hard to go back to a conversation that's over sure. now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean I haven't. I still have intentions of removing my records and. I'm okay if it is because um, I'm married to Doug. I I would I prefer that it happens that way. I'd rather I'd rather go away unclean than I don't know um, go away in a pine box. So okay, I didn't understand unquote. that last part. Yeah. What I what I mean is I I'm okay with having my and I I probably prefer to have my records removed on the basis of me being in a same sex marriage. Okay. I, I, yeah, good way to put it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to remove my records for nothing, just because I'm a, a lack of belief. I, I'd rather have my records removed with the reasoning of me being married to Doug. Um, if that, if that's what a, a forceful removal or excommunication. If that's what that means, I'm okay with that. Um, and I, I personally, I would, I would, I would probably prefer that. That sounds weird. That like I would prefer that, but I, 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 I would like to go out being married to my husband, and not for an inconspicuous reason um, that could come up. Sure. So, so I like to make sure that we're. Really clear in this because yeah. clearly I didn't understand our phone conversation before. Are you asking to have your name removed from the records of the church, or are you asking for us to complete the membership council? Um, what what would con what what do you mean complete the, the membership council? Yeah, so um, what I mean is, um, are you saying I'd like to have my name removed from the records of the church, and people can do that with, you know, anyone can walk in here. Um, in fact, tomorrow I get asked. President, or hey, I'd like to have my name removed from the records of the church. All right. Give them a written letter, and they will remove my name from the records of the right. church. Um, is that what you would like to have happen here? Or moving forward with the membership council? Right. Um, I I think I I I'd, I'd rather move forward um, with with everything building up to this council and. Um, uh, my my thoughts on the church um, and even whether the the, the council uh, would have you know been necessary um, I I'd rather I'd rather move forward with it 
I don't feel like I just have a, a lack of salt and belief. I, I truly don't think the, the church is inspired by God, if it ever was. And so, um, so once again, you give a great, you're a very eloquent person, Brandon, sometimes I'm just not sure. I no, you're good. I would like to move forward to the council. Okay, so complete the council, yeah. have a deliberation and a decision mm -hmm. that way. Okay. Yes. So really quickly, I just want to kind of just having been through one of these, <laughs> I'm not gay, but I've been through a disciplinary council. I just want to kind of restate what I hear happening here. It, the, the, in, in the Mormon church, you know, Mormons sometimes want to say they don't believe in hell, but they do. Because in heaven, there's like the highest degree of heaven where you get to be a God and you get to be married and have lots of children and go rule other over other, you know, Worlds. universes or planets. Well, not anymore. No, no, I know you're joking, but, but it actually <laughs> yeah, yeah. it is true. Right. And that's what Russell and Nelson down the church. But, but we don't talk about it. But we don't talk about yeah, it. It's Bruno right so now. So there's yeah. that. And then there's like the terrestrial and the celestial kingdom and outer darkness, where in all those kingdoms, you are separated from your family for eternity. You'll probably lose and, your sex. And you're a servant. You're literally a servant to the people that do achieve godhood. So you're kind of, you're, you're neutered, you're spayed or neutered, and you're destined to eternal servitude where you're not able to be with your parents or your siblings or your children. To, to any reasonable person, that's hell, right? L audience, right. who think about whoever you love, if you live after you die, whoever it is you love, now think about never ever seeing them again, ever being living apart from them and living apart from God for eternity, that, that for eternity not just, you know, a thousand years, 10,000 years for eternity. It is hell. It is what Mormons call spiritual death. That's what Mormons call spiritual death. That's doctrine. So basically, I don't think I'm being overly dramatic here. He's hunting you down. He's not doing this to pedophiles. He's not doing this to murderers. He's not doing this to rapists. He's not doing this to spouse abusers you know, boy, all the thousands of Boy Scout abusers in the church. That's not, he's not doing it to them. He's hunting down a legally lawful, happily married couple, hunting them down and saying, we either want to murder you spiritually or, or we'd rather have you murder yourself spiritually. But if you won't murder yourself spiritually, then we're going to have to murder you spiritually. It's like die by spiritually die by spiritual suicide, or we're going to do it for you. I mean, that's really what he's doing here. And it's, it's ridiculous. Well, and I think I, I noticed such a uh, shift in tone when we're um, just listening to the, the way the bishop was speaking in the initial part of the uh, disciplinary council. And then I think eloquently, both of you, both uh, uh, Doug and Brennan just uh, stuck to your guns and just said, this, this is our position. We feel like this is a witch hunt. We're not active in your ward. We're not even living in your ward boundaries. We don't attend your congregation. We're not attending any congregation. You sought us out. We cannot, but only feel like you are hunting us uh, because of our sexuality. And then when you, when he just, just continue to, to strike saying, res resign your membership, get rid of your, do this on your own, do this on your own. And when you were insistent that you were, weren't going to do that, it was like there was this shift happen. Like the bishop then started to reel saying, this is not going where we thought it was going to go. And he didn't have enough excuses to try to justify him not hunting you down. He, there were no more excuses left. And I thought that was interesting because then the whole tone of the bishop, that demeanor just sounded differently where the bishop is like, oh no, do they, are they on to us? Did we really hunt them down just because, because as you continue to provide evidence after evidence after evidence, that there is only one logical reason why I'm sitting in this disciplinary council today. It's because I'm married. And as John said, legally and lawfully. And when the bishop had no other answers, no other reasons for you being there, it's time to start creating reasons. It's, it's time to start coming up with something that sounds like, Oh no, it's definitely not because you're gay. It's definitely not because you're married. It's definitely not because you live in my ward because you don't. It's got to be something new. It's got to be something different. And we're, and we're going to say there's going to be a, a lot more reasons that the bishop will come up with for holding this council. Later. Never, never will it be acknowledged that this council was held. Well, actually, we did get it on record, but it always is shying away from that fact. 
and I'll uh, just it was say, called for same sex marriage. And I'll just say, I really relate, you know, a lot of, a lot of the apologists, they want the, you know, just like the men in the room, looking at their watches, looking at the walls, not giving you eye contact. A lot of the apologists or believers listening want this to go away. So they're like, why didn't you just resign? You should have just resigned. You didn't even value your membership. I relate to wanting to force them to be and show who they are. They want you to make the decision. So they're not, Accountable. they hunt you down, but then they want you to pull the trigger so that they're not responsible. And it was the same thing with me. What did I do? I started a podcast. I gave a Ted talk, encouraging Mormons to support same sex marriage. I supported ordination for women. They wanted me to resign. And when I wouldn't, uh, then, then, you know, then they, I, I forced them to excommunicate me so that people could see their true colors and they couldn't hide behind my resignation. Yeah. And that, and that's how I felt leaving this council is that I, I kind of, I, I was, I told, I called my siblings afterwards and I was like, I kind of in essence chose my own recommendation for excommunication. I, I chose to move forward with the council. So I kind of in essence chose to be excommunicated. That's, that's how it felt leaving. And I feel because he's giving me these options and these decisions and I chose to move forward with the council. So, yeah. So people could see the church's true colors. But this analogy is so, I think it's such a good analogy. Like they're basically giving you a gun. They're holding a gun. They're giving you a gun and they're saying, you pull the trigger or we will. Right. I mean, yeah. who, what person in the right mind would pull the trigger themselves? And we'd rather you pull the trigger so that we don't look bad. But exactly. We're to, right. Yeah. Yeah. We're right? going to load yeah. the, we're going to the powder inside of that is our policy, our doctrine, our dissonance, our ignorance, our bigotry, our prejudice, all of these things that are loaded to charge the bullet that actually does the destruction. Those are all mixed inside of that bullet where they say, well, it doesn't matter really who pulled the trigger at the end of the day. It really was just the doctrine that got, you were just <laughs> violating this doctrine. You're violating mm -hmm. this policy. That is this, this part of this, this frustrating portion of membership councils that pit good people against each other. Yeah. And, and just like you had mentioned, John, in, in your excommunication, uh, this is, this is so relatable to so many of them, whether it's on a stake level with 15 men in the room or on a ward level with Brennan and, and Doug's uh, situation with three other men in the room, four other men in the room, there is always uncomfortableness because many of those people and the letter that was written, the, the, the quotes that were given are so logical that those Latter-day Saints who are sitting as judges of Israel in those disciplinary councils have to look at that and say, oh my gosh, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah. yeah. And that's got to be frustrating. That's yeah. got to be heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Should we keep going? Yeah. <laughs> All right. There's more. Here we go. Um, what, what, uh, I guess more would be in completing the council. Actually, um, we've already had, this is kind of um, what you read was perfect. Um, the, so we'll excuse you and we'll have a conversation. Any other questions? No, yeah, I'm good. I think it's, I think it's clear where everybody is. Okay. So, and then do you guys have any other questions? Um, when do I get a letter next? <laughs> this is for Brennan. So. Yeah. But, well, and that's the thing is it would be your, your bishop, either of your current ward or of your former one. Um, you know. I guess that is maybe a question you could answer because I, 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 I don't talk to an average bishop very often. Mm -hmm. Um, what what's uh, um, if if the if the general handbook has kind of these like clear instructions on what's to happen in this case and um, what a membership council is defined as and um, and all of that uh, what would I guess what would keep um, like Doug's bishop from contacting him ever if at all gotcha. versus with with me sure is that on a bishop by bishop basis or is that come from like the area authority the, sure no there's um, a couple of things it, it's similar to um if you were to go to the various wards throughout the church there are some that are very good about contacting every member within their boundaries there's some that are not very good about contacting every member within their boundaries um and so 
those are probably going to be the biggest reasons that there would be differences um, in that whole thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know my elder's quorum president knows that I'm gay and married to a gay man. He, we had a conversation, but there was never a follow up. So that in that way, that's why partly I feel like, you know, maybe Brennan has a special case that was kind of being sought out a little bit, but I never was contacted. Sure. Um, you know, a follow up meeting. Maybe he's not a good uh, who's quorum president. No, I wouldn't say that. I'm just saying, you know, you know there, there can be various reasons that people do or don't. So um, when I lived in Philadelphia, I think um, the uh, if you looked at the number of members of the church and the number of people that actually came to church, their hands were full. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you have 40% of the people that come to church and 60% that don't, you go and contact them on a monthly basis. Um, it's virtually impossible. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's because someone does a bad job. Um, just sometimes you have your hands full. Right. Or you're an ER doc. Yeah. You know, time. busy, busy times. Um, uh, I guess the other question I did have um, is, uh, Basically, what he just said there is, <laughs> if if you have too many inactives in your ward, you don't have time to go hunt down the gay people and excommunicate. But them. if we did have all the time in the world, everybody <laughs> would be having a membership council. But but, but we just don't have the time, and COVID's playing a role too, so we just don't have the time to do it. But I'm so good and I'm so efficient that I'm able to do not only my ward but yeah. also hunt down people outside of my ward boundaries, outside of my stake boundaries. Who I haven't talked to, who I haven't talked to in three years. And clearly, by the power of revelation, I also know that they're not active in the church, yeah. even though I really don't know that. Yeah. I mean, it's so weird because none of us are living the gospel. None of us are. He's not. He probably masturbates. Like it's almost, a, <laughs> it's almost a guarantee that that bishop masturbates. Oh lordy! It's you know most men do. Ninety percent of men do. I've, we've had many, many bishops, come, former bishops, come on Mormon stories and mm -hmm. say they masturbated while they were bishops. Yeah. Like they could hunt down everyone. But is that what Jesus was about, hunting down the sinner? Like, who knows if in five or 10 years you might want to come back to church? Right. Why are they proactively hunting down people that they think are sinners? That's question number one. Mm -hmm. And question number two is, why are they why are they focusing on the same-sex married ones? And what, by the way, it seems like there's a bigger priority against same-sex married gay people than like single gay people that aren't same-sex married. So it's almost like you get punished for living a healthy, loving, monogamous right. relationship. Right. But if you just want to be a single gay person hooking up all over the place or a straight person hooking up all over the place who's single, they don't care about that. So why why are you penalized for, for getting legally, lawfully married in a loving, committed relationship? Which why is, which, why which, is that penalized? Which, which is exactly the relationship. Yeah, which is exactly the problem that we have in this whole discussion. It is if indeed, as Elder Oak said, in 2019, that homosexual relationships and heterosexual relationships will be treated the exact same way. How is this possible? How are we in this situation? Because you're exactly right. If, I mean, someone brought this up on the chat yesterday. Uh, when has the church or is the church attacking all the, the soakers or the jump humpers or the <laughs> people who run to BYU or run to Las Vegas and get married so they can have sex and then annul the marriage and, and run back to BYU again? If we're really, and just honestly, this isn't just rhetorical or rhetoric. If we're honestly approaching this topic in a equal uh, bilateral fashion, then where are where are the excommunications? Where are the membership councils? I'm not seeing them, and I feel like I'm pretty close to the the ground. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm I'm involved in this community enough. Usually, when people go through this this topic, it's pretty well known. But the ones that we hear the most, and the ones that create the most distance are those that surround the LGBTQ topic. Yeah. And, and we haven't even discussed the transgender side of this yet. Uh, yeah. we're, we're only discussing um, people who are in uh, same, -sex, same -sex, sex relationships or marriages. Um, I was talking to a former stake president about this case after the disciplinary council and everything was going on. He brought up a really good point and I just pulled this up on the handbook of instructions. It says that the reason, the, the purpose of uh, membership councils and membership withdrawal is number one, help protect others. There's three, there's only three. Number two, help a person access the redeeming power of Jesus Christ through repentance. This next one is the whole reason why this is happening. 
but the and protect the integrity of the church um how is it but the thing is like how is the church protected uh how is the church's integrity protected when these guys are inactive not even going to church not um, even saying anything about church not saying anything about church like this makes no sense it falls under none of these uh three categories and and if this is a church about family if this is a church about um familial relationships and and creating this eternal bond why are we breaking up why are we offering or making uh gay couples giving them the invitation to divorce and to separate that family why are we as elder oak said i wouldn't want to take my kids into public i wouldn't want to show you off to my friends i don't want you to stay as a lengthy house guest if there are young children in the home i don't want my gay son or daughter to be involved with the uh, the young children in the home. If this truly is a church about family, why are we set? Why are we creating those divides? And and I still don't have an answer to that. And this just back to kind of that point that you brought up, Gerardo. Why is it that what is the great gay threat to Mormonism? Why can why can we not see gay couples sitting in pews uh, across Zion? Why is the church so afraid of seeing LGBTQ couples in its pews? What is the great threat? As the only straight person in this room, I can tell you what the threat is. What, what, what was fatal to my homophobia? It was meeting gay people and Amen. looking them in the eye mm. and talking to them and getting to know them and seeing that their love was literally no different than my love. You realize that everything that was taught over that pulpit does not match the rhetoric or yeah. does not match the real lived experiences the, of the LGBTQ people. The first gay person I actually talked to was when I was working in Chicago as a computer programmer. And I didn't know for months he was gay. And, and he was just super helpful and generous and kind to me and really nice and friendly and talented. And then one day I said a homophobic thing at work and everyone turned to me and they said, John, have you ever known a gay person? And I'm like, well, no, but what does that matter? And then, and then, Mike spoke up and said, well, I'm gay. And the first, and I, and I was like, for the first time, I'm like, uh, wow. Okay. Hi, Mike. You've been really nice to me. I'm sorry. I said a rude thing. And then over the next few months we had talks and the thing that came up for me and him was, well, the gay lifestyle. And, you know, I told this talk in my Ted talk, I, I told the story in my Ted talk, but he's like, my, my gay lifestyle is like waking up with my partner, having coffee, having breakfast, getting ready for work, going to work, working all day, coming home, having dinner with my partner, washing the dishes, watching a show and going to bed. And I thought, huh, that sounds a lot like me and Margie. And at that point, I'm like, well, that's actually beautiful. Why are we fighting this? But it was getting to have that conversation. So that's the most dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. And so the church has to get purge you all from the roles so that you're not on the roles. So that, so that visiting teachers or home teachers or ministers don't come out and find you, heaven forbid, and get to know you and look you in the eye and see you holding hands, seeing the lovely couple that you are, seeing your happiness, and then having to sit with the knowledge that this is actually beautiful, healthy love. Why is the church fighting this? That's, that's the threat. It absolutely defies the rhetoric. We've had decades and decades and decades of, of a homophobic church that has spewed out rhetoric that says there is no happiness, there are no spiritual experiences, there is no joy on this side of the aisle. And then around the kitchen table, here are these Latter-day Saint families who have a son or a daughter or a spouse who comes out and they look across the kitchen table and they say to themselves, oh my gosh, my son, my daughter, my spouse is none of the things that I heard of over the pulpit. They aren't void of the spirit. They aren't uh, guilty of of grooming or pedophilia or any of the awful things that have been taught. They aren't uh, unqualified for the spirit. They they aren't all, any of these things. And so the great threat is that the rhetoric, that the revelation, the doctrine, the policy will be contradicted by the real lived experiences of real human beings. And that is it's probably the death knell of this topic. And it just didn't extend to something simple like a, um, a, a kitchen table discussion. It wasn't something like as, as dramatic as a, a, a membership council or, or a disciplinary council. But when something like monumental, like the November 2015 policy came out, where the church labeled uh, 
gay people in uh, marriages or a long uh, or committed relationships as apostates and started excommunicating them, but also not only just the excommunication and the apostasy, but then prohibited eight-year-old children from being baptized into the church, the children of these gay couples. That caused mass casualty within the church. Not only we can discuss su suicidality among the LGBTQ community, but as Greg Prince accurately pointed out, over 60,000 members of the church resigned their membership immediately in the aftermath of the November 2015 policy. And then he even brought up in the Liberty Well stake, just miles from where we're, we're broadcasting right now in Salt Lake City, 10% of the stake resigned their membership as a result of the 2015 policy, yeah. that November 5th, 2015 policy. And why was that? It's because the Latter-day Saints looked at the rhetoric, the years and years and years, decades of rhetoric against gay people. They, they merged that with the real lived experiences of someone that they loved. And when they realized that those two didn't match, they sided with love. They sided with honor and dignity. It was people first, not policy, not pulpit. They chose the person first. And when they did that, that dissonance was, was created. It wasn't that someone like a Brennan or a Douglas uh, created this, this new narrative and, and was appalling and, and second guessing what church leaders did. This was just a matter of love. Mm -hmm. This was a matter of, of constant acceptance and, and better inclusion. These are all the things that aren't we, we're looking for all of these things in a religious society. We want inclusion and love and, and not a, a prejudicial society. And yet the, the ways we're finding it is through people who have actually left the church. To me, it's, it's sad. To me, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. And also it's suicidal for the church because the, the 20 somethings, the teens, the 20 somethings, the Gen Zers, the millennials, they're not having any of this. So that we know that upwards of 80% of the kids raised Mormon in the United States are leaving the church and the LGBT issues is for sure right up there is one of the top reasons they're leaving. So it's the church is actually harming itself by, by doing this. I'll say it again and again, they are losing the best and the brightest among them. And, and, in my position, hosting a, a podcast where we share the stories of the LGBTQ people, um, I don't, I really am not concerned about whether they stay in the church or leave the church. I'm concerned, and my work and my advocacy is creating places where people are no longer harmed. Mm. You can attend the church, you can leave the church. I don't care. But if you're going to attend a church or if you're going to attend an organization, I don't want that organization hurting people. Yeah. I want that harm to go away. And then you can find that sense of community wherever that lands. But for an organization that continues to hurt people, that's what I'm against. That's my advocacy. I don't want to see people get hurt. Love it. Agreed. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's see how this ends. We're, on, we're, we're, we're coming to the end of this part. <laughs> Oh no. Oh no. Shoot. Hello. Hey. Uh, oh, sorry. Hello. Let me just uh, go back. Oh man, I don't know the exact time. Oh, there. Yeah. There. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't think it's because someone does a bad job. Um, just sometimes you have your hands full. Right. Or you're an ER doc. Mm -hmm. Whatever. You know, busy, busy times. Um, uh, I guess the other question I did have um, is. Uh, I mean, it's it's up to you. It's up to you to answer. But um, uh, I know you you said you had I guess some internal conflict. Um, was this a recommendation from your state president, or so we can have some guidance from the state leadership, right? Because yeah. um, I know from what from what I read read the state president kind of. Um, you have to have permission from him in order to do it um and so yeah coming into here it was just hard it was hard for me to believe that you were you know that you were really wanting this to occur especially when membership councils for same-sex marriage are not required and there's you have every option not to do it because it's not required um versus i don't know incest or whatever other case it is where there's some is required. Is required yeah right um, the, uh, and that's, um, when we talk about these types of things, um, Brennan, when I was called as a bishop and they said, you'll be a Obama judge in Israel. I said, well, I hope I have a conviction record of zero. And they laughed at that and said, that's probably not gonna happen. Um, in saying that, um, 
with this type of a, a counsel, again, I, I still have the sense for me to feel like, hey, I'm being punished here. That's really not the purpose of a membership council. There are times that people will do things that they're like, yeah, that's going to be in contrast to what a member can, you know, the conduct of a member. Um, and when that is the case, then, you know, what, what are the steps that you take from where we are now to being a member in full fellowship? So I, I remember hearing someone ask um, over Holland about this, where they said, so is your objective to say you're in or you're out? And he said, our objective is to have everybody in, but everybody in following the same standards and the same guidelines, right? So if you take your coffee and, and tobacco or alcohol analogy from Greece, that all those things are legal. But if you want to be a member of the church, um, you have to not do that, right? Um, and so that's really more the thought of a membership council. Um, so having said all that, it's one that um, when we first, when you first said that um, that last meeting we had in my office, but again, I think it was two years ago. Um, at that time, I think you were dating. And I said, well, you'd be welcome to come to church meetings. That's actually still the case. Um, some of these people say, well, why in the world would I want to come? That's, that's one where everyone is invited to come. You know, you'd still be welcome to come. Um, but if someone wants to be a member in full fellowship, there are certain, you know, they have to kind of live according to certain standards there. All right. Yeah, depend. I want to say something I mean, really quick. Yeah, go ahead, Rod. Um, I think it's really interesting how he keeps comparing, and he will do it over and over again, comparing their case with violating the word of wisdom. Yeah, and coffee, the, <laughs> coffee, alcohol, and tobacco. Because that's not excommunicable. The, exactly. Well, He's not hunting those people down. That's one, and <laughs> they don't. They, the handbook says that that um, a membership council should not be held on the basis of oh violations of the word of wisdom, but also or inactivity in the church or in, yeah, right. But also I was thinking it more. And what is the thing that Mormons are always taught about why we avoid those things? Because they are uh, bad for our health. But what else? They are. A, they is are it, is addictive, it the, ga is it right? the gateway addictive. drug? It's addictive. addictive yeah. Right. Yeah, and yeah. that's why we don't do them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's comparing this thing and and with this i mean we know that this idea exists in the church that homosexuality is sex addiction and that you can that you can you can overcome your sex addiction or your homosexual addiction um and that's the only way i can see i i can just wrap my head around why would he be bringing using addiction, that as an analogy yeah yeah um addiction substances and using it as an analogy to same, mm -hmm. a same-sex relationship. So he's saying, basically, alcoholics have to leave their alcoholic addiction, so you have to leave your same-sex addiction in order to be part of the church. Which is so 1970s, 1980s. Yeah. It's very archaic. Yeah. And the analogy doesn't even apply because... Well, yeah, like we yeah. talked about. Why? Go ahead. It doesn't apply because th there's no membership council held. Right. No yeah. matter, like, you can keep staying in the church and keep drinking coffee, but I've never heard a case. And and later, we asked them about this, and they said, how did you know this is not happening? And I'm like, <laughs> what are we going to say? Like, because it says it in the handbook that it's yeah. not happening. That's not, anyway. you know. Anyway. And and I just, you know, he's he basically says, hey, by the way, don't be confused. You're not being punished. <laughs> Like how compelling, well, how did that feel? And what is your reaction to him saying, we're not punishing you because you're same sex married. Don't be confused. The, 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 this is something that my mom has taught me ever since I was a little kid. Your intention doesn't matter as much as you think it does. Even if you have good intentions, you can still hurt people. You can still enable them. You can keep them from learning, from growing. So, you can say, oh, it wasn't our intention to hurt you. This isn't what this is about. We're not trying to punish you. You're still causing harm and hurting people. I mean, you can always have a good intention. And you can say, oh, I shouldn't be held accountable because I, have, I had a good intention. But that's not it. So, yeah. 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 
That's okay. how I felt. That's yeah. How I felt. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's clearly punishing you, but they just don't want to own up to it. Yeah, well, exactly. would that punishment now become some reflection on the actual leader? And I think that's probably a large portion of where we are in this whole discussion. This bishop has now realized I may have just pushed these this couple into my office over my own personal beliefs, mm. and I can't have that on my conscience. Yeah. And here's a group of men who won't even look these two in the eye and say, uh, oh yeah, what they're quoting is actually, that's our, that's our own words. Those are the words of our own prophets and apostles. Mm -hmm. Don't make eye contact. And then the bishop who now they're guilt by association involved in this membership council. The bishop is now looking at it saying, look, maybe the very best way we can get out from underneath it is just have you to resign your membership. If you'll just exit yourself out of this, then that onus, that, that guilt no longer falls upon my shoulders as the bishop. Therefore, mm -hmm. you have now dealt with this on your own. And, and again, the overall justification that he continues to bring up is that, look, this, this isn't my addiction, kids. This is not mine. This is your addiction. Mm -hmm. You couldn't fix yourself. You got further down into the hole. I've always tried to throw you a lifeline. I've always tried to help you. For now, four years, I've known you. And even to the point where I remember when your dad passed away and, and in young men's, I've always tried to be there to rescue you. I can't rescue you anymore. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, how I would have gathered you like a hen gathereth her chicks, yet ye would not. It's back to you. It's back to Brennan. This is your fault. This is your your bed, your your opportunity to fix yourself. And you couldn't. You couldn't do all the things that Spencer Kimball promised you was possible. You couldn't do the things that Elder Oaks promised you was possible. You couldn't do the things that Boyd K. Packer, that uh, that all the other church leaders claimed that was possible. Therefore, you have to suffer these consequences. It's not me at all. Or maybe it is, but it's not me at all. And that's, that's the position that we run from. And that's not healthy. Yeah. It is, it is blame reversal. We always come back to that. There are 30, at least 31 techniques of high demand religions or cults. Mm -hmm. And one of them is we have a doctrine or a policy or a prophecy. And if it doesn't come true, it's your fault. Yeah. So they, they have a standard of what's true and you weren't able to live up to it. Well, not only that, there's a standard, there's, there's a, there's a standard. The church will fill North and South America. It will fill the whole earth. And when that doesn't happen, then they come in and say, oh, well, only the elect, uh, very few among us will actually inherit Zion, that it'll be very, just a, a minuscule amount or yeah. a, a few and simple. So there's a, there is a standard. And then there's another standard just in case the first standard how, doesn't work. House always wins. Basically. House always wins. Yeah. That's yeah. a great point. Great way of putting it. All right. So uh, at least we now know you're not being punished. You just need to <laughs> stop sinning, basically. I shouldn't you know. laugh. I shouldn't laugh. Yeah. Okay. Let's round this out. And again, we're not pun we're not making fun of the person. It's the system because this is every bishop <laughs> or stake president caught in this bad situation. All right. Let's keep going. And on, on, on what it is, at least, because. If someone's drinking coffee and a member of the church, I assume a membership council wouldn't be held. For Usually that not. That you'd probably put them on formal restrictions. So there's a lady one time that asked her bishop. Um, she was drinking coffee. She said um, she wanted to renew her temple recommend. She said, Bishop, you're not going to let a cup of coffee keep me out of the temple, are you? And he asked her right back. You tell me, are you going to let a cup of coffee keep you out of the temple? Because the standard is, no, you can't drink coffee. I did see a conference talk of that recently. I think it was from the, the General Way Society uh, presidency. Um, and, and she talked about you know, the, the same thing, the, the, the coffee pot on the back of the stove. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess my, my whole line of question is, it's so bizarre. <laughs> it's not the same thing. I don't but, know. I mean, he, and he recognized it later. It's like, wait, that was such a terrible this analogy. That's a terrible analogy because now I'm talking about Temple Recommend interview and I'm comparing it to membership council. It's, it's a horrible and it's so trivializing. Some beverage consuming is comparable to finding the love of your life and who you want to spend the rest of your life with. When we know the church put people through electroshock therapy and conversion therapy, blamed them for being gay, and then science said, oh, church, you were wrong. It's Makes not a choice. Marriages. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it, celibacy, celibacy does, is, is unhealthy. Mixed orientation marriages are awful, end in divorce. We're, you know, we were wrong, but then they're still going to pathologize it and belittle you by comparing it to a beverage. 
that they're not excommunicating people for it. And even the history behind that. Think of all that's come out of Mormonism in terms of revelation and growth of the church and, and the governance of the church that happened prior to the word of wisdom, prior to section 89 of the Doctrine and Covenants. So was all that negatable because they were under mm -hmm. the influence of, I mean, the, was the Kirtland Temple experience really spiritual or was it just because there were vats of wine that were flowing? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Rhetorical. But <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea. Like, Susan, I would love to welcome you into the gates of the celestial kingdom, but I can't because you had that coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, the analogy. And by the way, there's a there's a crud ton of Mormons who drink coffee and still go to the temple. And my, my mom was given permission to go to the temple drinking coffee if a doctor said it was good for her health, yeah. for her bowels or whatever. We need and a, we, we know need a, that we need approval for a society before allowing you into the temple. Well, right, but, or a medical thing, but but it's been medically demonstrated that being in a committed same sex legal relationship right. is better for your health. Right. So why don't you get an exemption? Are you, <laughs> let me just ask, are you happy and healthier being in a committed, loving relationship? Of the course, man, right? of course. Maybe we need a doctor recommendation. <laughs> and to, like, are you truly happy? Yeah. <laughs> doing a, doing a, in um, psychology, it's a PHQ nine is the, <laughs> the assessment for depression. Maybe yeah. we need one of those. <laughs> yeah. That's a great point though. Really? It is a great point. Why? Um, because at the end of the day, isn't the whole purpose of this to to create joy and be men, men is that they might have men are that they might have joy and companionship. I guess yeah, same goal, it, not in this case. It is not good for man to be alone. Men are that they might have joy. You guys, yeah. <laughs> right? There's joy. Yeah. And Kyle, I imagine you enjoy your relationship with Jay. It's healthy for you and good. hundred percent. Gerardo, I think you and Zach are probably healthier together. Yeah, for sure. And I your mean, three dogs. What's yeah. that? And the dogs. Yeah. Well, and that's just really it. Like I, I Father's Day was just recently and I, I was just looking through old photos and um, I was married in a mixed orientation marriage and I had a life before this life. But I really look at it and the end of the day, combining those family photos of my wife and our kids and now my fiance, soon to be husband and our kids, zero regrets zero regrets. And I didn't have to sacrifice any of my values and any of my morals to get there. Zero regrets. Family. Isn't it about time? Isn't it about that relationship? And y'all really should listen to Kyle's interview on Mormon stories and Gerardo's. Both of them are epic interviews about how they became healthy by disobeying the church, frankly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, Bishop, stop with the coffee stuff, okay? <laughs> stop. Just stop with the coffee analogies, Bishop. I, I, I just I couldn't stop thinking if it wasn't required, then why was it happening? You know, um, and if maybe it was just personally you felt like the meeting, the, the council needed to happen, even though it wasn't required, or if it was the state president that instructed you to do so. We had some, we had some instruction on the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. So that's that. a big deal. Right. Second time. Second time he says that letter, I think it made it pretty clear. Not only so second that's... time he says that, but he also does not implicate the stake president directly every time he said, We have received instruction from members of the stake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's, not, said he's we, not identifying yeah. someone specifically. Yeah. So he's, the church always wants to say it's a local decision, it's, it's not coming down from church headquarters. And yet, Quentin Cook, Quentin Cook is saying, Here's the gun, stake presidents. You know, here's the gun. Use it. Um, and so they they want to have it both ways. They want to claim that it's always a local matter. They want plausible deniability. They want to be able to say that it was a local decision, so that the corporate church is not responsible. And then at the same time, uh, Quentin Cook is running around telling stake presidents to use the disciplinary councils, right? And in your case, he admitted what? Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, in, in this case, he's like, yeah, I am I am howling this council because you're in a same-sex marriage, you know? And it's coming from above, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. At, this, at that time, that's, that's what we were given the impression of, and that's what he told us. So yeah. I was like, okay, well, he said he'd received instructions, so it can't be him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, it makes sense. You know, I've known him for a long time. He wouldn't come after me. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And this has been going on for decades. The church wants to deny top down instruction, but they're 
giving top down instruction. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, let's keep going. That um, with those types of feelings, why in the world would you want to remain a member of the church? Yeah, the thing is, there's so many friends of mine that still want to be a part of the church, regardless. And it's hard to see that, you know, even knowing all this stuff and, and believing part of it, they they still want to remain in the church for a lot of reasons for the community, the companionship. Um, there well, is a family and, and family. Yeah. If, if you if you ask any uh, ex Mormon, quote unquote, will tell you that the biggest thing that they miss from being in the church was the community and the connection to everyone around them. Um, in saying that, did they feel like they couldn't attend church meetings anymore or go to church functions? I don't know. Um, I would be talking about specific cases, but um, some of them felt like they were probably comfortable and others didn't really, really feel comfortable. I mean, last time I was in church um, was a singles ward in my freshman year of college. So. It was my uh, my. It was me testing the waters to see if I was going to be going to church after I graduated, you know, mm -hmm. and left my my home, um, mom's house, you know. Um, and my immediate feeling was that the intention of the singles ward was for everyone to get married, and I knew I couldn't do that. Um, and so it it didn't didn't make sense or feel right for me to be there because if everyone else was to be getting married and I wasn't going to be able to, at least in the, you know, the church's guidelines and it just felt nonsensical. It is didn't feel right. Um, so that's kind of where my inactivity started was because I, I hit 18 and for the church, that's when you start looking for your soulmate. And I did just not with the church. Sure. So I understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of them doesn't really have a choice if they live at home, they have to go to church or they found out that they're gay while they're in college. In my case specifically, um, I could be open about it, you know, um, for, and so far you're losing your, your degree, not tenure that's after, but yeah, anyway, um, but yeah, it's hard. It's a hard topic, but yeah. Okay. Well, listen, um, why don't you step out for just a minute? Okay. Mm -hmm. Bring it back in just a minute and talk some more. Okay. Brendan, in, in talking about that, we are recommending withdrawal of membership. Um, I think you were kind of already on that pathway, right? Um, but like I said, it's not final um, until the state, it's not official until the state president approves of that. Um, and then you have a right of appeal with the state president within 30 days. Okay. Okay. That's it. You have a reaction. <laughs> yeah. So that last part, um, he said, he says, uh, we're recommending for you a withdrawal of membership. And which just so people in, understand that that, that part is was communication after, after they deliberated. Yeah. So yeah. they deliberated and I wish we could have been able to record that part, but <laughs> yeah, we weren't able to, um, anyway, so afterwards his recommendation was for me to be excommunicated with a withdrawal of membership, you know, nowadays, um, and he's and he follows up by saying and you were kind of already on that pathway already anyway which is not which is not the case i was not, i'm not i was i i can't be on the pathway for excommunication the church has to come and seek me out for an for a membership council they have to go to the work to do it i was not on my way to do it at all so and, and it was this reinforcement this bias again this so you were already on the way out right mm -hmm. you will it's they this, just don't want to own it i know they just don't want to own it it's, it's gonna the get reverse, even better the reverse commitment pattern that we all remember from the mission you will be baptized won't right you yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you, just you, just another quick question though for you two how yeah. uh just uh how much time passed uh, how much deliberation time did the uh bishop like take 10 minutes i would say 10 minutes max yeah wow. um at least five and you know till 10. Yeah. and and then so jeff they've or somebody, the the clerk, the clerk. word clerk. Um, oh yeah, and we're avoiding names. Did he did he hang out with you? What was that like as the word clerk? Um, 
because he had to exit the the mm-hmm. meeting with the bishop. Yeah, and the he, two he counselors, was there outside the, the bishop's office, which is us. not required. I wonder why. Yeah, I, I wondered that too. I just so I just wondered if there was interaction. Did he speak with you? Was it like um, not recognizing your other ward members on Sunday at Chuckarama? Like, how weird was it? Um, it wasn't. I don't know. I'm a pretty personable person, so I, 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 it wasn't weird to be for me to be sitting next to him. Um, I, uh, he, he lives near where my, where I grew up, and so we kind of talked about that. And he's like, "Yeah, there's this neighborhood development going behind, you know, this house in this neighborhood." And I was like, "Oh, cool, you know." So just casual conversation. I'm just um, weirded out because and this I'm whole not. Thing yeah, happened. Doug is weirded out to the ninth. Um, <laughs> Why, Doug? <laughs> because like we just had this intense conversation where we've been put into this punishment and then we walk outside and like oh how's it going you know how's everything <laughs> everything is good in the hood see th- this is this is a, a great example of like the dissonance that you will see for i, I, I feel like church um uh, bishops stake presidents just and church organization too. yeah is that they've got this two-faced thing this of like point. you know um uh, we're going to do this terrible thing and it's going to be really hurtful. We're and cutting it, you off from your family and friends for eternity. Exactly. Right. And then, you know, two minutes later, complete shift of like, hey. um, yeah, you know, nothing happened. Mm-hmm. We're just, you know, we're hanging out. Let's, yeah. uh, Wait, where are you going after? You're going to go out you dinner? Know, like, let, let's talk about this, you know, new <laughs> development going on behind the neighborhood. Yeah, you know, they, like, <laughs> they took off their judge hat and put on their human hat. Well, not only that, then exactly. it's often, they often followed up with, but just make sure you know that you're welcome here. We want you to attend. <laughs> you can still attend all of our activities. And what's preventing you from even coming to church after this happened? That's usually the rhetoric, the <laughs> yeah. rhetoric that you start getting. Yeah, yeah, spackle over sandpaper. That's it, yeah. All right. Well, that was the disciplinary council. Wow. Yes, and, it, was. Uh, it gets better. I promise it gets a lot what? better. What? There's more, but there's more. All it's, right. So it, why? It gets better in the sense that we get to see it it gets worse is like the the yeah. amount of contradictions gaslighting just goes way up from here on out it's yeah. like but yeah. until this point this whole council was called because of same sex marriage same sex marriage. marriage and uh, the bishop during this the council was you know trying to make it seem like it wasn't for that it was so we could you know see if you still wanted to attend church but that wasn't i wasn't called because i wanted to, to, to because they wanted to see if I still wanted to do it in church, you know? So like, um, but he said it several times that it, your, your actions go against church standards. And if someone's not leaving the church standards and then we have to hold they, a council. Yeah, yeah. They didn't can't be part of the church and right. all this stuff. Nothing exactly. out about. So there was nothing about church. apostasy, nothing about speaking uh, mm-hmm. against the church. Yeah. That's, a, that's important to know at this point, yeah. nowhere up at this, to this point in time before the council or during the council, has have we been asked about anything related to speaking bad against the church or speaking out against yeah, the church, yeah. which is quote unquote apostasy? Yeah, and no, I already, I, yeah. I think I know this is going because I gave my TED talk supporting same sex marriage mm-hmm. in like October November of 2013, and then 2014 I'm early 2014 I'm called into my disciplinary council, and all it was about was about your support of progressive causes, but then when I started telling the world that I was going to be excommunicated for advocating for same-sex marriage. I'll just tell you what they did to me. They tried to turn it and say, well, we found something you said three years ago that we don't like. <laughs> it was it was while you were inactive and you've, you've reconciled with the church since then, but that's the reason we're doing it. Don't go telling people that we're excommunicating you because you support same-sex marriage. Yeah. And right? this is exactly what's going to happen. And yeah, okay, you're going to well, see, but, it, spoil but it, it, doesn't but work. That's what happened to me. But it doesn't work for us. <laughs> well, it happened so, to Michael Quinn. You know, yeah. like it's happened to, like yeah. it happens over and over again. They just don't want to own it. That's they why they don't want recordings. Yeah. 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 Well, in the mouth of two or three excommunications, shall every excommunication be established? And, yeah. <laughs> And by the way, why isn't a bishop good enough to excommunicate somebody? Like, why even have the disciplinary council at the bishop if the stake president still has to approve it and can override it? That's a, that's, that's a, a point that um, I was really alarmed by this whole thing from the very beginning. And I talked to my dad about it. He was alarmed about it. I, you know, former stake president was outraged by it. The church holds this idea of holding a membership in the church very, very seriously. And that's why they put this like checks and balances. So 
because it's it's such an important matter to them. Um, it's your salvation. It's your living with your your family forever. I mean, just the fact that a few decades ago, there was not a way to resign the church. Like that was added, you know, in the last few decades. Um, and, and, and that these councils are held based on very, are supposed to be held very, based on very serious stuff. Verifiable. Verifiable, very serious stuff like mm -hmm. incest, like rape, like murder. child molestation, murder. So putting same sex marriage in the same category with this other, all other stuff, like, you know, it really shines a light as to how, um, uh, great like how big the issue for the church is even though for maybe some members and some other people might not it is a not fact understand. that you're more likely to be excommunicated in the mormon church for being same-sex married than you are for being a pedophile or a, a spouse abuser correct you're more <laughs> often to be let off without excommunication if you s sexually abuse children or beat your spouse it's a great point yeah. you're, you're not you're not wrong that is that is a valid 100 percent true yeah. point the other thing is, look, does God inspire bishops or not? Because because if God inspires bishops, why does the stake president have to like sign off or reject? I mean, bishops can make all sorts of decisions and they're supposed to be inspired. So is God going to tell the stake president something different than he told the bishop? Why do we need checks and balances if there is true inspiration to every single priesthood leader in the church? I don't I don't think there's any situation in which a stake president has ever you know, contradicted a decision that the bishop has made. And this is what we're going to see later when the story starts changing. The stake president, is, even though he previously is going to tell them in a phone call that what the bishop did was probably wrong, he's later going to side with the bishop. So that's a segue to our next segment. So we've yeah. got, so June 2nd, you did a phone conversation with your stake president asking if they knew about the disciplinary council. Do you want to give the background for this? Yeah, definitely. Um, so in the council itself, the bishop told me that he had received instruction to do so. And that made me feel better about the bishop because that, to me that meant he wasn't calling the council on a personal vendetta. And he wasn't calling it just because um, he wanted to seek out a gay couple. So I was He like, was told oh, to do it. I yeah, he was president. told to do it. You yeah. know? And so I was going to you know, call the stake president to see okay, why did you call this? Why are you going after me? Because by this time, we're we're still feeling like it's a witch hunt and we're still feeling really frustrated. So I'm like, okay, why did you feel like you needed to do this? Why did you Why did you tell my bishop, who I grew up with, who I think is a great guy, to come over and do this you know, terrible thing to me? Um, and so that's why I wanted to call him. And this is your old stake president in your former stake, correct? Yes, he's the current stake president in my, you know, my old boundaries where I grew up, my home, my home wards stake president. Got it. Okay, currently. so this is not the stake president of where you live now. No, even no. though he, he called them, he called that one. Later. He called both of them. I okay. did. But this one, ones. but this one is the stake president over your home ward for where where you grew up. Yes, where the council was held. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. So should we play it? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. It's a good one. Hello. Hey, uh, this is President. Yes, this is. Hey, uh, this is Brennan from the Wedgwood Ward. Um, yes, yeah, you, you how are you, Brennan? I'm good. How are you? Doing great, pal. Good, good. Uh, pal? Do you have a couple minutes? Yeah, far away. Um, so I... Oh, um, I recently had a membership council with, with Bishop um, in the board, uh, yeah. over my, my conduct related to same sex marriage. Um, okay. I was, I was really distraught and like confused going into the meeting. Um, because I, I grew up with Bishop Wilding. Um, he, he took me on camping trips and, and, and taught me lessons, um, that I, I probably wouldn't have learned after like my dad passed away, you know? Right. Right. Um, right. And I don't know. I, that was kind of really valuable to me. Um, so it, it, it didn't, it didn't make sense that after like all, all we'd been through, um, that he would call me to a, a membership council for same sex marriage when it wasn't required. Um, especially as a, a doctor too, because I mean, 
there there are certain I guess uh, uh, healthcare morals of you know treating patients equally that kind of it just didn't make sense in my head. Um, and so, I mean, during the council, he he had told me that uh, he had received instruction to hold the council, which made me even more confused. Um, and I don't know. Um, no, um, you know, I would love to meet up with you actually and chat through it. Um, it the the issue of uh, of, of same, you know, if 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 if, if it's same sex marriage, that's not um, that's not really a reason to hold. You know, what I mean, a membership council. Right. The, the membership council is really in the light of people if they are, um, you know, opposed to the church. You follow what I'm saying? Trying to harm the church in some way. You know what I mean? There's there's a whole list of other things. You follow what I'm saying? And so if and I would love to talk to you about it, you follow what I'm saying? Just to know where you're at. You know what I mean? If, if yeah. you're not like out there actively, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, going against the teachings of the church, you follow what I'm saying? And trying to hurt the church. Um, it's just such an interesting challenge at times, right? In walking that line. I mean, look, at the end of the day, I think. Okay, wait. I am just okay. super confused. I've got a lot to. Because <laughs> what I just heard him say is we're not, we didn't, we don't excommunicate people for being same sex marriage. He's going to say it like five times throughout this conversation. <laughs> yeah, he said for same sex marriage. Same sex marriage in and of itself is not a reason <laughs> to, to hold, hold a membership council. Not even excommunicate, just holding a council. To even hold a council whatsoever. I am just super confused. And, and going back up also because the bishop has always thrown the stake president and the stake presidency under the bus, saying, I, I, I wish I had a control or some some aspect of this that was that was within my control, but other people are telling me I've got to do this. And then listening to the stake president say, oh, what? what? Who? Oh, hi. Yeah. Oh, they did what? Like he just sounds completely like he just learned about this whole experience for the very first time. It mm -hmm. wasn't like this bishop knew for sure or, or even remembered that this conversation had even been had on your behalf with your with your bishop that's not your bishop. Here he sounds very surprised about this new revelation. You've been what? Hold on a second. No, we wouldn't. That council wouldn't be held based on just a same sex marriage. So this is where we start to unfold. This is where the emperor has been shown without clothes or behind the curtain, where we're starting to see how the sausage is made. That maybe perhaps this bishop went rogue and started this membership council on his own without clearly the stake president wasn't as closely involved or even remembers this conversation just based off my initial reaction to the, the phone call. Totally. Yeah, I, I agree that there is, I mean, you can tell that he he's surprised. A half, uh, but half of me is thinking that by this point, the bishop has already talked to him about what happened in the council because the bishop knows that he's in hot water. So he's at this point, I think he is trying to convince the stake president that w it wasn't just called for same-sex marriage conduct. There was something else that would, in my case, constitute as apostasy. And so that's... We're going to see he's going to start asking all these questions about apostasy and i was like why would he just start asking me that out of nowhere yeah the only thing mm -hmm. i could think of is if the bishop had told him or he was trying to you know uh, uh give him a, a, a different story about what happened so that he would not, you know not be in the know um so he might not he might you're right he might not even know that it was called on the basis of same-sex marriage and that's why he was surprised and that's why now he's saying um it wouldn't be called for that which to me so doesn't I, make a lot of sense because the the very the very first part of the paragraph of your letter that you received as part of the disciplinary council specifically said same sex marriage not only not only that as i was reading the handbook i found out something that makes this situation even worse whenever there's any any case of apostasy the state president is supposed to contact the gen a general authority, His area authority, area authority, and talk to him about the situation to figure out if it's real, real apostasy, and if a membership council is necessary. So, for a case where a state president would have had to talk directly to a state to a general authority about you know someone's case, it just blows my mind that he wouldn't remember the details or the specifics of the case if he was really being called for apostasy. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And 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 we're gonna see that he um when I when I ask him 
about this. Like, do you know what it was called for? He's like, well, you know, we've got a lot of cases. I've got a lot of cases that go across my desk. I wish you weren't the only person, you know, having a membership council as if to kind of say that like, oh, I just, I, I don't know right now. I couldn't tell you over the phone when really he should know. Mm-hmm. And um, we'll, we'll hear later. Um, the bishop told me later in a, in a, in a future phone call, um, uh, he, um, Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, but he he was he was telling me that uh, uh, da, 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 um, I can't remember where I was going with that. I'm sorry. I had a, I had a great note because in that call he told me something hmm. about um, uh, not. Uh, I, I yeah. I bet sorry. if we play it, it'll come. Yeah, I will. Right? I will. I will. Yes, I will. Okay, but so far what he Apologies. said is what he said is we don't excommunicate you for what you were just excommunicated for. We right. don't hold councils yeah, yeah, right. for that. Yeah. We don't hold councils for what we just excommunicated you for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So it's weird, but let's, let's, let's hear it out. You know me fairly well. Um, you know, we want, we want to do our very best to make sure that we are helpful and loving and kind. You know what I mean? The only thing that we have to take a stand on is when it comes to the issue, you thought I'm saying, if somebody is out there antagonistic towards the church. Right. Right. And, and, that's and, what, and I don't know where that's at. And, and maybe you're like, oh, President, that's not the case. And maybe that's not. I don't know. But when we had our discussions, not specifically as it related, you thought I'm saying, to your circumstance. Right. But what we have sometimes are people that are involved in, um, you know, same uh, sex marriages. But what they're out there doing, you thought I'm saying, is out there tearing the church down. You know what I mean? And that's when we're like, no, you can't do that. You know what I mean? You can't say, oh, I'm going to be a member, you thought I'm saying, and then shred the church every time, you know what I mean, we turn around. Yeah. Like, that's not okay. That's that's what was, that was, that's what was hard for me to wrap my mind around because the letter that I received from Bishop you know, said that I, that I was called to the council for my conduct related to same-sex marriage. Not not for anything I've done against the church because I've I've been inactive for four years, and so it it, it the council it felt like um, because I I knew I knew it couldn't have come from Bishop Wilde it it then it made me think that it like it was you who was instructing this council to occur for something that wasn't required you know um, no no not at all the only mission. The only questions that we've had with bishops, you know, I mean, in bishops' councils where we meet with all of the bishops is if somebody, you thought I'm saying, is antagonistic or hostile towards the church. You know what I mean? That's when we have to step in, right? And say, no, that's not okay. So I would love to meet up with you. I No, no, that's not the case at all as, as far as it relates to a specific matter. I would love to meet up with you. In fact, to be honest with you, keep in mind when a bishop holds something like that, it's merely a recommendation to us. You thought I'm saying, so it's not a final action by this bishop. Right. The bishop is basically sending it to us. So I would have easily been reaching out to you. I'm sure I haven't seen it yet. You thought I'm saying, but I would have been reaching out to you anyway to meet up with you. But I don't feel like there's anything about my behavior that's going against the church. So why would the council have been called in the first place, if not for my conduct related to same sex marriage? That was in the letter. That will, you know. That's what I was going to say, and that would probably be something I would just need to ask Bishop. I'm saying his opinion. Um, we, you know, when we go through these, you have to appreciate it's not a matter of me knowing every detail. You thought I'm saying of everything, unless it's at a stake level, right? So I don't mind at all reaching out to Bishop, having the conversation, reaching back out to you, and then setting up a time to meet. I don't mind doing that at all. So, um, are are you saying that Bishop Wilding? did call the council himself for me being married to um, another man? Was it- I, I, I need to ask him. So the, the, the comment that you made a minute ago is you're saying that you have never been hostile ever towards the church. You've never been adverse to the church or the doctrines of the church. That I've noticed. I've, I've never... Um, it, 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 it was, have, you, yeah. have, you po- have you posted any antagonistic material towards the church online or anything? Not that I can think of. Oh, okay. Well, then that's uh, that'd be an easy conversation for me to have with Bishop Wilding. You thought I'm saying, right? Because the reason um, the reason of the council is not the fact that you are married. That's not the that's not the purpose of the council. The purpose of the council is if you happen to be married, you thought I'm saying, and you're still trying your very best. You know what I mean? 
to attend your meetings, you know what I mean? And doing those things, you of course can't get a temple recommend, right? Which you know, right? but at the same token, it's not a function of us going in and trying to throw people out of the church. It's not that at all. Um, yeah. I, I have to point out the discrepancy of president Cotter because the letter really quick, like, okay, Brett, go ahead. Uh, what's, what's weird or frustrating to you about that? Um, I'll let you go first. I'll let you go first. Well, I mean, it, he, he, like, first of all, I'm just outraged. Really? He's going to let the bishop go through an entire disciplinary council. And then, and then it's just like, and if he makes a mistake, I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and fix it. Like, that's so weird. If, 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 if they're going to be that casual about it, if there's going to, they're going to be so loosey goosey about it. It's basically your damnations on the line. It's your time. It's all this emotional and psychological trauma. They're going to put you through all that. And then like, oh, well, the state president, if he changes his mind, then never mind. It, it won't have counted. I just can't get like, over. That's outrageous. Just like, can't... just let the state president do the disciplinary council. Otherwise, I'm... don't put people through that. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not convinced that the stake president was even involved or knew what was going on. I just can't get to that point where I'm listening to this, uh, these multiple conversations and saying to myself, ah, oh, yes, the bishop and the stake president were well coordinated and, and knew the needs of this member so well that we had to hold this membership council. I'm not, I'm not at that point. And that's typically what we see in these disciplinary councils. It's where the bishop consults with the stake president the stake president with the bishop, and they get to the point where they are meeting in these uh, under these circumstances in an effort to meet the needs of the member. And where this stake president is basically coming off as either completely naive and not understanding what was going on, or he's dodging so well that he's seen like this is a really great show. This is really great acting. And I just don't I'm not there. I'm not, I don't believe that this stake president is faking or acting or pretending like he doesn't know. I really genuinely believe, and maybe the audience can react in the comments uh, contrarily, but I don't believe the stake president's been well informed or even knows the basis behind this membership council. I don't think the stake president even knows what's going on in his own stake in terms of his his bishops and, and leadership. Yeah, that, that that's what I that's what I wanted to say is that um, whatever reason he has currently is not the reason that we were called for. Amen. I'm I'm th- I'm really thinking that the bishop after the disciplinary council called him and told him that this was the reason for it. And this is what I was bringing him to the council for. It wasn't for same-sex marriage. It was him being same-sex married and then speaking bad about the church. That's I think that's the reason that the, at this point, uh, that was the reason that the state president was told and what he thought the council was actually called for. So it has to be that there was no approval in the first place because otherwise he would have known Exactly. That it was only same-sex marriage conduct. And we saw that during the council, apostasy and nothing about it was ever brought up during the council. So, it, yeah, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. No, I, th- I think you're absolutely right. And, and that is part of the problem that we see in, in Mormonism is in, in these types of councils that we are, as John mentioned multiple times in this, this episode, we are hurting the lives of, of people who can make contributions, maybe not immediately or currently making contributions to their local ward stakes or branches, but they could make comp- contributions. They could be those voices. They could be those examples in these pews across Zion, but they're being kicked out. Yeah, They're being excommunicated out of it. And that's, that is to the fault of the church and that is to the detriment of the church. The church deserves to see a variety of color. The church all and and those people, the variety, the chorus, the choir, uh, deserves to be a part of organizations that are no longer harming them and hurting them. That should be that's the epitome of gospel and and being able to attend organizations or churches like this where they can feel uplifted and supported and their needs are met. And that's not happening. Clearly. But, yeah. but I'm also super confused because the bishop said he was told to do this. And that's he would correct. have been told by the stake president. That's where I'm so hung up. I just so the bishop it. is saying the stake president told me to do it, but the stake president is saying, oh, no, the bishop is probably wrong here. And by the way, I can overwrite it. But the stake president's acting like he didn't even know what was going on. It so, gets worse. So which is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It and, I mean, I'm uh, just uh, giving my real-time straight, reaction. But yeah, yeah. just can't get it. Um, and I think for the remainder of the call, it's just going to be, I mean, con- continued questions about um, – if I have done social media posts, um, which I, I tell him I have not. 
What's the purpose of the council if then he's going to be in, in, doing the inquisition over the phone? Well, it yeah. seems like he's trying to find stuff to justify what had happened. You know, well, like, this is exactly what you talked about earlier. It's like Keystone Cops. That's a boomer reference. It's it, it's it's, uh, it's just it's just um, incompetence. It's gross organizational incompetence. And prior to this, uh, this uh, council being held, as Gerardo pointed out. Um, quoting the handbook of instructions, it requires verifiable evidence. It requires at least two witnesses. And if in this case, if it were indeed a situation of apostasy, show me the money, show me where there was apostasy or show me where there was speaking ill against the church on social media. Show, show me this if that's indeed what it was. Um, but perhaps the fact that you walked in Brennan with your husband in that room, that was enough of the evidence that they needed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, following this phone call um, and seeing this contradiction, contradiction, it kind of got the ball rolling of like what other things they're, they're not telling the truth about. And so that's, that's when we started to get into, okay, which Bishop did they actually contact? Which stake president in, you know, uh, in my boundaries did they actually contact? Um, because, we knew that if they're not if they're not telling the truth and they're contradicting each other here, who's to say that they're actually following handbook policy with contacting other bishops? And so from here, um, I I took it because I was I was determined by this point. I, I took it upon myself to to figure out okay who's my YSA bishop, who is my family ward bishop, who is the stake presidents, and I contacted all of them and I said hi, this is this is Brennan Porter. I, um, I was recently called to a membership council on the basis of my same-sex marriage conduct, and I and I asked, you know, were you made aware of this because I'm in your boundaries? And every single one of them said that they were not. They were not made aware, and they had they had no idea that it was going on. Not heard anything about it or about any other bishop or stakes president has contacted them. I just want to reiterate that you contacted every one of your bishops from that point forward to where you're at today and not one of them was aware of this council every, or every one of the bishops and none not even, even a like, conversation with a bishop no not at all not even like oh maybe let us check they they were like no there's no other bishop contact us about any membership council and we even go to the um LDS org and look at the meeting houses of the, yeah, the fake house finder of the <laughs> fake address that brendan gave and then the, our actual address that the bishop deliver you know all those wards possible ysa ward family ward married first married yeah. first word we contact every single one of those bishop and the stake president and none of them has any idea i would assume mm -hmm. most of them were like who who are you have we ever met yeah 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 so um that was we and we have I screenshotted that I was like oh my gosh none of them know so the the bishop must have never contacted him at all so at this point there was no coordination with the stake president and then there was no coordination with any of the other um, bishops or stake presidents mm -hmm. that you know where of where we were living so yeah okay so I think I think are, are we all feeling that we got enough from recording three that we should move on to the next recording or yeah. is there more in recording three that's that's important no it was it was pretty much that yeah so basically stake president saying wait a minute uh I, I didn't know this is happening you're not supposed to be there's not supposed to be a disciplinary council for same-sex marriage mm -hmm. I never are you sure are you sure you didn't like speak out and criticize the church publicly mm -hmm. and, they, and, he and don't worry and don't worry and don't worry because i can undo this if, if a mistake's been made and, is uh, that the summary yep and then also that he never gave instruction he never gave instruction for the the, the membership council to occur and okay. so that was that was a, the biggest contradiction at the time for me i was like okay bishop said there was instruction stake president said there's there wasn't any at all so anyway. okay and and then at the end he said, "Well, if you want to meet up, let's let's meet all together." Yeah, so. yeah. He was like, you know, I'd really I'd really appreciate the opportunity to get together and you know talk this out, um, which I think, I mean, looking back, is uh, probably just damage control. So, he also so, said that um, well, he tried to rationalize at one point that um, well, what did the bishop mean with when he with said that with instruction yeah. was that like a like a training where like he probably had misunderstood. 
those kind of stuff. Okay. Right. But basically, it's just like, no, this shouldn't have happened as far as the president goes. Mm -hmm. So the state president basically admits it shouldn't have happened. Uh, yeah. That, that, Not that time. That according to what they were saying of not apostatizing or speaking ill against the church, this shouldn't have happened. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to play that clip just because it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So should we go to the next recording? Tell us, let's set that up. What, what happens in the next recording? Yeah. Let's, let's pull up the slide for it. So, we'll, um, you call the bishop right after. Well, I I didn't call the, the bishop well, right he, after. I he, I, he I, called I, the bishops because when when he so, had the stake president call, call I told I called the stake president. Then I contacted every other bishop. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And then that's when we were realizing right. something was going on. And then after that, um, I wanted to talk to the bishop again because now that I realized that, you know. It, it didn't make sense that he would say these things and then the stake president would say otherwise. So I wanted to check back in with him and be like, okay, I really, I, I really don't want to think it's you. I, I don't want it to be you. And at the, and, and truly at the time, I really did not want it to be him that, he, that he was the one who was, you know, organizing this whole thing. And so I wanted to call him and I wanted to see what he had to say. Okay, so this is you calling the original bishop now. Yes. To kind of clarify. Yes. Yes. After having talked same, to the same person. bishop who we did the disciplinary council with. Okay. Let's uh let's hear how that goes. Um I so um you know, following the disciplinary council, um I I know um you 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 told me during the council that you kind of re received some instruction that that kind of um, it it made me feel I guess better about about the situation that um, that you know you weren't really going out of the out of your way with the intention of like going on a witch hunt for me. Um, uh, oh, absolutely not on that one. Yeah, I, I know that you felt like that, but yeah, um, that uh, I yeah I'm. That, that was that was good to, to hear when when you when you told me that um i was able to to talk to um recently president because um it it my my next thought was that he was the one who had given instruction for this council to happen when it wasn't required and i i, I talked to him and and he said that um he had it uh which um you know which, which i guess confused me um when but when you had said that you had received some kind of instruction but um i i just assumed that it'd come from president um i guess yeah, I, so yeah. Brennan, on all those things i i'm not really one to point the fingers at anybody else um in so um i had the sense you were asking that in the in the membership council and that's that's not one that i really do you know i keep our conversations with um that about this all private um and i kind of do the same thing with the other um one thing that um we didn't talk about during that um i have since i've been a bishop you know i haven't had a lot of these um yours is the first one that has been for a same um same sex attraction you know, all the others have been heterosexual type issues. And so I did have the sense that, are you going after me because, um, because I'm gay? And I, I want you to be clear that, you know, that's not the issue. I think that, um, once again, it seemed like you had really hurt feelings about that process. And one of the reasons I said, Hey, yeah, bring Doug along is I didn't want you to feel alone. You know, I don't want you to I certainly don't want you to feel attacked with it. I think that you, you probably still do. Um, but like I was saying there, there's a lot of people that I consider really good friends that in order to be a member of the church, they would have to change, right? right. Um, so if they like tea, if they drink coffee, if they drink alcohol, if they smoke, um, and I have friends that do all of those things, um, and all of those things would have to change. In, and so, yeah, that's that's one. Um, you... Uh, you know, I don't want you to feel like, hey, I'm being singled out. That's not the case. It's just when I guess I'd ask you a couple of questions. Are you doing other things that would, I mean, other 
other than that, from our conversation we had last time, do you still keep like the word of wisdom? Um, I, I would, I would say so. Um, yeah. Okay. You don't drink coffee or tea? <laughs> no. Um, I, uh, if, if, if I, if I can, Bishop, my, my, this isn't a demo my recommend. whole reason with going around and in this case, calling a state president is I just, I, I mean, that's so, <laughs> this is like. Now he's just trying to gather new evidence, information, evidence, new ammo against you. He already had the disciplinary council. Can I get, please answer the question for 200 Alex. That's what we're trying to ask. This and he's saying, we're not bishop. targeting you out. We're not singling you out, but, but are you, are you living the word of wisdom? That's basically saying, we know why we excommunicated you. It's bad optics. <laughs> it doesn't look good to excommunicate people for same sex marriage. Now you caught us. Stake president's concerned. Stake now president's me... unaware. First off, stake president is unaware based on the point of your conversation. Exactly. Bishop. Hey, I called the stake president. The stake president is clueless. Except the stake underwear. president told him to do it. According to the bishop. According to the bishop. <laughs> According to the bishop. But then, the, but then the stake president you hears know, it for the first time. Yeah. And then the bishop then says, "Well, <laughs> let's see. The, um, we already hold the count. Held the council. We already <laughs> judged you." It's a word of wisdom issue, isn't it? Do you live the word yeah. of wisdom? <laughs> you oh drink gosh. tea. Jeez. Which they don't excommunicate people they for. So why know. is it even relevant? When yeah. 30 seconds prior to that, he's like, well, yeah, you were in a same sex relationship. That is the reason why we held this council. Yeah. And again, the handbook goes back to saying we don't excommunicate people for same gender relationships. Yeah. Um, something else I, I really want to clear up right now, because I know I feel like people watching are um, you know, who, who want to scrutinize this situation are going to say, well, the bishop said he had received instruction, which could have meant he just, you know, had received instruction in like a bishop's council, you know, where they, they, uh, train kind of like a training, of, like a training, you know, but when I'm talking to him in this phone call, I said, okay, well, it doesn't make sense right. that you said you'd received instruction, but the stake president didn't. He's like, and then he says, I'm not, I'm not someone to throw anybody under the bus. Yeah. So anybody, he, he, he could have just easily said, well, this was a training thing. He's saying anybody, which means a person. So there is a, there is people involved in the actual instruction. It's and if not, you, and if you go back to the first conversation, when you asked, when he admits that he had received instruction to do this or had a conversation with the stake president about it, mm -hmm. but he kind of kept prolonging it because he was, had internal had conflicts. Internal conflicts about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Isn't this interesting? Like, I, honestly, just the listeners following along, I, I'm watching our live feed, live chat on Latter Gay Stories and and the Mormon Stories one as well. This is this is mind boggling. This is this is how the Mormon Church functions. These are the reasons why there are people who are standing in in places of advocacy to stand up. And it isn't a fight against the church. It isn't trying to begrudge or bemoan or hurt the church. This is a problem that we're seeing over and over and over again. Uh, is it a rogue bishop? Is it inaccurate information? I if it is a rogue bishop, we can deal with bishops by maybe exposure, showing some light in some of these dark corners and closets. But I, I tend to think this is more of an issue between uh, junior or uh, grassroots leadership and upper management. The, the water isn't making it to the end of the row here. If if indeed this is how the church is supposed to function, then there better be some better better education and clarity as to the role of a bishop, the role of a stake president, and the role of general authorities in terms of same-sex marriages, attractions. Because your bishop even brings it up and says, I'm punishing you because of your same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. That tells me that the bishop is not educated enough in this topic mm -hmm. where he's saying you're being punished for your same-sex attraction. He doesn't even bring up the fact that you're being punished for your marriage, right. for your same gender marriage. So to me, this is a bishop that is reacting off of terms that he's not even familiar with <laughs> and making life-changing decisions on behalf of members that are not even part of his ward. Eternal decisions Eternal, in his, in his in, own In terms of Mormonism, belief. sure, if you're uh, fully subscribed. And this is why it seems so fickle the entire time. Amen. Well, I'm worried that it's the stake president well, that it's area authorities, this is the pattern. The pattern is general authorities or area authorities telling stake presidents to fix a problem. The stake president tells the local leader to fix it, but then 
but then they want to hang out the local leader to dry as being responsible. Yes. Mm. And so the stake president is actually not being honest or forthcoming about the fact that he directed this to begin with, and he's trying to push the blame down on the bishop. I'm not saying that's what's happening. That, that's definitely what but I'm saying, thought of I, as I'm, well. I'm worried that that's what's happening because that is the historical pattern, which means potentially the stake president's completely lying. Potentially. Yeah. I'm not saying he is. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, how else do we explain that the right. bishop starts by saying, I didn't want to do this. The stake president told me to do it. Mm -hmm. And then later the stake president's like, what? I didn't tell him to do anything. And then the we don't even do those kind of stuff. We, yeah. yeah. No, we don't, we don't excommunicate for those, those things. Yeah. Yeah. That's my point is that this really, this needs to, the water needs to make it to the end of the row. And by the end of the row, I really mean it's the bishop. Um, the water needs to go from 50 North Temple and make it all the way down to the bishop and everybody needs to be on the same page. And in that vein, though, I, I'm, I, I hate to, because Mormonism is one of those that you, we all fought against the law of Moses, this letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. And, and you hate to get to a point where you say like the letter of lo the law is this. And, and even though the spirit of the law should justify this, but when you, I don't know, this is a, this is a fine line. This is really tough territory, but if the church is going to enact policies like this, everybody needs to be on the same page and how that policy is administered. Yeah. That's my yeah. point. What makes me doubt more about the bishop telling the truth rather than the stake president is the fact that the bishop has said several times that he contacted his the bishops uh, or the stake presidency of his uh, current ward or stake president uh, or 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 stake when in, when we know that probably didn't happen we're, we're confident that didn't happen right because these two contacted every bishop and every stake president in the history of their existence from high school forward to their married life and nobody nobody could remember a conversation with this particular bishop who was holding this membership council that is problematic very problematic yeah okay so you redirect after he insults you by bringing up new evidence and asking you about the word of wisdom, you redirect. Yeah, and I'd say, tea. here's the distinction. Yeah. Bishop. So let's hear what's next. I don't want it to be you, is I guess my, my, my big thing is it, it's, it just, it just still doesn't make sense if it wasn't required for the council to be had. And, and when, when you told me that you'd received instruction, that made more sense in my mind because it, it, it told me that you weren't the one doing the council. You weren't the one calling it for my same sex marriage. It was, it was the stake president, but the stake president said it wasn't him. And, and I just, I just don't want it to be you because I, I, that's, I think that's where it hurts. Um, sure. And so, um, yeah, um, I, 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 th that's what I wanted to call and ask about, um, because if the, if the stake president said that it wasn't him, but you said you'd received instruction, it, it, I, I don't know. Yeah, no, and I understand that. Um, one thing that I guess the question that I still have for you, Brennan, is, um, I'm trying to think if there are any examples in my own life, but you know, if I was a part of a group that later I disagreed with, um, you know, I, I guess I'm not, I, I understand that this is a hurtful thing to you. Um, I wish that it weren't. I actually was hoping that it would be softer with having Doug there and everything. Um, but if I was part of a group and I no longer agree with them, I actually don't want to be in that group. Um, are you still wanting to be um, a member of the church? Are we seriously that, that going back said. here again? Here comes uh, the Gaslight Express. Choo choo. Didn't we already Sorry, have? Didn't we already have this conversation? Yeah, we did. We did. And he keeps saying he's not recommending. Well, yeah. Later that mm -hmm. we resign. I never recommended it to you. Clearly, this is your fault again. Right. Right. I would want to. Well, if, he's if saying I, like, why I, do you care if I killed you if you wanted to be killed anyway? Yeah, mm -hmm. if I were if I were in a group that I didn't agree with, I would have already left. Mm -hmm. Bel belittling, left. belittling. That's what it is. Does anybody else feel like the bishop is now reeling? Like this is, like he, now for the very first moment. Like to me, this is evident that oh he gets it. Like uh oh, um, 
and his very best recourse is no, 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 no. You want to leave, right? So we're just gonna we're gonna the the ends I mean, are going to justify the means in this very sense. It's, it's so super disgusting. outrageous because how many times did he ask you that in the disciplinary council? If you wanted to be a member or not, like that case was closed. Yeah. And now he's acting like he doesn't even remember that that was discussed like five different ways in the original disciplinary council. He's just he's really. Mm -hmm. He's and, absolutely. And, and really. I did tell him. I did tell him. I said I still have intentions to remove my records from the church. And he asks me now, so do you want to stay in the church? I already told you I have the intentions to remove my records. Eventually. But, and, and yeah, I think you yeah. were very, very clear in the membership council where you uh, said, if it means I sit through this council and, and realize my fate, essentially holding the hand of my husband, that is, that is the direction I want to go. Mm -hmm. I will, I will leave the church under those terms, knowing that I'm leaving the church, holding the hand of someone that I love. And I want that as the example. I want that as you saying, this is the reason why we had to kick you out of the church. It's because of the person's hand that you hold. That is the reason why we're kicking you out of the church. You were really clear. You didn't say, I want to just resign my membership and walk away. You said, I want you, I want this to be on your shoulders, on your table, where you kick me out of the church based on falling in love and living to the fullest measure of my creation. I want that. I don't want just to walk away. Yep. And he didn't get it. Yeah. Or chooses not to I'm understand glad, I'm glad someone got it. <laughs> Thank you. I should be a bishop. <laughs> Absolutely, you should. People are saying that I should train bishop, bishops. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right? Maybe, maybe this will become bishop training. This, this podcast. <laughs> Hopefully. Required viewing of all bishops. Hopefully. Mormon Stories podcast. All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's keep it going. Let's see what's next. I hope I didn't lose the place. Um, oh, I, dang it. Okay. Um, you wanted to clarify on my beliefs in the church. My, Did my I skip view, forward? Um, I wish that it weren't. That's I actually good. was That's hoping good. that it would be softer with having Doug there. Yeah, and everything. Right on time. To the right. Um, to the right. No, you're good. But you're good. if I was part of a group and I no longer agree with them, I actually don't want to be in that group. Um, are you still wanting to be um, a member of the church? <laughs> that that was something I guess that that was hard for me during their council was uh, was to clarify on was was when um, you wanted to clarify on my beliefs in the church. My my main frustration was when I was called for my same sex marriage conduct, not for my beliefs in the church. I wasn't I wasn't called because I no longer believed in the church. And if I if I was called for that, then there would have been some kind of um, uh, attempt to uh, uh, to maybe um, uh, ask about those beliefs or um, to uh, to remediate those or figure out how you know um, we can talk through those kind of things. But I wasn't called for that. I was called for for same sex marriage, um, and 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 that's and that's what was uh, troubling and, and and hard for me. Um, and and I, I it it hurts that we shy away from that issue because it's not about my beliefs in the church. There are so many beliefs I have in the church that I still hold on to. I still believe in a higher power. I, I still have a lot of my moral belief systems that are tied to the church because I know they're good morals, but I wasn't called to the council for that. I was called because I was married to Doug. And so it, Sure, and, and Brenda, I'm, I'm not really shying away from that. What I'm saying is, in the council, you when you talked this, you actually read that letter. I thought it was a well written letter. Um, in it, you said, you know, I don't really believe the church. I don't believe the tenets of the church. I don't believe it's inspired. And systematically, you went through one leader after another that had said things that you said, I disagree with all of these, and I'm okay with that. Um, you know, like I said, I have many friends and. Okay, wait. Really? Is that what happened? <laughs> really? Did you say in your letter? here's a bunch of things I don't believe, or did you simply read really awful quotes? That's, that's all I did. Did you, and the, I don't want to say it really awful. Did you read the historical record? Yeah. Did you read exactly yeah. what the church members have said? But, yes. but is that, is that, is that, am I hearing that right? Yeah. Am I mm -hmm. remembering it right? Yes. Exactly. You, you did not ever make a personal statement of belief about any of those Boyd K. Packer, Spencer W. Kimball, Dallin H. Oaks, Russell M. Nelson quotes. You simply read them and showed that they contradicted each other 
or that they were problematic or fraud. Uh, he was oh. when he was quoting mostly is him asking question. Which one am I supposed to follow? Is it Cook mm -hmm. or is it? Or is it Oaks? Is it this one or yeah. is it that one? And he did say at the beginning that he didn't think that uh, the church, the church's, the church's teachings, teachings on LGBTQ issues are divinely inspired. But that's it was that's very what specific I said. on LGBTQ. How many issues. how many members agree exactly. with that? Exactly. I hear there right. are apostles who don't exactly. agree with the church's current policy. He's trying to paint my written statement like I just read all these things and I said I disagree with them, well, and that's it. The words he used was, you are coming after all the leaders of the church. Well, None of that was what you read today or mm -hmm. that day was coming after any of the apostles. Word of wisdom didn't work. Coffee and tea didn't work. The fact that you didn't <laughs> resign your membership on your own didn't work. So now the next most logical, we have to go to, you said bad things about the church. Apostasizing. Which, you, which he invented because all you did was read the actual words of actual words exactly. of general authorities. Yeah, that's outrageous. Yeah. Okay, and and we're going to talk about it later a little bit more. But the the definition of apostasy is very very well defined in the handbook. It is um, teaching false doctrine. It is clear after repetitive be, teaching and, false doctrine after being corrected by a church leader, and and continue to do it. And it's clear and repetitive public defaming yeah. of the church. Right. It's not a private meeting on a bishop telling him like what you think about some yeah. of the teachings of the especially church. when they yeah. asked for it. Yeah. I don't know. In all you fairness, can provide relevant information. You posted on social media a picture of you two holding hands in at your wedding. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, it's funny because he actually it. does say that later. He's like, Oh, you posted about your same sex marriage and it was very Yeah. Yeah. Salacious. That's gonna come up in the next recording. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. This is just ridiculous. We're clearly scraping the bottom <laughs> of the barrel. All right. It comes to excuses. The workers that don't share my beliefs, and that's 100% their prerogative. Um, but in, in during the council, you said, I don't believe really the church is inspired. I don't that's believe the current right. prophet's inspired. I don't believe the teachings of the church are inspired. Um, right. And, if, and that, so, if that wasn't the problem, if because if, I agree with you that that Having those differing belief systems is okay, and every uh, person has the right to having uh, different beliefs and different things. Um, it, I, it, it, we are called the Council for Same-Sex Marriage, and and that's what I what I don't really want to shy away from because I agree with you on those things, and I mean you you, you had told me that you had an internal conflict related to same-sex marriage and it's it still does not register in my mind why the council was held then if it wasn't required unless you had received instruction from somebody else but it sounds like you haven't um so brennan i would not say that listen i'm not making things up i'm also not going to hang anybody out else out to dry this is this is something that um i'm happy to own it um what I'm telling you is, uh, yeah, I would much rather just leave it alone. Um, the, uh, the thing that I guess I don't fully understand, um, if you wanted to remain a member of the church, you kind of already laid it out. So we didn't really have a long discussion about this. If someone who is gay wants to remain a member of the church in good standing, then it does mean a life of celibacy. I think that that's a brutal, um, that would be brutally difficult. Having said that, you know, until um until i was 23 and got married i led a life of celibacy and until you know until you met doug it sounds like you did too so i mean i, I get that whole thing and um in in the council he said that's not really something i think is reasonable you even talked with, with us about you know he he got remarried after his wife died so if he couldn't lead a life of celibacy how can how can i or anyone else who's gay be expected to right. um that's one where, again, I wish I understood um, more about that whole thing, but right. but that is the way it's set right now. If someone um, does have, um, if someone is gay, if someone has um, those types of, you know, those feelings, then in, in the process of this, again, you asked about the timing of a letter. Um, I'll call President, I'll ask him about that. With regard to the... Um, the other question, you know, if you wanted to return 
to full activity in the church. I just, I, I'm going to make one well, quick comment. You, one quick comment. We've been talking about fundamentalist Mormonism and particularly Warren Jeffs in the FLDS church. And a lot of times Mormons want to say there's no relationship between Warren Jeffs and the FLDS church and Joseph Smith or the modern modern day prophets in the LDS church. One of the things that marks Warren Jeffs is the fact that he gets to decide who gets married to who and who has sex and who doesn't. And, you know, what we, what we talked about just recently in an interview was that once Warren Jeffs was incarcerated, he literally made the rule, no touching, no marriages, and no having sex and no babies until I can do that again. I don't, I'm not able to have sex. So now no one can as well. I know that some people are going to find this to be a stretch, but you know, these heterosexual married men who get to have sex with their spouses whenever they decide to have sex, mm. it's very similar. They're basically saying who gets to have sex and who doesn't. And they're saying, yeah, okay. Um, if you don't want to shoot yourself and we don't want to shoot you, then we're going to administer this, this chronic poison of celibacy mm. that I would never want to live with, that I don't have to live with that. I get to have sex with my spouse whenever we agree, but you just get to drink the poison for the rest of your life until you die uh, from the poison, basically. Mm -hmm. That's like extending the metaphor. But it reminds me of Warren Jeffs because this guy has no idea what he's asking you to do. He says he lived as a celibate until he was 23 or whatever. <laughs> we, we don't know what he was doing to compensate for that beforehand. What's the likelihood that he wasn't masturbating before he was 23? Zero, <laughs> you know, five per 1% likelihood. <laughs> so he was doing that. And then, you know, and so, but, but it, it's again, this patriarchy idea that, that is very Warren Jeffs. We get to decide who has sex and who doesn't. And not only the decision as to who can perform or be involved in those type of experiences. But the unfortunate part too is the Latter-day Saint culture, the members of the church aren't given an opportunity to better understand this topic because it's also those straight heterosexual men who are speaking on behalf of the gay community. They are telling other straight people what it's like to be gay. They are, they are the ones that are standing up in front of these uh, mm -hmm. behind pulpits or in, in these chapels saying, here's what it's like to be gay. Here's why we have to have celibacy. Here's why you can't get into a relationship. They don't have any understanding what it's like to be on the other side of the aisle. They are speaking from positions of, of privilege. privilege. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. They just don't know what it's like to be gay. However, the Mormon culture, traditional Mormonism, has provided the only avenue for other Latter-day Saints to better understand this topic through the lens of straight people telling other straight people what it's like to be gay. And the people who are at the, the, the biggest disadvantage here are the queer Latter-day Saints, the LGBTQ Latter-day Saints who still occupy pews, who are trying to navigate this. They're literally holding on to the church and life in many uh, situations by their fingertips. And they are the ones who are at a disadvantage because leaders like this claim to speak for and on, uh, on, on their behalf. And it is not right. We need to start hearing the stories and experiences of the LGBTQ people and how a church led by predominantly heterosexual straight men are harming the lived experiences of the LGBTQ community. And this is a great example of that happening. They're not only victims, but they're painted as perpetrators. A great that, point. That, that they that they are the enemy. And if, you know, if other church members actually go and talk to a gay member of the church and figure out that they're not a terrible person and they're not this, you know, this thing that the church makes them out to be, then the whole narrative will fall apart. The narrative falls up. Yeah. Exactly right. And and when you've invested 40 or 50 years into this topic, I, I say, i.e. Elder Oaks, who has spent most of his life advocating against homosexuality, when you are faced with 50 years of your legacy drained away because there are queer people who are willing to stand up on their own two feet and show the, the general membership of the church that they are none of the things the church promised that they are, that they actually have fulfilling, happy, spiritual spirit experiences in their life. What does that say? What does that do to the ego, to the legacy of someone like President Oaks, who is next in line to become prophet of the church? He is now going to double and triple down on his rhetoric to make sure the membership and he's going to try to 
uh, corral the members to make sure they're on his side so that everybody, and it's back to what John just talked about in the Warren Jeff situation, so that you just don't look at it, you don't see it, you don't acknowledge it, because we cannot for a moment give into this idea that our rhetoric was 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 wrong or incomplete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's too much of an investment. Well yeah, said. Well there, said. there needs to be some type of sensitivity training, really, where like every bishop goes a year without sex, just to kind of understand what he's asking a, a gay Mormon man to do. Mind. I'm not going to become a bishop anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I take that back. Because they have no idea what they're asking. Yeah. yeah Especially 100%. once the genie's out of the bottle. It, I mean, all of us who have been married or have had sex know that once you've had it, you you know, you don't just, oh yeah, okay, I won't do it anymore. Like you you want it, you need it. It's a normal part of healthy human development. So to just ask someone to shut that off for a year, even a month or, or six lifetime, months yeah. or a lifetime. They, they should have to do it for a year before they even entertain that discussion. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. Great, great recommendations to <laughs> send to the higher ups. It would mean celibacy, um, which is a, I understand that, um, that would be a very difficult doctrine. If my wife dies, I am, you know, unless I remarry, I would be leading a life of celibacy. Um, in in our particular relationship i wouldn't have any interest in necessarily getting married again at least mm -hmm. not unless or until something changed um so um i i guess i'm emp empathic on that having wow. said that um <laughs> you totally you know, understand those, those are some of the terms that normally we would have discussed and uh, i mean in my experience mormon men get married like within six months of their spouse dying on average like that I, I'm not saying that's every Mormon man, but the idea that he's going to go two, three, four, five, ten years, I almost have never seen that happen. I don't know what your your experiences are, but mm -hmm. I'm always shocked at like the body's barely still warm, and the Mormon man is has found his new fiance and is going to be married within the year. Well, yeah, Brandon brought that up in, in the initial. It was 14 months for President Nelson after uh, his his wife passed away that he married Wendy. So it didn't as, take as very long. As the prophet of the church and 80 plus years old. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Bizarre. It is bizarre. And oh my gosh, yeah. Mormons. All right, let's keep going. Um, you had already laid it out saying, hey, that's just not tenable. And I get it. I understand that. I, I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, it, it, one, of, one of the things that I really appreciated about the council was, was, was you, you know, pay, uh, giving me your undivided attention and, and really listening to what I had to say. Um, that, that, that really meant a lot to me. So, um, yeah, it, uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, can I ask you one more question? Of course, you can ask me a dozen more questions. Uh, um, uh, you, you had told me that in order for the council to be held, you, we have to contact the bishop of where I live, um, if it's outside of ward boundaries, that is. Um, uh, who who was that, that bishop that you contacted, if you don't mind my asking? I would have to go back and look at the record. So that was, oh, probably... A year and a half ago, we were contacting them to give them the church records. So when we go through and we clean up church records, oh, I guess it was probably, it would have been in the new work form. So in June of last year, um, and so, we were going to send your records over there in the course of that conversation. Um, and after that, so I, again, I'd have to go back. I'd have to look. I, I don't remember their name. Um, uh, are, are you saying the council was being uh was in the works all the way back in june of last year there was a discussion about it yeah um do you remember if it was like a, a ysa ward because i guess i wouldn't be in a married ward so would the bishop have been ysa then so honestly brennan i really don't remember okay um i can dig on it i um yeah, in, in asking these questions i still get the sense that you want to find out who is behind all this and can i go after them right mm -hmm. um yeah. that's i think that that kind of um 
misses the point a little bit. I mean, if you're angry, you can certainly be angry with me. Um, I can tell you that I don't, um, you know, I, I certainly don't dislike, harbor any ill will towards you. Um, and I completely understand those of the LGBTQ community being irritated with the church and this stance on, you know, same gender relations. I, I understand all of that. Um, in um, the most recent conference, um, President Nelson was talking about that. He said um, that they've worked with members of the community and they've tried to help with some legislation to protect um, people. And so it was kind of a joint effort. And he said, you know, lines of differentiation need not be battle lines. And that's one I still get the sense from this that you feel like you've been attacked. And um, that's that's actually exactly not what I want to have there i don't want you to feel like there's any you know um any of that happening um i can tell you again from my perspective i think you're a wonderful person um if you decided to work in the year i would love to work with you um you know if we were having a backyard barbecue you and doug would both be invited um i'd love to have you there i was a little bit bothered when um i don't remember if it was either you or doug said you know people um have members of the members of the church will have family members that are gay and they kind of shun and reject them. And when I hear that, that's one that I think that's definitely not um, what I've been taught with the way the gospel is supposed to be implemented. It's certainly not um, any of the b beliefs or, or things that I have. No, I agree. Can we get and to I like think... lie 37 in this whole thing? This is just so frustrating to me <laughs> about the timeline. Uh, well, I mean, you're, just, you, you're basically saying who's behind this. And he's like, I can tell you want to know who's behind this. But I'm not going to tell but, you but, because it was so long ago and I don't remember. But uh, what I'm going to say is I can tell you're angry, but you, you shouldn't be angry because we love you. If there was a barbecue, I would invite you to it. Mm -hmm. If and, you want to be angry, be angry at me. <laughs> But we started this a year and a half ago when we knew that you were in a same gender relationship, that you were married. But just like we brought impossible. up in the beginning of this ta this episode, that is impossible. He literally, the best he could have found out was in January of 2022, mm -hmm. because maybe that, that's when you posted it on social media. Maybe exactly. the Holy Spirit whispered to him that's, a year and a half earlier. Yeah, <laughs> they were married. They are foreordained to be uh, excommunicated from my yeah, the timeline isn't lining up at all it doesn't there. doesn't line up not <laughs> even doesn't. not even within not even close years. it doesn't it does not line up it doesn't line up either that he got his address on may 2nd right. yeah so how did he contact the bishops and seek precedence how if do you he, know the ward boundaries how did he know where to put his membership records he if doesn't. he didn't know their address exactly. until he doesn't exactly. know a month they didn't ago exist. they did not exist <laughs> this bishop did not speak to any other prior bishops of Brennan's. He didn't do it. There's, it's not plausible. But then he immediately says, it doesn't matter because we love you and we'd have you to a barbecue. Light, light. Okay. And, and he throws in and the church is, so the church loves the gays. They're, they're, you know, they're My working, favorite. they're working with the LGBT community to pass non-discrimination legislation. And we all know on Mormon stories because we've covered it extensively that was required. Wasn't it? But that non-discrimination legislation gives the church the right anything. to discriminate. It's oh, not even mm. it's not even non-discriminatory legislation. It's basically saying we won't we won't allow you to be kicked out of your houses or fired from your jobs if you let us continue discriminating against LGBT people in our universities. How is that a, mm. a, an act of love? And yet he's citing that as evidence that the church loves gay people and would have them to their barbecues. Right. Did I get it right, Gerardo? You got it right. It's exactly right. And the same <laughs> thing exists with conversion therapy. The church was on board for banning conversion therapy so long as they were excluded from mm. being responsible for practicing conversion therapy. The church holds the right to practice conversion therapy as a religious principle, but they were on board with uh, the clinical side of it therapists not being able to practice uh, conversion therapy. And this is so easy for a church going member to see and believe if the, if the church organization is telling them this, when you're that far in That's and, right. and when you are a, a good church believing Mormon and you have faith and you really trust in those people, it's not that hard to believe that. It's only when you get out of the, the whole sphere that you realize 
that's crazy how they're trying to convince us that that this is how it is when really they're trying to do something completely different mm -hmm. you can't see it it's like you've got you've got the the rose colored glasses on well that's the my back to my point of having episodes like this and opening up this type of discussion is that these are people who are called of god that are supposed to be our judges in israel these are the latter day saints leaders the latter day saint leaders that other latter day saints look up to and if they're wrong then what else are they wrong about and that is the problem we need to expose light into these closets and show yeah. the general membership that there are and i don't even want to fault this bishop for being so pre so ignorant on this topic mm -hmm. this is a global problem within mormonism at all levels the 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 higher you go the further distant the leaders become in terms of understanding the lgbtq experience it's just like the experience that you talked about, John, earlier in your career where you met a gay person for the first time and was essentially called out in that situation. I had the same opportunity just a couple weeks ago in one of my staff meetings. We got on the topic of transgenderism and what it's like uh, to be transgender. And a lot of the members of my staff were discussing uh, their conflicts with the transgender topic in sports. And I just bluntly asked them how many transgender friends that they had and how many transgender people that they knew. And nobody in that room had a transgender friend. When you start aligning yourself with, with people and, and better understand their experiences, that's when the change happens. That happened for Utah Governor, Governor Cox, when he met Grayson and for the first time met a transgender person and said, something inside of me broke. And that will happen for you as well when you get to know these people. And unfortunately, Latter-day Saint leaders aren't finding opportunities to get to know the LGBTQ community. They're instead doing the complete opposite and they're excluding them and they're excommunicating them from their chapels and from their pews. And Demonizing when you get rid them. of them, you don't have to acknowledge them. And when you don't have to acknowledge them, you don't have to understand them. And when you don't have to understand them, you no longer need to agree with them. And that is Mormonism's problem. And that is why we're, we're having these conversations, uh, conversations, unfortunately today in 2022 in a global church. Yeah. Yeah. And now, you know, Dan Hardy asked, at the, and this is reflecting what you just said, Kyle. Dan Hardy asked at the beginning, well, you don't even want your membership. You didn't even go on a mission or get your Melchizedek priesthood. Why do you even care if they excommunicated you? This process is so outrageous, so insulting, <laughs> so insensitive that it deserves to be exposed. spotlighted and exposed yeah. for that reason alone. Yeah. I th it's I think gross, it's evil, incompetence. I think Dan's comment is exactly evidence of what we've been discussing. Dan is in the same camp as this bishop who continued to say, why didn't well, you just want to leave the church, right? You just don't want to be here, right? This is an epidemic within Mormonism. This is part of the, the rhetoric and the narrative that just because you don't uh, uh, sign up and, and agree to everything right now, that just must mean you want to leave. And then they perpetuate that to say, well, you left because you wanted to sin. You left because uh, so then the waterfall of, of excuses starts flowing mm -hmm. over the mountain. Yeah. And that's the problem that, that we start seeing. But, there's nothing, but Dan's no different than this bishop. There's nothing Christ-like about saying, you're making us uncomfortable, so just leave. Yeah, yeah right? nothing. Yeah, nothing. Okay, all right. Let's keep going. Uh, sorry, lost, we could not lost meet last place. week. Was... Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think sorry, we sorry, we could not. Um, um, in life should... Um, uh, Keep up. If you decided to work in the ear, I would love to work with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wait. if we were having a backyard I'll barbecue, more. you and Doug would both be invited. Um, I'd love to have definitely not um, what I've been taught with the way the gospel is supposed to be implemented. It's certainly okay. not um, any of the b beliefs or, or things that I have. No, I agree. I, I don't think that our beliefs or the choices that we make in life should be um, uh, keep us from making relationships or from connecting with others. Um, um, no, I agree with that. Um, I think the only other, the only other question that I had is, um, when I, when I talked to president, uh, kind of the, the briefing he gave me about, um, membership councils is that for the most part, usually they're only held, he said the majority of the councils that come through his office are ones that relate to um, like defamation of the church, where uh, it's somebody who is still a member who is uh, speaking out of the church. But I just, I guess I want to clarify, I was called to our council together from for my conduct related to same-sex marriage. 
That's right. Okay. Hey, um, pause, pause. That's a, that's important to know. In the ones that I've been yeah, involved in, unfortunately, that's I think that's a very important line. Why is that? Be because um, he just verified that what was the council called for? It was called for my same-sex marriage yeah. conduct. Nothing we, else. We all know that because we he, listened to it exactly. And but yeah. this this is a another affirmation of him saying it. I yeah. asked him directly, and this was one of the only times he answered me directly. And I'm really glad mm -hmm. that he did this time of all times because it's very important. <laughs> and the stake president, now we have a stake president on record saying that's not grounds for a disciplinary council. Exactly. Let mm -hmm. alone excommunication. Yep. But fortunately, our insurance policy is that the stake president makes the final decision, right? So you should feel better <laughs> about this anyway. Okay. That's important. It, yeah. That's okay. the beauty. All right. Let's keep going. Very many. Most of them have been, um, so I guess just, um, many of them have been, um, if someone is married and they have an affair, if they have, um, Can you clarify the other things like that, then, uh, I guess I probably should have asked this at the end of our council last, last Thursday. Um, oh, a withdrawal of records that, that, um, like the decision that had been decided uh is what is that what would constitute as quote unquote excommunication um i i i i keep confusing the the difference in words um sure and i think that um the way that those words have been used over time have been different the right. withdrawal of membership just means that you will no longer be a member of the church okay um is that what used to be called excommunication or um is that just a removal of records um so when you talk about excommunication again in the in um in our church that is similar to it um but previously it's been one where there were also other penalties sometimes associated with it and that also included in there in like the uh, times of the Inquisition with the Catholic Church. So I think that's why the church has moved away from that. <laughs> just means that you're no longer. He recognizes yeah. that. Wow. Um, I did. That have is a, so wow. hilarious. Has he been listening to John DeLay? <laughs> 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 no, because you're, you're basically saying, what's the difference between excommunication and removal of membership? And he's membership trying to, withdrawal. he's trying, yeah, he's trying to make it seem well, like they're different. I told, I kind of, before we, we before this call i talked to them and i said hey, this is probably good questions you should ask one of my worries was that they later would come back and say well we didn't we didn't decide to excommunicate you we you know you misrepresented what our decision was so i wanted him on the record saying yes this is excommunication what we decided was to excommunicate you and what he said was we don't like the word excommunication anymore because it reminds yeah. people of the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. And he also said that membership withdrawals is basically just removing your record of a church, which is not what it says on the handbook. Yeah. 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 That's not it. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else confused? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there. That's that's all of this. All this is is trying to clear up confusion. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Well, if we make the waters muddy when, enough. When we moved forward with the council, because uh, I remember, I remember we talked about that. Um, you you talked about those those two options of, um, you know, removing my records uh, by by talking to you then or moving forward with the council. Um, we we had decided to move forward with the council. So, were, were my records removed on the basis of um, my same sex marriage? So that hasn't happened yet. That's one that um, we are recommending that we remove that. And saying that, Brennan, you seem bothered by it again. But when we had our council, it sounds like you don't even want to be a member of the church. Oh my God. Is that not correct? That's... No, that is, that is correct. So I guess my question to you, Brennan, is why is this so upsetting to you? Oh um, my gosh, pause, you know, please. Where... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, I, I didn't... Brandon. Why is this so upsetting to you? Brennan. Um, Brennan, Brennan, why is this so upsetting to you? Because he is uh, he <laughs> is is saying that my feelings are wrong. This is legit saying that, okay, you're feeling this. Why are you feeling this? There's no understanding. Th th this is the persecution, the raw persecution that I'm talking about. No acknowledgement, no sympathy, just 
why are you feeling that way? You know, I'm sorry you feel that way. Why? It makes you know? no sense why you should feel that way. And here's the reason. Exactly. This exactly. Way. This is the, the purest form of just somebody comes to you for help. I'm having a really hard, you know, a really hard time doing this. Um, can you, you know, help me? I'm trying to work out my feelings. Why are you feeling that way? Just, you know, you shouldn't be feeling that way. Why? It's just, it's so frustrating. Yeah. I didn't, because in the moment I, I wasn't really, I was focused on other things, but now listening back, it's just, it's blatant disrespect. It's, it's not caring. And they claim, they're claiming to be caring and they're claiming to be loving, but that's not what's yeah. happening. I mean, he came to be an empath earlier in this conversation. I'm super empathetic. Um, to exactly. <laughs> Your words completely contradict it. It's like he wasn't paying attention or listening during the entire disciplinary council. Right? Yeah. 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 Th this is what's slowly starting to break down my, my confidence and shelf in them. Yeah. So, and by the way, there are times where I think you guys are muting the phone and talking to oh, each other. Yeah. Let's explain why... that. Um, so uh, at the time we're going to go buy a mattress and our, and, uh, uh the call ended up being right at that point. So we had our dog with us. That's what, who was barking. Um, and times and you're, you're muting and responding yeah, to each other. Cause, cause the dog was, um, uh, he wanted to make sure that, um, when we're getting this clarification, I'm not missing things. And, you know, so we, we're on the phone, we have the opportunity to ask it and to, to get this clarification to clear things up. And so, um, I mute. <laughs> Doug tells me what he, and he's like, Oh, but you know, could, yeah. Could, yeah, could make clarify sure we on get clarified. I'm like, okay, they okay, keep unmute. talking around the subject. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Just, and okay. he's he's luckily there to be able to help, you know, help me totally. catch stuff. I believe the church was inspired if I didn't believe that the current leader was a prophet. Um I actually don't want to be a member of it. I I want to be out. Right. It sounded to me during our council that's actually what you wanted. No, that that's true. Um, and the reason why I wanted to move forward with the council versus just removing my records um, uh, is because I, I would I would rather um, leave as a married man to to Doug and have the church remove my records on that basis than to remove the records on my own time. I'd rather have my records removed because I was married to Doug, and that that's really where I felt like passionate on that um i guess that's that's why i wanted to clarify on that decision to see if that that is actually what happened did i did i have my records removed on the basis of being married to doug or um if i you know if that wasn't the case sure you bother well and i'll talk with um president and i'll make sure that we get this letter to you that is one where um I'm, I'm not sure you would ever you know, act on this, but you would still be welcome to come to any meeting just like anybody is. Okay. So that that's it. Was that, that the end? Okay. okay. So you, you guys said goodbye or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. So but he said you're welcome to still come to meetings after we <laughs> barbarically, you know, commit spiritual homicide against you, you can still come to our meeting. And you gotta love like he's he's too, he's doing exactly the the, the Mormon he's, he's doing mantra. the textbook. It's yeah. Very textbook. You you hurt them, you beat them up, then you I mean, you start the wildfire, then you put the wildfire out, then you go to the public and ask for them to acknowledge that you were the one who put the wildfire out. So you get the acknowledgement and then you send them off on their way, knowing that you were the hero who saved them from the fire that they started. And, and you invite super, them to join your fire anytime. That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> I will say that um, the disciplinary council was cut off at a certain time because the you know they, they had my recommendation for excommunication. And then after that, it just became a full open conversation about what's been going on in my life. You know, like tell us about like what, what you know, um, uh, what have you been doing recently? Like, kind of a small talk. You know, small so yeah. You know, like, Oh, we, you know, um, we bought our house and, and yeah. And all this stuff as if they were actually genuinely interested. Yeah. Cause I was so. just sitting next to Ren and, and then literally it was like, okay, you guys, I, I'm, we're ready to recommend that we get, you're going to get the, membership withdrawal and then it's like okay any questions like nope okay that's good, good to see you um by the way how have you been doing uh like just casual exactly that exactly like, that yeah it's like how'd you enjoy the play mrs lincoln yeah, right like, enjoy mm. the rest of the play totally different person <laughs> mrs lincoln other other than what happened to abraham lincoln mrs lincoln how are you liking the play 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Assassination. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's a, yeah. I got it. 19th got century reference. Huge <laughs> thanks to Jacob Berg for the super chat. Those donations really help. Okay. So now if that weren't enough, there's one more recording. So, <laughs> so now we're like literally four hours and 40 minutes into, um, there, there, there's, there's one more, there's one more recording, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's about an hour and 10 minutes. Long. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I don't know, what are we thinking? That's a lot. <laughs> Why don't why do you tell us kind of just set that up really quick and then yeah. we'll figure out what to do? No, of course, yeah. So by by this by this point in um, the uh, after having all these calls, contacting different bishops and stake presidents, it's clear that there is misinformation and there is no consistency in what's going on, and so eventually we figure out that the only way that we're hopefully going to get answers to any of these things is we're going to sit both the stake president and the bishop down and ask them these things. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Why are you like, why are you guys saying different things? And they don't, and, and, and hopefully in that case, they won't have the opportunity to be like, well, I'll just go talk to the bishop, you know, right after this call or uh, I'll go, to, you know, talk to the stake president, you know, get some counsel on this and then I'll get back to you. I, so now that they're here together, we can get these answers and we can get some clarity about um, to hopefully prove to us that they're not out persecuting gay people. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is a final meeting in person mm -hmm. with both of you and the stake president and the bishop to get yeah. everything straight. Is that mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. yeah, it happened right. two days ago. Um, and it happened two days ago? It happened two days ago. And you had not received a final letter letting you know the verdict is that right well, yeah i think yeah. the reason why it had been delayed so hard is because all of these conversations yeah um because they knew this is basically my version of an appeal even even though i hadn't formally appealed the the decision that wasn't final you know that was because it never was it never became final um all these conversations i think the stake president is like okay let's you know let's put a pin in it Let's not make it final yet because there's obviously still things going on. On the call that um, you had with the stake president, he told you that he was not going to move forward with any decision anyway until he met with you. Mm -hmm. And he, I mean, yeah. we didn't put, we, we had to pause that recording, but at the end he tells you, I'm going to mm -hmm. wait oh, until oh. you reach out and you meet with me and then we'll take a decision. So that's why you decided to go forward with his, um, his uh, invitation yeah. and said, okay, let's meet with both of you. Mm -hmm. um and you you came prepared with several questions yeah and so yeah. i want i want w luckily we were able to kind of summarize everything that was going on and we broke it down into these you know i came up with eight questions of like these are all the contradictions and miscommunication and misconstruing of what's going on what do you have to say like what like mm -hmm. What's your answer to this? And so we come up, we have these eight questions. And, and you sent them to the stake president? I sent them both to the stake president and to the bishop so that they could hopefully prepare. they would have come prepared and they can't say, well, I forgot who you know this was. I'd have to you know go do some digging before mm -hmm. I can tell you. Can I, would... can I tell you one of those questions? Yeah. When you said, hey, bishop, you said you contact the bishop from the ward that I was currently residing according to the general handbook, who was the bishop that was contacted? And he agreed to prepare that before this coming meeting, right? Yeah, I he think says, that's yeah, important. I can go do that. I can go get that for you. Mm -hmm. So yep. there's our precedent. And we made we want to make sure that they were prepared as well. So so I, I just want to acknowledge to our viewers, you know, we have the option right now of like stopping this and starting a part two. But there's 600 people that are listening. So I acknowledge mm -hmm. that now we're going to push this to a five and a half to six hour episode. I want to apologize for that, but it makes no sense to end it. But what we yeah. are going to do, and there's some people here that might like to use the restroom or even uh, increase their blood sugar levels. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play this final interaction, but we're going to play it from start to finish and we're not going to jump in. Is that all right? And that way people can listen to it uninterrupted. We here can do whatever we need to do and then we'll come back at the very end, either just to wrap up or to have some final commentary. But we don't want to cut it off while everyone's listening. It'll it'll be a little difficult to not jump in because there there will be a um, um, there will be a lot of um, um, 
times where if if we don't jump in and say something it'll be completely missed yeah. because it's like the gaslighting this is this next meeting is going to be it's like rapid fire like example pop, 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 of pop. of gaslighting and denial um and so are you guys um, okay staying yeah i, th- doing I, I think staying. we'll be okay at this point i mean okay. now um got 600 viewers this is this is more mysterious, man. <laughs> um, if it's not six or yeah. seven hours, it's not a more mysterious. Uh, yeah, give me another yeah, granola the, bar. The and, problem and we'll is, be okay. My latter gay stories audience, they're not we're a one hour episode. <laughs> I don't even know how we still have 150 people hanging on. So Because this is important stuff. No, I, I do, and that was yeah. that was fun. That was tongue in cheek, but it is intense. So thank you to our latter gay stories audience who's held through. All right. For all of our, view, our viewers, uh I promise that this is probably the most important part of it. It is. Episode. So it yeah. actually gets worse. Yes. yes. It gets worse. So much worse. So it's this is like you, you ain't seen nothing yet, is yeah. basically what you're Pretty saying. Much. Yeah. I mean, if That's you think hard to believe. if you think everything in the past few recordings has been civil, this the, this will change your mind. Because at this point you guys are are upset. Oh yeah. Right? And you because you honestly you I, I was so amazed how cordial you were to Bishop and Sig President. And I have to say I cut out some of the parts where you were like complimenting the bishop and you know having like good conversation with the bishop just because i mean we didn't want to get it too long but okay. uh but this on this one you guys were because were, at the time of those yeah. previous recordings i was still Frustrated. convinced and i still had a part of me you know hoping that it wasn't um it wasn't them you know that yeah. they weren't out to get me and by the, the by the time of this conversation it's everything has kind of fallen off the shelf to where it's pretty clear that this is, it's not what I once thought it was. And so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we and, already spent so many hours into this, all these conversation, you know, out of our way. Exactly. Like, remember how <laughs> While we had, doing everything else in our life. We, we were living such a happy life. And now we spent like three, four hours plus on this. And now we're going to get it to the end. So this is where we are most frustrated. Yeah, to me, this was the last attempt for one of them, someone to come clean about what, you know, we were asking them about. And something, just the last thing I would say is like, about this point, like you guys are very well prepared. Like I sent you all the links from the handbook of instructions. Like we prepared like this document where like with the questions and the, and the handbook and of instructions the links quotes. and the screenshots and like, yeah. So you guys were really prepared and understanding what they were trying to do. So you were trying to like, just get clarity. Yeah. I love it that people are chiming in saying, don't end, don't end, keep going. Yeah, the, uh, a lot of them are saying like, it doesn't matter, you don't need lunch. You're exactly right. <laughs> that is one principle of Who Mormonism. Said that? Who that said I, that? that I kept write that down, write that down. Somebody somebody wrote, if you work, if you go on Mormon stories, you're going to need a catheter. That's what they wrote. <laughs> oh, yeah. gosh. I, I still believe in food storage and carrying around my food storage, so I'm good for lunch. I don't have to go. I'll just live off the fat of the land. <laughs> a catheter and an enteral feeding tube. <laughs> <laughs> Says the nurse, right? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, well, let's do it. This is two days ago, June 20th, 2022, two days ago, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this we tried is we, you, mm-hmm. you two, your stake president and bishop. We tried well, to meet them. We tried to meet with them the week prior. Yeah. There was girls camp. Yeah. And yeah. yeah so okay. other things, but now we can. All right. At least, at least take a potty break, everybody. All right, here we go. Um, let's start it. Sorry we could not meet last week. I was taking care of a bit of a challenge situation, so I apologize that I had to push it no this problem. week, but we really Sorry. appreciate you guys coming down. Why don't we start with a prayer, Bishop, do you mind offering? Yeah. Heavenly yeah, Father, we're grateful for the chance we have to meet today. Um, we're grateful for the blessings that we have. We're grateful for thy son and his teachings and atonement. Father, I'm grateful for the relationship that I have with friend, and I'm grateful to be able to meet God. I'm grateful for the um, friendship that we share. We pray that thou bless us with thy spirit today. Please help us to um, understand what thou would have us do and to act accordingly. We say this in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Bishop. Okay. Well, how do you want to tackle this meeting, Brennan? Uh, I don't know. Um, do you have anything to start with? Yeah. Or- do you want us to, to start? I think you guys are welcome to start. You talked on the phone. I, we yeah. had a great conversation on the phone. That's why I said I think it'd be best for us to all meet in person, honestly. I mean, yeah. it's one thing to chat on the phone. I'm so glad you're a bishop as well. Um, I'm, I'm great with however you guys want to start, in all honesty. Okay. So, I mean, if you guys want so to start. When we met, Brennan, you actually have a letter that you read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, because the 
it says in the in the letter that we first got the council um, talked about providing a written statement and so i kind of provided a, a written statement of um yeah some things is this it yeah i mean i can read it if you let like. me see it real quick i'll sure. just read through it as we go i'd love to and this is what you brought that night yeah and you just read it that night uh-huh yeah because i i really just wanted to explain my my thoughts regarding the um the council and i mean some of my thoughts um with the church and their their teachings regarding um lgbtq members of the church um i feel like a lot of the teachings that the church has um or at least that have come from general authorities they contradict each other pretty often and that was really my main intention with with bringing the written statement was um to kind of show that um even the general authorities aren't on the same page with kind of these teachings and that was kind of our um, I mean, my reasoning for believing, uh, coming or coming to believe that um, the church's teachings aren't inspired by God re regarding LGBTQ topics, because if, you know, if it was inspired by God, then they wouldn't be contradicting each other so much. I assume God would have, you know, a, a consistent direction and, um, you know, the uh, general authorities wouldn't contradict each other so much. How, how do you guys both feel about the church? Let's take the LGBT issue and just put it on the shelf for one second. When it comes to the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, all those things, how do you feel about those aspects of the gospel? Um, this is something that I, I wanted to talk about because um, like my beliefs regarding the church, we've, uh, um, brother, uh, has asked me a lot about it. Um, it's, I mean, even when, even during the council, that was something that was actually kind of troubling for me because I I was called to the membership council for my conduct related to same-sex marriage, not because um, of my beliefs regarding the church, of whether or not I still believe in the church. If that were the case, I'd be trying to get like a, like a temple temple recommend where. You know, you need to see um, if the tenets of the church, if you truly believe in them, if you're worthy um, to be in the temple. Um, and so that was something that kind of put me off when when we had our meeting is because um, I, I wasn't called to, to be, you know, to talk about my beliefs regarding the church. It was because of I, I, I was sought out for my conduct related to, to same sex marriage. And so. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably some of the most troubling thing is like we're just, you know, everything was fine and then two men showed on a in our door with a letter with no prior contact of like asking how we're doing and then we just got a letter with members of council and then as we're reading into it, you know, like this is not necessary to hold a council based on same sex marriage. And so we're gonna feel persecuted you know, a little bit and it was like, like being like hunt down. Like I think it says in the letter, it's like if it was a witch hunt. I, I just I describe it as a witch hunt because you know? I mean I still feel it's kind of how it was. And if it, and if it truly was about my beliefs regarding the church, I feel like it would have made more sense for somebody to reach out to have somebody come by and visit to see, you know, uh if I still believe in the church, if I um, want to keep my records from the church, but that wasn't it. I was I was called because of my conduct related to same sex marriage, not for anything else. Mm -hmm. And so it it feels like we're when that comes up, it feels like we're diverting from what I was called for to come to. You well, know, and, and I guess the one thing, and we'll dive into this as well. Yeah. I mean, the handbook is like, does I think a very good job of delineating whether it is um, whether it is. Um, homosexuality, heterosexual, uh, you know, sin, I mean, in your, you're outside of the right. bonds of marriage, it's all considered the same, you follow what I'm saying? So you, you say, uh, it, and I understand in the lens of how you're saying it, Doug, I really do, mm -hmm. and I, I do have some empathy because you're saying, hey, wait a minute, it's because we are in a same-sex relationship. Well, if it's a violation of the law of chastity, Bishop can tell you if it was a, a, a man in the ward 
that had stepped out on his wife, for example, you follow what I'm saying, or was not married and was out sleeping with someone else, uh, a woman, for example, we would hold a membership council for that individual. Right, but that's There's, not the case. Yeah, it's because... a different though, because one, he's not made his temple covenants to... I'm only a priest. Um, you know, it's very different versus a man who made a temple sealing covenants and I step out on his wife. I haven't cheated on my spouse. I'm married lawfully. And then, to, I mean, to, I am an elder, but this is not my council. I'm I never got called, say, right? I am an elder. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm in doubt and everything. That's why I understand. I was like, okay, it makes sense if I got called. They make no sense. Brennan has right. been inactive for four plus years. And we got married and he got called. And sure. and the tough thing is, is that it, it, that's one of the things that is kind of bothersome for me about the church is that they, they claim to be equal in treating same sex couples as, I mean, the same way that you would have a heterosexual, heterosexual couple, but heterosexual couples aren't being called to membership councils for their conduct related to marriage. And so to okay. me, just one second, we'll push pause one second. Sure. Are you sure about that? <laughs> Are you saying that when couples get married, heterosexual couples mm -hmm. get married under law, that they're called to a membership council? No, not if they're married under law. I thought you were talking about somebody stepped out of that relationship, regardless of whether they're a priest or whatever you thought I'm saying. So you made an interesting comment about what well, mm -hmm. has to do with temple covenants. It's a little bit more than that, but let's keep going with the discussion. Yeah. I mean, there's many points of this, but yeah, that's one of the things that it's like. I I don't think that's happening anywhere. Like, there's, isn't this a contra a huge contradiction? Because the stake president told them, I, I wish we had played that call in full, but at least five times during that conversation, that same sex marriage in about in about itself, like just you won't be called for a membership council just because of same sex marriage. Mm -hmm. And it seems like here he's contradicting himself tr to try to protect the bishop. Mm -hmm. right. I'm, That's where it I begins. Right? Yeah, it feels like it's beginning here. It's we're now realizing the stake president's realizing why he, the bishop may or may not have done what he did, and it's now. I think we're building a foundation of cover. It's it's now beginning this. We have to protect the good name of the church, which is that third tier that we talked about earlier. So if that's happening, what is it going to take to now protect the bishop? And I think this might be it. Yeah. Yeah, because he's basically saying you guys are violating the law of chastity and you got married and that violates the church's rules. And it's up to the bishop to determine what the definition mm -hmm. of that uh, um, violating the law of chastity should look like because he, he makes references like it's up to the bishop to decide what that looks like. And he's using, again, in, in, at least he stopped with the stupid word of wisdom garbage. He moved on from coffee, tea, and tobacco, Ooh, but now he's, now he's comparing it to infidelity <laughs> and saying it's like infidelity. Yeah. And it was so great that you called him out and said, well, there's no infidelity here, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and, the, and the precursor to all this, and you're right, he is starting to realize it. But um, he before this, he's, he's getting two different stories. He had gotten a completely different story of what actually happened from the bishop. That is very, very likely what happened. And it's only when he's starting to talking to us in person that he's realizing that that's not what happened. And then it becomes damage control. And so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's keep it going. People who live together and then they said they're working on, you know, coming back to the temple and they don't get that. But we don't even get asked that before we get a letter. So Bishop told me actually, to us in the council was like hey well we usually for people who we know are sinning we would come and we would talk and then we'll get a letter have, to have invite, someone, right? have them, someone to you make know, you know try to see where they're at the to to, to but, see if they want to repent but we just get this is not the same treatment because we just get a membership council letter so Doug, I, i'd actually pause you there um i think that you're again you're feeling persecuted um but i don't think it's really working out quite the way that you're perceiving it. Um, when when I first heard- Disregarding the feelings. Really feel when I first heard that Brennan was, um, you know, it was probably, I don't remember, it was it two or three years ago. He came into my office, we talked, and I said, right. I, um, I heard that previously you had um, had issues with same gender attraction, and your answer was, I don't have issues with it. I fully embraced it. Right, right. right. Um, so when you say, you know, normally you would call and, and sit down and talk with someone, 
we actually did sit down and we talked about it. At the end of that, I said, you know, you would still be welcome to attend Sacra meeting. I don't know if you remember me saying that. And you said, yeah, yeah. I don't think we're going to be attending. Yeah, and I, I think I said something along the line because I knew at that point that my intention was to be married to a man. And that's what I was pursuing. And so. But that has nothing me, to do with. I mean, the marriage. The membership though. council. I mean, you, you, you told me that. The, that this membership council was in the works since last June. Yeah, I had a just a quick comment. So what I was asking is that you didn't sit down with us and talk about the, our, our, our Brendan's to, con to confirm the marriage. And you then know, his he's... his defense was, oh, I actually did sit down three years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How does this apply? How so is convenient. this him answering our question? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I'm glad you asked it. But it's a, just a lot of deflections. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of deflections. Yeah. Okay, let's keep it going. Sorry, we could not meet last week. I was taking care Oops. of a bit of a it, challenge it, situation. It started over again. That I had to push it no problem. Week, but we really right. appreciate you guys coming down. And why don't we start with the prayer, Bishop? Do you mind offering? Yeah. yeah. I want to figure out uh, was, who which so, bishop. Um, I found out that you were living in a different ward, and that's when I contacted the bishop to see if we need to push your records there. That bishop did not. Were you able to figure out uh, was, who, which so, bishop it was? No, but it kind of doesn't matter because they. Because I knew at that point that there we go. My intention was to be married to a man, and that's what I was pursuing. And so, but that has nothing me, to do with. I mean, the marriage, the membership though. council. I mean, you 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 told me that. The, that this membership council was in the works since last June. So I, I heard again, I don't, I don't deal in hearsay, right? So if there's a question I will, I will ask you directly. Right. Um, so I heard was that the you, membership council in the works since last June? So it was, it was about last June that I heard that you were um, in a relationship, one that would not, you know, um, in a, a same gender relationship in doing that. Um, I found out that you were living in a different ward, and that's when I contacted the bishop to see if we need to push your records there. That bishop did not. Were you able to figure out uh, who, was, who which so, bishop it was? No, but it kind of doesn't matter because they didn't accept your records. Your records stayed here with us the whole time. Right. It, 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 it does matter, though, because in order to hold the council, there has to be that coordination. Um, and something that we noticed going into it is that you, you only got our address on May third of this last month. And so there would have been no way for you to contact our bishop or to even find out where we're living oh, at that so, point. So. I mean, hit the pause button right there. I actually talk to bishops all the time. I really don't remember which bishop it was. We, I did have a- uh, He's talking to every bishop in every stake, and that's how he found me. I'd, I'd love to know what bishop it was. Okay, are you asking, yeah. why are you asking that? Because, because you're I, a liar. Want to, <laughs> my main intention in coming here is I don't want, I don't want to have to walk away from this membership council, believing that the church is persecuting people and going after gay people. And if if this truly, if this, if everything was truly followed by the membership handbook, and this wasn't as a personal vendetta. Um, no, 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 no. I know it's not a personal vendetta, no, no, no. but what I'm saying is that with contacting the other um, the other uh, bishops or stake president that it was done correctly and uh, with good intention. Um, because I think it's stated in that letter too, that, I mean, it feels like a witch hunt. That's why we're here to clarify because there's so many like conflicting thoughts when it's like, it doesn't make sense. One for Bishop Walding to know where Brennan lives where his bishop are and by the way we contact all the bishops and none of them and the sick president and none of them seems to know anything about i can probably go back to my records and find out who it was but it that, kind of didn't matter yeah but i mean that's kind um, of but if you're like, asking did i follow the handbook absolutely yes um i spoke with that bishop they contacted their state president i spoke with president about it and they said because i already have a relationship with you um we would just keep your records here Right. What is, what, yeah. what is the outcome that the two of you are looking for? My, right. my, I'm hoping to make sure that everything just kind of like not conflicting. And I just want an explanation that I'm not. This feel like 
gaslighting. There's a lot of happening here. I was like, oh, so this has happened here, but the, the timeline doesn't make any sense. Or like, for example, when you said that there shouldn't be a membership council held for same-sex marriage. That was the word you that, said that in the phone call. That same-sex marriage in and of itself is not a reason to hold a membership council. But now you're saying it is. No, it's, it has to do with it. It's, it's, it's an idea of sin. The question is, is what when we try to determine a membership council, we're trying to determine what would allow the individual the opportunity to come back to the Savior. So it, I think the interesting thing is, we might all disagree how we all got in this pause, room, but I think it's pause. interesting. I just, to say something uh, they keep about saying that. I just got to deliberate the fact on that. that you're even here. Is there something about I say the intention of a membership council is to see if there's anything that will bring that will give a person the opportunity to come back to the fold to come back to church if that was truly the the intention and the want for this there would have been some kind of contact to us mm. to bring us back to church yeah. to figure out why we are inactive but there was there was never, never well, i guess once. that could have happened during the disciplinary council they could have asked you hey is there anything we can do <laughs> And the weird thing is what the, the only uh, the only possible thing that that could that could um, be an outcome that would avoid a disciplinary council would be them holding the disciplinary council, them saying to you, is there anything we can get you back on the path? What's the only answer that would then keep you from getting your getting us communicated? Kyle, you know, divorce, separate that marriage, right? Divorce and coming back to church. Right. So, I mean, I guess that is that what he's saying? That, that, okay, yes, we didn't talk to you beforehand. We called the disciplinary council, but it wasn't to excommunicate you. It first was to find out if you would just choose to get divorced of your own free will and choice. And if that were the case, then there never would have been excommunication. And it's doubly uh, problematic when you start saying, what's going to you bring? We need to figure out ways of bringing you closer to the Savior by excommunicating you. <laughs> That will bring you closer to the Savior by kicking you out of the fold. Thank you. Why bringing were you, you to a disciplinary council. Why were you shaking your head? That's not what, that's, I think that's what the point that they're making over and over and over again. I think, John, you're falling a little bit for it uh, with what the sick president and bishop are saying. Well, I'm the, just following the, the lines the, of his logic now, but right, go ahead. But, but go the, ahead. the membership councils are not, are not to bring people, oh, right. how can we bring you back to church? Right. Membership councils are done when there's a like yeah, knowing that right. someone is sinning and we're bringing you in to discipline you. That's why they were called the, disciplinary after counselors. You, there, after you had it, it engaged with them as their pastoral exactly. leader mm -hmm. and warned them or worked with them, which yeah. he said he did a couple of years ago. Right, right. And and he even said on the phone but, um, that when you're doing something that's odd, that's at odds with the church. That's when we bring you in for a membership council. Exactly. That's what he said. Yeah. That's the purpose of it. Well, why... Why didn't they bring you back? Why didn't they bring you to a membership council two years ago when they knew you were living in sin and when you said that you were happy with, with your lifestyle? Why right. didn't they call a disciplinary council then? That's me. I almost want to say props to the bishop who didn't accept your records, if indeed that bishop really exists, um, because he probably didn't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> he wasn't. So, so maybe we have some affirming bishop out there who looked at this and said, no, I'm not even getting in the middle of this. If you're hell bent on excommunicating this, this, person that lives in my boundaries now um and and he maybe recognized this as a witch hunt as well so so hats off to that bishop who didn't want anything to do with it wouldn't accept your records at that point they should have just i mean really just sent him off into the unknowns but to me that just shows and continues to prove that this bishop had a personal vendetta and wanted to come after you yeah because there are many other options for this bishop to to deal with your records but he took it upon himself to make sure that you were punished that you were disciplined because he knew about you and right and even though he didn't have jurisdiction over you he wanted you to feel his wrath and his his authority right okay all right thanks for that <laughs> clarification all right let's keep it going the church that you deeply believe in and you're frustrated about this because i think in all honesty i'm thrilled that you're here i'm thrilled that you called me because this gives us an opportunity to dialogue through these things you know i i did really appreciate brennan on the phone he said you know president i probably did make a few comments maybe social media or otherwise about the church you know what i mean i, I did know. not say i that. did not oh i thought you said that on the phone no and, that, and that's something that was confusing to me is because I, I was called for same-sex marriage conduct, and I mentioned that when I first, at the beginning of the call, when I called you. Um, uh, but then you ask a lot of questions regarding, I didn't realize until after the fact, but apostasy, if 
I had, because if I looked in the handbook and apostasy is very clearly defined exactly what it is and what would qualify as apostasy, but I wasn't called for being an apostate. And to this point, I've never made any, anything that would constitute, I've never taken any actions or said anything that would constitute as apostasy. And so I was, I was kind of confused when, when you were asking me about that, because it wasn't, it wasn't for, I mean, it wasn't for apostasy, it was for same-sex marriage. So I guess- So you what, never what, said anything about the church? Not publicly. No. Nothing. Not on yeah. any public forum. But to any friends, to other people that would have been talking outside. <laughs> I mean, everyone does that, like, but it's not kind of apostasy. Like in the handbook, it says in a public forum. Yeah, in a public, yeah, forum to where I'd be able to, you know, so whatever what, it may be. What, what are you, what's the outcome you're both after? Do you want to be members of the church? Well, <gasps> it's, not, it's not membership right now, I don't think is like what is the outcome we want. It's mostly, I, we want to be clarified. We want to be justified. We feel like and we're here in response to being called to a membership council for my same-sex marriage conduct. We feel discredited. You discredited. We feel discredited. like it's a witch hunt. We, we feel came like out of our not, way to hurt you guys. And we basically, we're sure. living our own lives, and you know, like with his membership, because he's. I think he mentioned it with Bishop that he at one point was thinking about figuring out and resigning. In, in on the his original own. call when we were talking, I mean, I had mentioned to you that. Eventually, I I um, I was planning on uh, eventually removing my records. I just hadn't made a point of it, and uh, I just why would you why would you remove your records? Why would I remove my records? Yeah, why were you going to remove your records out of curiosity? I but that's not the topic that we're talking about. No, no, no. What? I'm just trying to get insight into how you're thinking. So, were you going to remove your records because you say I don't believe the church is true, or do you remove your records because you feel like the church has been unfair? in its treatment of others whatever my reasoning may have been i i have i didn't come to the church of my own volition to remove my records if i were coming to you to remove my records i would give my reasons willingly because that's part kind of part of the process and then you know i'd be instructed upon um what that means when i have my records removed and that kind of thing but i didn't come to the church i didn't come to the bishop didn't come to you to get my records removed, to resign. And I would give you my reasons if that's what I was doing right now, but I was called to the membership council for my conduct related to same-sex marriage. And so I don't think my beliefs currently in the church are applicable because I was never coming to resign or to remove my records. I was approached first. And so that's what we're, that's what we're here doing is responding to being sought out for the council, not because I wanted to remove my records on my own time. So Brendan. Yeah, just to clarify, this is really clear to me now. Mm -hmm. You're saying, we wanna know one thing. Did you come after us as a witch hunt to excommunicate us for being same-sex married? That's yeah. all you wanna know. Yeah, and right. They, and then they say, what is your intention? Do you wanna stay a member? And we tell them multiple times, and we want to know if you guys have been persecuting us and if you can answer our questions yeah. straight then yeah. that will help us know and then they'll say well have you ever said a bad thing about the church do you still believe in the church and they're trying to divert because what they don't want to do is simply just look you in the eye possibly while you're being recorded while they're being recorded and just say yes we came after you because you're same-sex married and that's why we're excommunicating you that's what you want them to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's clearly why they called you to the disciplinary council, but they don't want to admit it. But it's clearly the exact same thing that they're also trying to avoid. They absolutely don't want to wade in those waters at all. They know there's that shark infested mm -hmm. by their own volition. They're, they're the ones that planted the sharks in the water. And it, if they start wading in that water, they know there'll be blood. Because the church publicly, the church loves gay people. The church loves more, you know, the LGBTQ community. We fight for the rights of LGBTQ people. So surely we don't engage mm -hmm. in LGBTQ witch hunts to excommunicate and purge same-sex married LGBTQ people from our Even roles. though it looks like it. And even though you have five <laughs> phone calls prior to this. Even though Kyle even knows though... of nine that happened, eight or nine that happened during COVID. But that's not what, that's not that's what it not looks what like. That's not what we're actually doing. Yeah. If, if they were willing to admit that to us and to tell us that, yes, this was wrong. This was a mistake. 
Or, we, we, yes, this is what we're doing. Yes, We're or kicking yeah. you out for getting same-sex marriage. If they had admitted that, then we wouldn't be having this yeah. podcast. I wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't feel the need to do to have this podcast if they had yeah. just come clean about mm-hmm. everything. Yeah, it's a great yeah. um and uh, I I didn't real I didn't really realize um how much they were trying to deflect off of the topic at hand until like until this moment in 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 the conversation. Like it all, like it all finally hit me of like, okay, apostasy, word of wisdom. What are your beliefs in the church? They're trying to find every avenue to get to to shy away from the fact that they called me to a disciplinary membership council on the basis of same sex marriage conduct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything they can do to move it away from that, so they don't have to admit it. So they don't have to yeah. admit it, and that's yeah. and I say it and. I, you know, we've heard it so many times before. I'm saying it over and over again. I was called to this council because of my same-sex marriage conduct. And they're That's bringing why. up the same excuses over and over and over. It's, it's exactly. a word of wisdom yeah. issue. It's you didn't yeah. want to be here in the beginning. It's, it's your it's, own fault. It's perfect dodging and yeah. Yeah, it's deflection. It's deflection and gaslighting because yeah. this clearly mm-hmm. was your problem. You were the one that couldn't. You were, you were the one that's not strong enough, Brennan. If you yeah. were just strong enough. My knuckles were not bleeding yet. That's it. That's yeah. it. All right, so we got 50 more minutes. Let's see if you can get them. <laughs> All right, we can do get it. Get them to admit what's obvious. <laughs> and in, in our council, when we talked, you actually, we got to a point where you said, I was planning on removing my records. And I asked you, is that what you want to do? Do you remember that? Yes. Um, and that was one of those, you're, well, do I remove my records or do I get um, excommunicated? Right. I, I remember it. You, you kind of presented this, this twofold decision. Um, you know, what you said, would we like to, would you like to move forward to the council or would you like to remove your records, assumingly on my own time and then the, the formal process. Um, and uh, I remember telling you that I would rather move forward with the council because that's what I was called for. That's what I came here to do. And I, I, I even according to the handbook, it's, you're, you're not supposed to recommend or even you know prevent or like present an, an an option of you can go you know resign and remove your records on your own time. That's something that a, like that shouldn't be done. But a bishop should not recommend that. I was going to do it. I asked you what you wanted to do. By giving the option. Okay, is, here's the conflicting thing: is that when you say what how the outcome of the council would be, these three things like membership withdrawal, like. You didn't say what that entail. Formal restrictions. From, yeah. You don't or say what those restrictions mean. You say, oh, what membership withdrawals means that it's a kind of the same thing as you, you basically remove your record from the church, which does sound like that, but I don't think that's what it says in the handbook. Sure. Because being resigning from the church is very it's, different it's, than being, I mean, can, can you finish this yeah, thought? Go for it. Than being a membership, having like a membership withdrawal because if we resign, if we want to go take a sacrament, we're welcome to take a sacrament. Versus membership withdrawal, you don't take the sacrament. Am I correct on that? Well, the, interesting, yeah, the interesting thing is, in both situations, you're essentially considered a non-member in both. So in all honesty, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does if we want to come back to church. Because of the process, in order to becoming a member again, it's very, it is, it's, it's very different. You have to hold a council in order to regain. We're not membership. informed if you that. have your. Oh, yeah, your I agree with that. I agree with that, but both of them require rebaptism, first presidency approval, and all those things. A membership withdrawal, a resignation. We just had somebody that resigned their membership of the church five years ago, and we just put them back in the church a couple of them, maybe a year ago. And it was a process to go through the entire first presidency to get approval to have the person that resigned their membership to be able to get baptismal approval. Right. But the fact of it is, is that. They are different, and if they weren't different, they wouldn't be different outcomes. If they were, if they were this, if they really are essentially the same, and it doesn't matter, and it's not different, oh, then no, they would no, be the same outcome. No, no, there's a difference between the two. No, there definitely is, but right. the which is not informed in the council. Which I think that's Bishop Shaw. I'm not saying that this is he might miss it for something, but it, it just seems like this council was just taken super lightly. It doesn't seem like like it was. I, I wasn't aware of what was what the outcome meant of withdrawal of membership until after the fact. I read it in the handbook, and then 
you know, said that the bishop will explain that these are the, this is what a withdrawal of membership means. So that the, the you felt like we didn't explain that? We, it wasn't explained at all. The you withdrawal, just said the, the withdrawal same of thing? membership, you said we were recommending a withdrawal of membership, but that was it. There was, there was no explanation of what that meant. And I didn't really know the difference between the two and I, until I actually went and read it. So um, when we talked about it, Brendan, you were saying, isn't that the same as excommunication? Right. You yeah. remember asking that in the meeting? Be yeah, because traditionally it used to be But then you also say, oh, we don't use that word anymore because we don't apply the same rest restriction as excommunication anymore. So sure. now membership withdrawal, you said that, oh, it's mean we only take out the record. Like that's, we don't really have any like restriction. So, um, actually, what we were talking about, as you said, is it the same thing as excommunication? I said, that's the, uh, is, you know, a word that was previously used. We don't use that term anymore. Um, sometimes in other churches, excommunication had other implications as now it's a withdrawal of membership. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that was, um, again, I'm still surprised by this whole thing, and I told you this during our membership council, um, I get this sense of, of anger towards the church. Um, and it's not just with this, it's um, so, in, in the conversations that we had, so the one we had, again, two or three years ago, whenever that was, um, I was- Okay, pause before he goes on a ramble again. He, he's, gonna, he's gonna go for a couple um, minutes. Um, right. Ooh. So here he's trying to paint this. At, you know, he says, we can tell that you're very angry with the church. The majority of our anger and frustration to where we feel persecuted is not coming from the church. It's, it's coming from them and it's coming from the inconsistencies and the confusion and the lack of admittance to them doing this horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And, and so like he, he's, he, for, throughout the rest of this conversation, they're going to try to characterize our hostility as, oh, it's not us that it's like, they're even trying to make themselves seem like it's, it's not, we're not causing this. You're just angry at the church. Which is not the case. It's it's all the interactions, and the reason why we came to that meeting was to clarify everything. Isn't that? So. Yeah, I think that helps them to say that. Oh, you're you're being hostile towards your church. Saying that over, making it as seems that we are targeting the church. Yeah, and that can and that in and of itself is apostasy, apostasy. Which no, that's not what it was about at all. Yeah. So, anyway. yeah, continue. All right. I heard that you had some comments and, and maybe there was nothing on any public forum that you were opposed to the church and specifically angry about the way um, people of the LGBTQ community have been treated by the church. When we had our membership council and you read through your letter, um, you're kind of going after President Oaks, President Nelson, um, President Kimball. Um, and that's one where um, I completely respect your ability to be um, a gay person, right? I, I respect your ability to be gay and married. That is 100% your choice. I even respect your ability to um, be angry with the church, right? That's part of the free speech that happens in America. In saying that, you can't necessarily do both and maintain good standing in the church. As a bishop, if I were to be critical of President Nelson and President Oaks and, and President Kimball, um, I imagine that I would be called in to meet with um, and depending on kind of the circumstances of everything, there is a good possibility. So um, I can be excommunicated just the same as anybody else can, right? I can have my membership withdrawn. The same but as not, that's else. not the case with Brennan because that's not apostasy. Even if he said to you directly that he disagreed, this is not, he's not defaming the church because you explained a little bit of apostasy in the phone call, saying that if you trying to defame the church to make the church image look bad publicly, we're just trying to express the reason why it's so confusing. It's always been confusing with church leaders, you know, with the prophets and even with the membership council. And we're talking to both of you. That's why we're here. It's like, it's always been like this. Why can't you just admit that you made a mistake? You know, why do you admit that, you know, this whole thing has been kind of a mistake, but you you kind of just kind of say, like, because you said it's because of same-sex marriage, and you said it should not happen just based on same-sex marriage. Is that correct? Yeah, when it comes to same-sex marriage, it's, it, you would treat it the exact same way you would treat heterosexual sin. 
it's exactly the same. So it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have a membership council. You could easily have that in the exact same. It depends on what happens in that disciplinary council. It's what we used to call it, now membership council. So if we have a man, just, just for a moment, if you have a man and a woman mm -hmm. and they're married and this gentleman goes out and steps out on his wife. We're going to start cycling back through members, things. They're, yeah. they're not even temple going. They're members of the church. Okay. Man steps out. We would discuss that between me and the bishop, and that individual would be brought into a bishop's council, potentially a state council, um, and that meeting would be held based on the fact that, hey, there's a covenant relationship here. You you cannot do this. You cannot step outside your marriage, and that's one of the ways that we would do that. We the same would be true. It'd be exactly the same. You feel like the homosexual sin is weighted heavier in the church than heterosexual sin. I think is what you're inferring, right? That's what, true, but this well, is not what we're talking okay. about, though. No. What What about my situation was such that it would call membership council if it is truly treated equally, and you said that a, a same-sex marriage in and of itself is not a reason to hold a membership council, why would the membership council have been conducted or approved? What What else about my situation would have made you feel to... I don't approve the council. If it, would be, if it would be approved, it would be because of your position as it relates to the church, your thoughts and feelings and expressions towards the church, whether that you say public and we can parse words on public. With I think that it's, it's it's very clear in the handbook to say what public apostasy is. means when it comes to position against the church. Because you can privately disagree and you can still pray, but you don't get a membership council we just express it direct and to you as leader of a church we don't say it like like go out in the street and hold signs and tell everyone to leave the church we're just quietly living our lives and only because you ask for it we say what we think but that has nothing to do with what it stated in the church handbook and we don't like before this point there's there's more of a neutral stance with the church because brendan's family is still very active. Is your family active? No, my family is not a member of the church. Okay. So, so I don't really care. Like, you know, like, but like, I'm just feeling, again, living our own life and feeling like all of a sudden get ambushed by these two men with a letter to call to this council. And so I think that kind of brought of like, okay, like might as well go because they go all the way out of their state boundary to call for us. Might as well, you know, be to stay on mind. Going through all the steps. And... But this does not constitute a posse enough, according to my understanding, if you can clarify my understanding, to help a membership to to be, you know, like deemed as apostate, apostate, and then, you know, to be, you know, having a membership withdrawal. Because these are just explaining why we think same-sex marriage should not be a thing to be persecuted like that whole letter is like why are you persecuting us when the prophet's disagreeing on what you should or how you should treat same-sex people so you you would both say that you support the first presidency of the church i wouldn't say that now look how which which one the thing is which one am i supporting because <laughs> one say this thing and the other say completely opposite thing so like we support something they say for sure but like which one at which time by the way because some like at certain time, this president would say one thing, and the different time, this president would say a different thing. Or, even, different or, even, or even ten years later, the same person will say a different thing. So, like when you say support a person, like at what time, at what point in time are we supporting this person? Because I definitely still support some of their saying. Like I still su I, subscribe to their like Instagram and stuff. And sometimes they say amazing things, and then like two weeks later, they say really, really upsetting things. So. Is, you know? the most, and the, is the most upsetting things they say all centered on the LGBT? Community? A lot, very heavily okay. on yeah, LGBT. The majority of them. Yeah. What? And I said the majority of them, and that's kind of what I was compiling there, is just a, a history of kind of the, the contradictions that the church has made regarding their teachings of um, topics of LGBTQ basis. So, yeah. what? so if, I can, if I can recap what I'm hearing, he starts out by saying there's no difference between a heterosexual couple who are having sex outside of marriage and a same sex couple having sex, even if they're married outside of legitimate heterosexual marriage, they're both equal. 
and they're both sins and they're both susceptible to disciplinary counsels. And then your response is, yes, but you're not enforcing the law equally. You're basically letting mm-hmm. all those people mm-hmm. alone and you're hunting after us. And yeah. then, then, and so then instead of just saying yes, then they're saying, but wait, once we called you to a disciplinary council, you said this, that, or the other thing about your beliefs. And that's what, that's why we're holding a disciplinary council. Mm -hmm. And then your response is, but wait, that's not apostasy for us. When you, when we're asked to answer your questions in a private meeting about what our beliefs are or aren't. And there's a side note to that because also then they're saying, but wait, you criticize the Lord's anointed by saying you didn't, you didn't like what past prophets or revelators have said. Right, right, right. And I'm going to say, I'm calling BS on that one because that's not what you did. What you did was simply read their awful, horrific statements, show the, show how horrific they were and show that they contradicted each other and you never actually weighed in. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to just like, now I'm sure he's going to ask some new question that's taking it in a totally different direction. And it's clear that they're hunting for a reason to justify because they, their because they don't want mm-hmm. to just flat out say, we came after you because you got same sex marriage. And is anybody else confused about the way they're justifying this homosexual relationship and heterosexual relationships will be treated the same way? They flat out come out and say, the reason why you are in this council is because of your homosexual relationship. It's like the heterosexuals who cheat on each other, who go outside the bonds of marriage. Yeah, and, exactly. and like, but that's not our situation. So they it's are infidelity. Not it, it's infidelity. I, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting trying for them. to equate it with them. It's like the alcohol. It's like coffee, tea, dr- drug addiction, infidelity. They're awful bad analogies, right? And, and and I'm just waiting for them to start pushing saying, okay, Brennan, when was the last time you cheated on your husband? When that's the reason, because we know the, it, it, this makes no sense. I know sense. They're, they're trying to bring another topic. It's exactly to what shy away from yeah. them. Um, and, and treating these two homosexual relationships and heterosexual relationships in the same way is not comparing an apple to a Volkswagen. Yeah. That's what they're doing. They're yeah, saying your, right. your right. legal lawful marriage is just like the heterosexual couple who cheats cheating on, on each other, who cheats on each other. Don't you see right, that? It's worse. You are an idiot for not seeing that because we see it clearly. Well, it they're, makes they're, no it, sense. they're trying to, they're, they're using two different ones. They're talking about, um, they're talking about single heterosexuals having sex and they're also talking about infidelity. It's because he's interchanging those at different times, exactly. right? Exactly. And I think yeah. let's be honest, the church is these two particular leaders, for example, are not understanding that you or not willing to acknowledge that your marriage is legal. They're doing everything in their power to prove to you and to themselves that your marriage is invalid. What did what was it, Perry or Packer or one of them that said a counterfeit marriage? That's what you have. You have a counterfeit marriage, and we cannot believe for a moment that it is a, it's a valid marriage. Therefore, you have to be bundled in the same group of of people who, who swing, who cheat, who are non-monogamous, who are polyamorous, who well, are polygamous, or whatever. Just daily hookups with yeah. whoever. Yep. Not that, you know, just not throw that in the adjective. Anyone. Yep, exactly right. Or are we going to say something? Yeah. I think, and then we're missing the biggest point, which is that the stake president has told them that same-sex marriage in and of itself is not a reason to hold exactly. a disciplinary yeah, council. I, yeah. He said that multiple, multiple times during the previous phone call. And the only reason and, why he's trying to pursue this is because he thinks that we're apostatizing. Right. That's it. Because he's because Bishop has convinced him that the I, I that didn't just read. do it on same-sex marriage. Yeah. He's, you know, he's handling that part of it, and he's like, I'm doing it also because they're apostatizing. That's why. And so, and so like, it's fitting, it's fitting his narrative yeah. still. Cause you asked him, you asked him, and probably we, I mean, we played it in the recording. You asked him, didn't you say that same sex marriage in and of itself is not a reason to hold a disciplinary council? And he says, yes. And he says, so why would be the reason for us to be called? And he's like, well, it would be because of your feelings and, and your thoughts you and the things yeah. you said about the church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's and, and and then it goes back to what you were saying. Right, like, that's not the reason. Apostasy, yeah. That's not the reason why I was called. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They're just trying to juggle in their mind like what is making sense. Yeah. And then just any reason that they can feel justified in doing this. Yeah. So. All right. Let's see what they have next. 
um, what are you guys wanting to do here? I mean, I really I mean, is that literally like the 12th time? <laughs> is that not the 12th time you've been asked Round this? four, round four. I'm serious. Like, I feel like we're playing the same clip over and, and over again. And we tell again. him every I keep single looking at the time. time. Code. I look at the time code like, wait, am I, did I actually replay? And I'm not replaying. They're literally, they've asked that question like eight times. I, They're I, not taking our answer. I think for the record, we should, it was John that said, we're just going to play this through. We're not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> and he's the one that continues to stop. Well, you guys vetoed that. So yeah. Yes, I did I veto that. I did veto I'm following your lead. Gosh darn it. I love it. Okay, keep out. He keeps he keeps going back there. So I wonder how this is gonna get be different. I don't know if I believe in divine design. I do. I believe there's a reason we're sitting in this room together. I believe there's a reason that you called and you're sitting here. So because what, I scheduled you, what is the outcome you're wanting? You're a, I know you feel strongly that you we persecuted. So I, I want you to know a couple of things I'm going to do this week is I have not read this letter. I will read this letter cover to cover, and I will send this tomorrow morning to the First Presidency and say, hey, had a chance to meet them. I'll put a cover letter over the top of the bishop and I and just say, I just want you to know we had this discussion. And there was feeling, strong feelings that we hunted them down. You know what I mean? A witch hunter. I'll use the term you used. I don't want to put words in your mouth. And I'll send that on the First Presidency. I'll do that by the time I hit the pillow tomorrow night. But then the First Presidency can weigh in. You thought I'm saying and say, no x y and z or based on the letter etc cetera, etc cetera. i don't mind doing that if that's helpful to you guys but what do you want what are the outcomes you're after okay pause pause our, inten our, our, our intention for <laughs> so he's this is the first time get clarification and get this he's is, literally asking again is, what is your objectives thing. are he's asking the same thing but this is the first time that he's brought up the first presidency this this is when he's like okay um i'm pretty sure we haven't done anything wrong so I'm going to send this to the first presidency in hopes that they can get back to us and tell us what we've done wrong. That's basically what he's saying. He wants to send this off to the president and get guidance is what he says. And let's just so. reverse here for a second because your membership withdrawal, your excommunication is not even official at this point. Mm -hmm. And so he wouldn't be sending this to the first presidency for, for clarification or right. for an mm. appeal because the, the state president has not issued to you in writing a letter of your formal excommunication. Nothing's he, happened yet. That's so exactly right. So I, that's what makes me even more concerned. Like, why would he be sending anything to the first presidency so is he basically saying he's gonna he's gonna decide that you should have your membership withdrawn and he's gonna you know leave it to the first presidency to you know for mm -hmm. the for the appeal is he basically saying i'm gonna i'm gonna rule your apostates i'm gonna rule that your membership should be dissolved and we'll just see not really if because, on appeal not really because he said he said also that he has he hasn't read the statement the bishop made him think that the statement that he read had things about other stuff, about church history, about Book of Mormon, about other stuff. So and, that's and what the state president, the name of the church. Yeah, and that's what the state president is thinking. The reality is that the document doesn't contain any of those things. So what the state president and they said that they said this document is just about LGBT issues. And that's when he goes and says, well, I haven't read it. So what I'm going to do is attach it tomorrow and send it to the state to the first presidency and tell us if this is basically apostasy or not. Which yeah. we all know yeah. that doesn't happen because there's a line of authority. Oh, that 100%. Happens. And so the stake president doesn't just appeal directly to the first presidency. The stake president's responsibility is to then his area authority. That area, area authority goes to the presidency of the 70 and the 70 can take it up to the first presidency. Yeah. Clearly, I, I know this as a lay member of the former lay mayor, member of the church and this stake president knows his chain of authority as well. I think this is just a ruse. This is something where he's saying, I am, I am behind you. I am going to mm -hmm. fight for you even if i have to go right to the, the first presidency i'll do it. and that's not happening i should just say maven in the show notes let's add my recording of my interactions with my stake president and bishop because it, it's very rem reminiscent of that for me also sam pinson's in the chat sam pinson and his family recorded their disciplinary council as well this is all just the same old thing of these leaders not knowing what they're doing, trying to justify and, and deceive why they're making the decisions they're making. I just want to let you all know we have other examples so you know that this is not unique. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, also, shout out to Sam Pinson. He, we went to college together and I've been talking to him about this the whole time and he told me about his scenario. Um, he was actually one of my students. Um, at Boise State because I, I taught a couple of classes and so is that the um, son the son mm -hmm. okay yeah of, of I think the dad's former Bishop Pinson oh, okay mm -hmm. okay oh. yeah and so um, anyway 
Yeah, shout out He's, to the Pinsons. Yeah. Yeah, we've got, other, we've got other examples. All right, let's keep going. Answers to the, the questions that I sent you yeah. um, because of the contradictions that we've seen thus far since receiving the letter. Beyond, um, beyond the questions, though, I mean, like I'm saying, like, for, like I said, we brought on the job. I mean, are you wanting to come to church? The, the the outcome is just we want to make sure we clarify an understanding of <laughs> if, it's, if, it doesn't matter if, anything uh, about the church it's like if you wanted to know if i wanted to go to church or not why was i not asked about that in the past four years i wasn't i was called for membership council because i was married to doug if you if you really wanted to figure out where the course of action was from this meeting and then if it was to go to church or um, to remove my records or whatever it may have been to see if I want to resign, then I, that I would have been approached about that, but I wasn't, I was, I was sought out for that, the, uh, the membership council, not for a resignation, not because I wanted to see, because somebody wanted to see if I wanted to go back to church, the, to, the, the, to the, the first means? contact that I've had in, in three years since we had last talked was a membership council. And a letter and that's it do you think that's treated fairly amongst like because bishop said like if someone's inactive we would come and try to visit them we try visit to talk every about inactive, we visit every inactive person in our work not yeah. brendan first right go because off brendan just go get off. the letter well, let me first. challenge too if you hear you have a bishop that reached out to another bishop your records don't get in that ward you follow what i'm saying which cascades a lot of other things Bishop, I, maybe you feel differently, Brennan. You, you said it on the phone. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but how much you would appreciate Bishop. You said, hey, President, you had to set him up to come and get me because Bishop would have never done that on his own, I believe is kind of the words you use. President, you had to force him because Bishop knows and loves me. That's clearly not the case at all, and Bishop can tell you that. It's it's not what yeah, you the way Yeah, you definitely, not a, definitely not. A, um, I'm not sure if forcing was the word used, but, what, but, but originally when we had the membership council, I asked Bain, um, because it, it didn't make sense in my mind that I was being called to the council out of nowhere. Like it, it with our past relationship and it not being required to have a membership council for same-sex marriage, it, it didn't make sense in my mind that he, uh, what, that it was, that the membership was being called without some instruction being received. And so I asked him, did you receive some kind of instruction for this council to occur because it didn't make sense if it was coming from him and that's why i called you but then you told me that um no instruction is ever given we don't, we don't give like from a state perspective bishop and i would discuss all of those things the bishop would bring something we would perfectly consider an outcome right and it could be a state council or it can be at a state level excuse me or it could be at a bishop's level you follow what i'm saying so yeah the idea of Hey, I've been going to bed for two years thinking, Brennan, I've got Brennan Porter. I'm going to find him. I'm going to hunt him down. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, to be honest with you, Brennan, I don't think I've even seen you. I mean, you and I knew each other briefly, but it's not like we. I, I would I would hope that that wasn't the intention. But if this has been in the works for a year now, maybe we're sleeping about it, so, you know, going to bed thinking about it for a year's time. Well, if this was but, really... but if you could just give us a small little carve out in that small little thing called COVID has been a little bit challenging on the church <laughs> level. I hope you appreciate it as well. Yeah. I mean, meeting, not meeting, changing zoom. I mean, it's, that's been challenging. I'm not making an excuse, but right. you'd appreciate so, it. I've got a whole, I got a whole email. I got a whole folder full of emails letting people let me know what an idiot I am about mass and everything else. I can send those to you as well. If you'd like them. Right. Um, sorry. So, can I, go I, just have I had just coming back to what I asked you, this, this is why all of this has been, we're coming back again and again for this, is because we still think it's very unfair that out of nowhere, I mean, he just said that he got sought out for a membership letter, so, you know, like straight out yeah. without any prior contact. That just kind of stumped us a little bit. Yeah. Can I, I'm going to ask you two questions. First of all, I just noticed you're recording us. Um, you probably recorded our first meeting too. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, even as, after we had the conversation about recording? No, we I, I recorded the council because that's why I want, because right. when we keep thinking back, like this doesn't make sense. Sure. That's just, sure. that's a little bit disappointing, honestly. Oh, pause. I mean, and honestly, in fairness to us, I think you would say, hey, we're recording. That's okay, though. I have no problem. Let's put that Whatever, in the mark. first place. All right, so that's busted. They found out. Bum, bum, bum. We've uh, been recording it. <laughs> <laughs> how'd, they, how'd they see? 
Okay, so the bishop sit like next to Brendan, and Brendan sits next to me, and I was recording on my Apple Watch. And so when I turn my wrist, it like turns on sometimes, and so like it sees that. It it's saw the red. Is like a little of, red button. You know, like the, the, the with the the square, the red square. It's like oh, currently, you know, going. Yeah. Um, but then I'm like, yeah, I'm recording. Like I'm owning up to it. Like, but that's. Like, you didn't even miss a beat. I was so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's legal um, and it's your right. Uh -huh. And it's for self-protection. And they have they should have nothing to hide. The reason mm -hmm. it's saying that they're disappointed in you, like why? If they're on exactly. the Lord's errand, what do they have to be ashamed of? And, uh, and disappointed about. And I was and I was thinking this the whole time. You, that that they really think after everything that we've been through, after all the conversations and after like all the gaslighting and hurtful things that have been done that we are going to care what they think yeah that we're going to care that they're disappointed or like man this is just so sad that you would do that they 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 really think in their right mind that 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 we are caring about their feelings about what we're doing because we're just trying to protect ourselves well, and so ultimately, this but this now becomes a protection of them, their their character, their good name, and all the things uh, on their own. So now they're going to fold like a lawn chair. They're not going to want to interact or engage because they could now be held accountable. And, right. And we now can't, they know they're being recorded. We can't be held accountable. I mean, what if people found out about what we're talking about mm -hmm. behind these closed doors? What what could come of it? Mm -hmm. And that really is a tell for why they're not just owning up to excommunicating you. For for being same-sex married correct yeah that, i mean because they just they're worried about the image mm -hmm. and the the disappointment in your recording is just more evidence that they just don't want the truth to be out there but they raise don't your want hand to if you're surprised are you are, is anyone yeah, here in this no. room surprised anyone on the chat surprised that the church is worried about their image over the actual person or the yeah or the truth or allegiance to the truth right? i'm not seeing any hands raised yeah yeah. Chat, chat. No, still not there either. All right. So now let's see how they engage you after they're disappointed with you. The second thing is, say that um, again. Huh? What'd you say? I said, whatever your personal feelings may be, um, recording in the state of Idaho, it's a it's a one party state where. Sure, it's legal. It's just, oh no, we don't, no, we said it was illegal. I didn't say it was illegal. Right, right. I'm I don't know why you just wanted, but I just have the experience many times where I feel gaslighted in these meetings, and a lot of the times you don't because sometimes you put in the that, hot seat and you feel like, oh, I'm receiving so much care, but in fact, it's just like, like oh, the, the thinking again that does not make sense. Yeah, you know. So, um, I told you that I don't really deal in hearsay, right? So. If I hear something, I will confirm it. When I heard that you were engaged in um, same gender, um, you know, attraction, the same gender relationships, that's when we met. And that was in, I don't remember how many years ago, but when we first talked, I bring you in and you tell me yourself. Um, that's three years ago. That's not same sex marriage, though. I, I understand that. Right. What I'm telling you, though, is then later when I heard that you were in a same sex marriage and um, that you'd said some comments. And again, I don't, I don't check those comments um, that were very pro same sex marriage, and that you were against the church in some of these. I bring you in, and what do you do? The wait, wait do a minute, minute. foul, oh, foul. <laughs> so now, <laughs> what did you say? So what? now he is. First just... of all, he doesn't even remember what he looked at. But second of all, he's claiming that you criticize the church publicly he is making publicly he should make it that make it shit up like he just made shit up and it's the it's the whole basis for the claim of apostasy it's not mm -hmm. trivial right it's mm -hmm. like were you publicly teaching false doctrine or criticizing the brethren or not it's not like well you said some stuff i don't remember but when yeah, you did no never say anything. Shots, no proof, which is necessary for a membership council on apostasy to occur. You need everything. You need the proof for it. Don't but they usually nothing. print the actual stuff? Oh, they've all usually got a big file. The Strength in the Church Member Committee sends the bishop or stake president a big old file with like printouts of all the mm -hmm. all the church spies throughout the church who are spying on members to see what they post on social media. They print that out. They put it in their folder. They send it to the bishop, and the bishop has the evidence right there. The fact that they didn't have that there, and that exist. he couldn't even remember, 
what he had read, but that's supposed to be the basis of the grounds for apostasy. And for holding this membership council, proves, everything proves yeah. that, that they started with, with same sex marriage is the only, is the only reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, they keep saying, because the bishop is like, I don't remember what you said, but I remember it's being like very pro same sex marriage <laughs> and it was very against the church. Yeah. I'm just wondering if these, uh, this bishop and stake president forgot about elder Christofferson's monumental discussion with Peggy uh, Fletcher Stack uh, right. uh, concerning the gay marriages we have. And this is a direct verbatim from an apostle of the church. We have individual members in the church with a variety of different opinions, beliefs, and positions on these issues and others. In our view, it doesn't really become a problem unless someone is out attacking the church and its leaders and that it's deliberate and it's persistent and is trying to get others to follow them, trying to show to draw others away, trying to pull people, if you will, out of the church or away from its doctrines and teachings. Didn't you just basically say we're married? We're married. I mean, yes, that that's it. The post was we're married. That's it. You just Nothing said about married. the church. Nothing about the church. Yep. I mean, there's pictures of us holding hands. That was, I mean, yeah. that was to promote. If, <laughs> it was to promoting of. <laughs> if 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 posting about being married to your same sex partner equals apostasy, then we need to have a whole other discussion. It doesn't because, it, again, in the same interview, an LDS apostle, Elder Christofferson, reaffirmed Mormons, and this is when we could use the word before Satan started counting victories. Mormons who support gay marriage are not in danger of losing their temple privileges or church membership. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that's a, he just, they just completely, he made it up, made that up. That's totally. bad. That's yeah. super bad because and we're, we're going to catch him on it right now. Again, it's because it's the grounds. So for, how many, how many apostasy. strikes do you need? Like bishops that were not contacted, stake presidents that were not contacted, making up stuff about public uh, opposition against the church. I promise you, if Maury Povich was here, these men were not the father. Say, say, <laughs> saying that his statement that he read during the council was about uh, Apostasy. about apostatizing and mischaracterizing and, yeah. um, leaders of the church. Like yeah. how many lies does this bishop uh, is going to tell? Yeah. Yep. Lying for the Lord. Yeah, it's bad. Okay, let's hear it. Go ahead and read the letter. I don't think it's very supportive of the church's stance by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I don't think you, you know, as you were reading that to us in our first council, there wasn't any question in my mind um, by the end of it that you don't really believe the church is inspired. Um, doesn't sound like you have any interest in being a member of the church. Um, I was actually surprised that it was upsetting to you at all. Or um, As far as sending the letter, um, I know that's not the personal way to do it in having the conversation of um, I'm engaged in a same sex marriage. I'm opposed to the church's teachings about it. Then there's always the possibility in that conversation that someone's membership can be called into question. And if it is, if there's any possibility of that, you have to do things by the book and by the book is I know it's informal. I'm sorry that it's informal. Um, I would much rather just have a conversation with you too. I have to send a letter and it's supposed to be sent with two people that hand deliver it or you send it by certified mail. All of those things are directly out of the hand. Right. You guys exactly. have been, been reading it. And so I know it's impersonal. I'm sorry that it's impersonal. I, um, again, that's, that's one that, um, you know, I, I wish it weren't that way in saying that that's, that's kind of the way that it is. If there's any possibility that someone's membership can be called into question. Um, and uh, so because didn't you say you want to talk to them first before you send out a letter and if they if you're confirmed because you said you don't work in hearsay you know but you <laughs> immediately you send a letter without confirming it with brennan or making sure that no first you only heard actually about what he believes after the fact of the letter so that you know or even heard you know heard that i was in a same-sex relationship or in this case a same-sex marriage um which doesn't make sense either because no one would have known that we were in a same-sex marriage we weren't even public about being married until january 19th of this year so it doesn't make sense that you would have been able to know that we were married in june of last year if we hadn't even the only pr the only people who knew in june of last year was my parents my parents and some of my friends so unless my mom told you that I was saying so smart, which I am very sure that she would have not. Um, yeah, I, I think you're still kind of 
confusing what we're actually talking about. The reason that you get a letter it's instead a of a phone call is if someone is engaged in activity that's against the standards of the church, and there's a possibility that their membership could be called into question, then you have to do a membership council. If you had come to the membership council and you said, Bishop, what you're saying is completely wrong. I'm not in any sort of a same gender relationship. I don't have any problems with the church's standards. Um, you know, when we talk about the three potential outcomes of a membership council, at the end of that, there's a good chance that we'd be saying remains in good standing, right? There's, there is no issue. Um, and those do happen with membership councils. If you said, you know, Bishop, I do have um, same gender attraction issues. I, I have engaged in some of these things. I still think that the, you know, the leadership of the church, I still have a testimony that it's inspired. Um, you know, I still want to be a member of the church. Then likely it would be, you know, probably a formal um, restriction of membership. Um, but when we had that council, you came in and um, you seemed, again, you seem really angry about it, but not, not only that, it's one where um, I don't want you to feel angry. I don't even, um, I think that maybe you see me or President Potter as an enemy. I don't feel that way towards you, Brennan. I think you're a wonderful person. I understand you have a lifestyle that comes to an impasse with the standards of the church. Um, and in seeing that, it's one where you just say, hey, I don't really believe in the standards of the church. And and that is 100% you're right. That's one where um, early on when you ask, hey, can I, can I have Doug come and be with me? I actually wanted you to be there, Doug, because I don't want you to feel like you're alone. Brandon. I don't want you to feel like I'm getting grilled. Um, I actually was hoping it to be a supportive environment where you feel like, you know, I, I'm not alone. I'm not, I'm not being hammered here, right? Um, in saying that, I, I'm still, um, the only thing that I find surprising in this whole thing is, um, on the one hand, it seems like you argue saying, hey, I really am opposed to having my, my membership withdrawn. Yet, on the flip side, it seems like you have no interest in being a member of the church. That's the one that, that I don't really understand. Again, um, I have lots of coworkers, a lot of friends that are homosexual, and I consider them great people. I have no problem. And alcoholics. If they want to be a member of the church, yeah, they have to change, right? Just like my friends and colleagues that drink alcohol, um, I have no problem with them drinking alcohol or engaging in any of those things. If you want to be a member of the church, back to alcohol, yeah, you have to change. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not one of persecution of, hey, are you persecuting me because I'm gay and I'm in a gay relationship? The answer to that is no. Um, but you do have a lifestyle that is at an impasse with with the church. <laughs> what the? No, but yes. Which, yes, words. that was totally, that was totally no, but yes. That was totally, it's not that we're persecuting you on a witch hunt for being same-sex married. It's that you're living in a lifestyle that's incompatible with the gospel of the Church of Jesus Christ. Tomato, tomato. We don't, we don't like the way you sex. <laughs> But we're not going to say that. It's not that we don't like the way that you sex. It's that we don't like the way that you sex. Yes. <laughs> because right. you probably sex with coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's still not understanding. And he's just unwilling he to has, admit. He, he's a doctor. He understands. He's, I think, I mean, is there a other conclusion that he's like purposely deflecting the questions? Yeah. Someone just made that exact comment. Is I'm sorry this uh, this sounds mean, but I know this bishop is a moron, but I never want to be in his ER. This is so sad on very, very uh, many levels, which is completely true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We are literally just going around and around and around. Same sex relationship. Right. But I think the thing that's so sad about sitting here today is that I think about the efforts we've done to as a state, like with Tom Christopherson and those things. I mean, I think we've tried our very best to try to understand a very difficult situation. We've been very prayerful about it. We've, I feel like we've tried our best to try to understand, be um, um, be empathetic. You know, I mean, try to try to try to understand this at a global scale. I, I think Tom's a wonderful human being. Tom's been fantastic. He's been a great resource. I mean, you're not the only ones that are in the circumstance. You follow what I'm saying? So I, we we do want to be understanding. We do want to be empathetic, but. So Tom Christopherson is a dear friend of mine. I love the guy. He's been really good to me and my family. 
Do you have any, like, is he basically saying we had Tom Christopherson here for a fireside, so our stake checked the box of being LGBT, doing our best to love LGBT people? Like, or are there other things Tom did with his stake that he's referring to? They did have a fireside. There the was stake. a fireside. I was there. Yeah, we were there. So yeah. a fireside. Mm -hmm. Is yes. that is there anything that's, else? That's all that I know of, because I was out of the ward at that time. But my mom was like, Tom Christopherson speaking. You should you know, come and look. It's like, this is horrible, because we've done all this work by having Tom Christopherson at one fireside. And, <laughs> and now, now it's all being happening. ruined. <laughs> <laughs> this is all being ruined. And this is not the first time he, he uses it on the phone conversation as well. The Tom Christopherson card. Because Tom, Tom's brother is an apostle. He yeah. brings this up. Just so you know, like we have this connection. <laughs> this is back to our earlier conversation about having a gay friend yeah. or a black friend because I know someone. Tom Christopherson's the gay friend. That's exactly <laughs> yeah, the, the token gay. It's like Not that I the church is gay friend. He's yeah. saying we're sad we're excommunicating you because we had Tom Christopherson for a fireside. And so this is just a tragedy. I know. It's, it's all come it's, to this. It's all gone it's come to nothing. To this. <laughs> it's come to this. Sorry, Tom. I know. I apologize too on behalf of Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, your your work is all wasted, Tom, because anyway. Tom, we love you. Well, joking. clearly, if Tom would have been followed if, well, back to our Spencer W. Kimball discussion, mm -hmm. if t apparently Tom's knuckles weren't bleeding, he wasn't doing good enough because obviously the stake failed. So if he would have tried just a little bit harder, the stake would have been, or you two as the same gendered oh. married couple, uh, if you would have just done a little bit better. But having one gay dude to your stake to give a fireside, <laughs> is that doing a lot of work? No. I don't think that's doing a lot of work. No, it's not. What would be a lot of work? Like having monthly like trainings, having developing a curriculum, or, training all the bishops. I have another idea. <laughs> Leaving inactive same-sex couples alone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or training your bishops to stake presidents so they're competent <sighs> and all on the same page when they decide to hold the disciplinary council. Actually having clear <laughs> instruction about what to do for gay written. Same, yeah, written. Yeah, not just leaving it to not just leaving it up to the bishops and the stake presidents. Yeah. actually having clear instructions yeah. for them. Well, and we know issue. what happens when you are gay and then you do run the circuit and then you actually come out as saying, I'm in a relationship with another man. And then the church cancels you. Yeah. Which is book number two, Charlie Bird. Because that at that point, you're not allowed an opportunity to even speak at these events again. So um, that's probably that's a downfall to the Mormon church. They're losing an opportunity to better understand the LGBTQ experiences because they're canceling and they're they're getting rid of the voices that are out there trying to help them navigate and better understand this topic. I think it is a little interesting that uh, and maybe even methodical that they bring up a Tom Christopherson and not a Charlie Bird or <laughs> someone else, but that that's just, I, we're not, not going to, we're not going to wager. And Lolly, in, Josh and Lolly weed. Yeah, we're going to wager in hearsay here because we are Dave know Matheson. They didn't bring up Dave <laughs> Matheson or Josh and Lolly weed. Like also, I, I, I know Tom is sincere and he cares and he works really hard, yeah. but, but basically he, they're using him like a checkbox. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, we've done our work. We as, had Tom, a, we had Tom defense. for the fireside. Yeah. We did our work. Yeah. 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 And that's not, that's an insult to Tom and to the work. Sorry, Tom. All right. Let's keep going. I just feel bad. I feel bad that this has caused such a problem and such a concern in your lives. I have no problem taking this to the first presidency. It would be very easy for me. Um, and I don't know, Bishop brought up a good point. When you came to the membership council, keep in mind, I've not read this yet. So when I read this, I mean, does this type of letter, you follow what I'm saying, end up factoring into a decision that's made by a bishopric? You follow what I'm saying? So I need to read this to understand what the position is, because what Bishop is saying is exactly right. Depending on what is discussed, I mean, that can have an, in an outcome that can affect the outcome of that discussion for sure. There's no question. Um, and again, the letter, the letter has nothing to do with anything. I think because it does there's not nothing the in the decision. letter. There's nothing in the letter that would constitute apostasy. Apostasy is we, we've said this already 10 times now, open opposition, repeated open opposition to the church publicly. So it's a red herring what you said in your letter, in your disciplinary. The council. bishop and stake president could have saved our, we could have all saved ourselves another hour and a half if he would have just spent 10 minutes and read the letter yeah. and then said, oh my gosh, like what is in this letter? Where's the second or third page? Where's still the wouldn't page? qualify for apostasy yeah. even if he had read it. I right. agreed. Yeah. But I'm no judge in Israel. All right. With the outcome. Oh, sorry. 
we kind of came home and talked he's, and he's fine with like he said he was gonna read it at the beginning when when you handed him the letter he said you he know, said i'm, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna read, read it, it as we're going along. as we're going along for some reason once you start explaining what it was in there he decided to not read it and rather just he was he wait. was turning pages over and he was looking through and yeah so he he, he, he was skimming it yeah, yeah. He was skimming but it. i i feel like he as reading. he was skimming it or whatever he was and the conversation he's starting to get uh He's, he's starting a sense that nothing sense. in here is a yeah. apostasy. Yeah, that he's in trouble, pretty much. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. The fact that it's being withdrawn, it's just coming back to how it started in the first place. This is where I keep going back to this, but the, we still feel discredited. We still like our feelings were felt. We, you know, we just want to feel like we should admit that this come out of nowhere, that this is, you know, like, we just want to be living our life. Because according to what you said, right, if you're living not according to the church standard, there should be a membership question in place. Is that correct? So anytime we do anything, and, and, and this is, this includes me also, right? If I do something that is not in harmony with the church, um, with the standards of the church, then there is a process. I confess it and I forsake it. Um, as a bishop, I would talk with president. If someone is a member of my ward, they would talk with me. And um, in doing that, sometimes we make decisions that does affect our membership or it can. And if that is the case, so if I came to president and I said, um, I'm having thoughts or feelings that contradict the church. And again, I know that the LGBTQ question right now with you is really hot. So I try to do, let's do some other um, other topic. The second said, I just don't really believe the word of wisdom is inspired, right? Originally, it wasn't a commandment. It was not originally by constraint. That's what it says in the revelation. Um, I don't really want to live it. Um, and I have started to drink alcohol. If I have that conversation with him, there are several outcomes that can happen. Sometimes they can say, are you willing to try? And if the answer is yes, then sometimes they say, well, then, you know, we do kind of an informal restriction of membership. You may say, while you're doing this, you can't go to the temple. You can't do some of these things you would normally do. If um, if I said, I have no interest in trying, and I think that it's uninspired, I think it was a mistake that it was ever outlawed, and I think everyone in the church should be able to drink alcohol, then there's a good chance he would pull me in and say, you really need to have a membership council, because there is a chance that you have formal restrictions or potentially a, a membership, um, have your own membership withdrawn. So in, in this case, again, that's not true. There needs to be public opposition. Well, and that's why he's using his his own example as a bishop, because he knows that the consequences for believing something like that as a bishop, obviously the stakes are much more higher. And he would be being called for a membership council as a bishop for believing the word of wisdom is not inspired. It's just dumb because never in the history of Mormonism that I'm aware of has anyone ever been excommunicated for losing their faith in the word of wisdom. So it's a stupid, dumb hypothetical that is totally irrelevant. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Would the membership council, is it, is it being called because of their conduct regarding alcohol and the word of wisdom, or is it related to their beliefs regarding the church? Is that why this keeps coming up? Because well, it's kind of the same issue in the, in the example I just gave you would be based upon that issue that I have. If I feel like they're not inspired, this is my biggest issue with the word of wisdom. Um, then it's kind of you're asking, is it this one or that one? And the answer is, well, it's both. If I believe that the presidency of the church is inspired, if I believe that we have ongoing revelation and what they ask me to do, I'm going to do all that I can to get my life in harmony with it. Right. The, re the reason why I ask is because a membership council is not going to be called for conduct related to the word of wisdom. For somebody drinking on their own time, a membership council wouldn't be called for that. And that's not a statute for a membership council to even Please. maybe required or is required. Please but apostasy you. and believing that the church is not divinely inspired in their teachings regarding alcohol, and you're publicly spreading that on social media, whatever it may be. That it would doesn't have to be public. That, 
Can I say mm -hmm. the second thing, a nice second example? Based on that, what you said, that means that people who are inactive in the church and join a different church will also be called for a membership council. Is that correct? Sometimes they are. What do you mean sometimes they are? Like, can you clarify when sometimes, like what, what would constitute when they are called? Is it like if they join the Jehovah Witness and they're called and if they join the Catholic and they're not called? Like, what, what do you mean by sometimes they're not called if they're inactive? not going to church. I mean, you still know where they live. Do they, you still come and send them a letter and say, can you have a membership council? No, because you've been inactive in I the think church? The sad thing is right now, Derek and Brilliant, it wouldn't matter what was said, I don't think, right at this moment in time. It, I think that you feel very much feel um, hostile towards us, that somehow we've gone out to hunt you down. I assure you that's not the case. I feel bad you feel that way. I feel like we're asking the same question in a number of different ways. What I want to do is pledge you my commitment. I believe that the First Presidency is inspired. I believe in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. I would just love to take this document with a cover paper and say, here's exactly the process that was followed. Here's the letter. This is the letter in response that was prepared by Brennan. And, and, and let the First Presidency say, what would they like us to do? Um, I just feel like no matter what we say. That's not true, actually. If you say, if you just admit that this is, we, we should have not come out and just send you a letter and we just let you know you the, living the your circum, life the circumstances were not you... such that a council should have been called because we believe that the circumstances were not such that a council should have been called you said that same-sex marriage in and of itself is not a reason for a council to be held and to and this you, point you I've, didn't know about and, his belief until after the council's already happened. and to this point i've made no action against the church that would constitute as apostasy and so to the point of the council in fact because well, we did tell you i can promise you nothing's happened to your membership yet to this moment because it sits in my <laughs> court right now so there's nothing that's happened. oh no the I, got I, a recommendation I, I so. at this moment it's sitting there but i would love to pursue this honestly the first president because i don't want you walking away feeling like bishop and i have an axe to grind we don't guys he just completely ignored what you said. Mm -hmm. He said, nothing they could ever say or do would make you happy. You're just angry and upset at this point as a way to just dismiss you. You said, no, no, no. There, there is, is something, something you very could say. specific you yeah. could say. Mm -hmm. You could admit that you were wrong and you should have never called a disciplinary council in the first place. You said that to him. And then his response was, well, we can punt it to the first presidency and mm -hmm. see what they say. Did he even listen to what you had just said? No. No. Yeah. Yeah, like he's not listening. <laughs> and he's basically saying, you're just angry and there's nothing we could say. Hostile. So we're going to punt the, the, it. This, yeah. the, this is this. <laughs> all right. Ready? We're going to have a class on uh, gaslighting, number one, and how to <laughs> yeah. conduct a meeting like this. Yeah. Don't acknowledge what the person is saying. Don't listen. Don't, don't, don't listen. Yeah. If if they ever ask you a question, that's an opportunity for you to change the topic. Yeah. So you don't you don't have to answer the question that they're asking you. You just ask them another question. Yeah, and say, oh, and you know what I think is sad it. about this. Yeah, whatever it may be. The ask having somebody ask you a question is the perfect opportunity for you to not answer and switch the topic. And then after a hundred times of not answering the question and deflecting say back to them well nothing that nothing that we can say can make you happy exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> right yes yeah, makes no sense yeah okay let's keep going <laughs> i mean look at how many stakes there are in the church of valley how many stakes have had tom christophers come speak bring up tom again <laughs> many i'm sure there's many in the church yeah. valley in boise um actually we went to one actually mm -hmm. when we were here and I would I'm hope sure that Tom Christopherson would not want a membership council to be held on the basis of same-sex marriage alone. Oh, no, yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we, I want you to know that was our commitment from a state perspective to try to understand and better understand you right. saying what do we do and how do we do it. That, that was yeah. our Right. I, 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 I appreciate the citation, happened. and I, I think that Tom Christopherson is a great guy, and I think he's... Uh, I don't know, he has a lot of knowledge that should be shared in the church to a lot of its members, but I don't think that what's happened before, during, and since the council has been in line with what we would describe as um, 
equal treatment and proper conduct of LGBTQ members of the church. And that's our reason for being here is because of that. Um, to get clarification and uh, to clear up all the things that are in our in our opinion are clearly out ill treatment of gay people um, and so hopefully by coming here and talking about these things we can leave here not thinking that but so far i mean you said um that it doesn't seem like anything we've talked about so far has changed that perspective no i just feel like you guys are so frustrated and upset with where <laughs> we're at what i would love to do is take a step back get an opinion from the first presidency of what i'm saying and listen i'll tell you what if, if if we feel like there's a situation where bishop or myself and like hey there's a misstep doug we'd be the very first ones to say hey we're, we apologize we're sorry we're not out here trying to split hairs guys i believe very deeply in the savior i do if i could live in the if i could live in the holy land i'd live there man i just came back a few weeks ago every time i go i feel like i learn more i appreciate more i love the gospel man i do i'm all in i love the gospel and I love the fact that when I turn my life towards the Savior um, and I do my very best to do what the Savior's taught me to do, I find that there's many areas of my life that change. I mean, I go to sacrament every Sunday so I can try to get incrementally better week by week, you know, make mistakes, have a setback. Um, you know, those are the goals of going back to church over and over and over. And that's I, I believe deeply in it. I do. I love the gospel. At one point in time, you guys felt the He's not way, talking right? to us anymore. He's talking to whoever is listening to this. The recording. <laughs> to the first presidency to make sure that, that they know stake That's president true. is a good guy and he's a believing LDS good Mormon priesthood holder. What one of my favorite moments was when he's like, Tom Christopherson, Tom Christopherson. And you're like, oh, well, Tom Christopherson would hate what you guys are doing. Yeah, I, ho I hope Tom like, Christopherson oh. wouldn't know that this is going on. He's like, change subject, change subject. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been to the Holy Land. Yeah. Yeah. I came back he's last He's like, week. I love Jesus. I've been to the Holy Land. Larry, I'm so rich, I get to go to the Holy Land. Yeah. Larry Gelwick could... invited me on a cruise. I went that one time. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and that's a good point. They know they're being recorded by this point, so they're just grand, yeah. they're grandstanding. To you, the, you can tell he's mentioned it, you know, three, four times now. Yeah. That okay, we're going to send this to the the first yeah. presidency. This is his trying closing. He's trying to well to finish. He, you know, it get, he is giving you an answer. Talking. He's saying we don't think we've done anything wrong. Yeah, that's basically it. And he's like, okay, we don't need to talk anymore because I've not, um, we've not done anything wrong. So. Um, for the moment, it looks like we're not going to get anywhere. Let's send it the first presidency. Yeah. That's his answer. All right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's the part that I, that's the part when I was asking, like, from an outcome perspective, you know what I mean? Like, oh, is, no. is your goal to come Please. back and to, to go to church? Is your goal to be able to go to sacrament? That's why I was asking those questions. That was that was what I was getting at. If you think, if you really want to know personally, I don't know about Brandon personally. I just want to go back to my neutral because right now I'm having hostile feeling towards church and church leader. Because that, like I said, before this whole council was even brought up, before this letter, I was perfectly fine, neutral. I'm not going to speak out against the church. I'm not going to share something about like, oh, this this is stupid. This and now we have every so reason you guys to leave the church too. I've never going to share that to anyone. I don't think Brendan ever said that, by the way, but like that i just want to be neutral because like i still think the church is but at this because you said no matter what you said i'm going to be hostile that's not true if you just admit what you do which is kind of unfair then you know i'm happy to like okay like at least now they i just want oh i'd be the first to do it i promise you so I, i'm I, glad you said I, that. I, yeah the the dichotomy here is that i it, it doesn't seem like in either of his opinions that there has been any intention or action made towards us that would constitute as ill treatment or hostile towards us. No, go ahead, Bishop. Yeah. Yeah. No. One thing I would say again, um, Brennan and Doug, both of you, when we talk about membership councils, the reason it was changed, at least this is my interpretation, the reason the name of that was changed from um, a disciplinary hearing to a church council is. Disciplinary I don't know why he brought hearing, this up. Um, yeah, it's like he just opened up the handbook right? and he's like, okay, let's with just start reading council, it to distract uh, from the topic. It's very hand. possible at the end of that, you end up saying, hey, this 
there's there's no grounds for this, right? You remain in good standing. The whole thing is just as if it never happened. The whole whole idea there is specifically to find out that's what we where said. someone sits. There's no grounds for this. Um, it's unnecessary. In so in saying that, if if President Cotter were to send me a letter and say, hey, we need to have a church council, my first thought would be there must have been some misunderstanding. Um, I'd come and say, what's going on? Um, and if there's something I've done that's wrong that I need to change, um, you know, the whole idea is if you identify that for me, President, tell me what it is. Um, what do you think I need to do? And if it's something that, again, that I feel so strong about, no, I'm, I'm absolutely not going to change this, and it comes to a loggerhead, then maybe my my membership gets withdrawn or I get placed on you know, a formal disciplinary, or I'm sorry, a formal restriction. Um, but the whole concept of a church council, I think, again, the thing that you feel so attacked about, uh, Brennan, is just, why are two guys I don't know showing up with a letter? Um, and that's one that, if that, it, it sounds like that really upset you, if that upset you, I'm sorry. That's one that is mandated by by the handbook, if there's any chance that your membership can be called into question, you have to do it this specific way, either certified mail or two people deliver it. Um, and so um, yeah, as far as that being in any personal way, I'll be the first one to apologize that, that that's the way that you were contacted. Um, yeah, that wasn't it wasn't the only thing that was, I don't know, that I guess started the fire of the frustration. Um, it, I mean, it was the beginning of it, but I mean, as we came to the council and uh, I had conversations with both of you, there were different things being said. And, and to me, that, that didn't feel good because I would hope that as uh, um, people, uh, priests and holders and called to the church, there'd be consistency in the, in the things said. Um, and so that uh, was, I mean, another reason for frustration and for the clarification that we're that we're seeking here. It wasn't it wasn't just the letter. That was just the beginning of it. Um, and I mean, the rest of the stuff that we've been talking about is, I feel like, is evidence that that wasn't the only thing. If that was the only thing, that'd be the only thing that we're talking about. But um, there are other things that are attributing that have attributed to that frustration, other than just the delivering of the letter. So, yeah. The delivering letter is a contacting his mom for the address. It's the just conflicting opinion. It's the not consent or like uninformed with not some check, of the not decision. checking in, um, making it, making it seem like it was about my beliefs regarding the church or that I've been speaking out against the church when I haven't. Um, so, are you saying? Didn't speak out against the church. Oh I, my lord! <laughs> For the tenth. Time. Besides so, talking to you, well, honestly, that, that, this is a question that I actually did have because in the letter it did say that it was related to my conduct. It was it's being called to the membership council for my conduct related to same-sex marriage, which alone isn't a reason to call membership council. Um, <laughs> but it sounds like you would run across something that would constitute as me speaking out against the church. So was there something that you felt like yeah. was constituted as apostasy that was also like an underlying reason to the council? It wasn't It wasn't purely for same-sex marriage. There was something else that... Um, well, your position on that? Your position, yeah, I was going to say, so the position you took was to make sure we're speaking the same language. You've never spoken out against the church and or its leaders? Not one time? No. Okay. Not, not publicly as it would constitute. Um, in in the in the in the handbook, because if I'm expressing this to my husband, Just is that, but is that speaking it you, out? You've never spoken anywhere. to our some of our friends, so close friends, but we never we you know nothing like, oh this church, but this is what a posse should should be like, which should constitute as a discipline needed to happen in a membership council. It's like repeatedly acting in clear and deliberate public opposition to the church its option its policy or its leader right we don't do that De deliberate public you know we we talk these are closed not, door I'm, conversations i'm not going out of my way to speak out against the church only and because no people social, ask no social media accounts. no 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 you no. will never find any social media that talks about church even i mean if you saying that saying that we just got married as against church and its leader then 
you know, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> if, that's what if you that's mean. the basis, and that's because that's all we've been sharing. Did you and you both attended BYU, correct? I I attended BYU. Okay, and when you were attending BYU, you kept the honor code the whole time. What, what? The? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah but except I mean, I obviously dated him, but I didn't share anything online ever. We the first we thing I shared until after you graduated to get married. Even the first thing I shared on social media about being gay or being married was January of this year. And it's only because I just say, hey, guys, I'm married. Come to my reception. Nothing regarding Nothing. That. I've never church. mentioned the word, hey, churches. We're in. married, but the church is in opposition to this. And man, we really never wish mentioned the church, the church was not in opposition leader. to our marriage. That was never said and never the intention at all. Um, and oh. so, and so when we're when we're talking about um, apostasy or my beliefs being in opposition to the church, I haven't done anything with those beliefs that would constitute as apostasy. I haven't spoken out against it. I I believe those things, but that's not a reason to hold a membership council to just have those beliefs because I'm a priest and I'm not temple endowed. And been and, active. And if that was the like case, if it years. was the case for me to be called because of my beliefs that were in opposition to the church, then I would hope that would have been in the letter, but it wasn't. I was called because of my conduct, not because of my thoughts and beliefs that are in opposition to the church, because of my conduct related to same-sex marriage. And so the, the fact that I was called for that and then the the new conversation of have you what beliefs do you have that are in opposition to the church um have have you been talking to people that um the the church is wrong in this area and it that in, a, in and of itself was hurtful and confusing because that was never spoken of or brought up before the council and so it it seems it it doesn't seem it is misleading if we're going to call a council on the basis of my conduct, but then bring up all these other things about that I wasn't called for. Um, well, conduct is a very wide word too. I mean, maybe we could work. Maybe we could I don't know what he's trying to get. Yeah, he's going to put everything on this word conduct. That it's conduct as your opinions, but it, I just want to make sure we're saying the same thing, and you're right. recording it, so. You've never spoken out against the church. Never, never once, done. Never once on social media. <laughs> Except for dating him, but yeah. that's it. We should do your membership council at the same time. Yeah. Since we're <laughs> but this is his membership council. By and to answer your question. That's right. good. No, that's a, I'm Correct. Not, no, I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand. So neither one of you have ever taken an adverse position to the church. Right? <laughs> no, no, never publicly. Only in closed door conversation. Even even those, we would okay, never be like. Pause, this is probably pause. the most okay. detailed. All of we the, all this repeated no, questioning no. is him verifying that the bishop's story lying. is lying. Is he's making Great sure point. he's making absolutely sure that what the bishop told him was not true by asking us directly. Because up to this point, he still he was still thinking that we were apostatizing as a same sex couple, mm -hmm. but we were not. And so he. Honestly, in, in 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 between both of them, I I feel I feel you know, I feel bad for the stake president more because he's also he's also been gaslighted and been kept in the dark about this. And so he's he the entire this entire conversation, he's been trying to figure it out. And the reason why we keep going in these loops is because he's not getting it yet. And mm -hmm. so finally, finally, towards the end, he I think he finally gets it that it, there was no apostasy ever. And I think he realized that when he was reading the letter during the mm -hmm. the, the entire conversation too, he realized yeah. there's nothing here. That's something that I'm realizing just right now. Like he's reading the document he has in front of him and he is realizing he can't point to anything there there's no apostasy. that he can say, oh, here, there's like, let's talk about this. Nothing. So they're, so he they're back nothing. to square one. But and it's he, fishing because it's like, okay, did you ever at any time ever say anything to anyone what about byu what about the honor code did you keep the honor code <laughs> well but it wasn't know. even his disciplinary <laughs> council i know did you take the sacrament he's, with your left hand because oaks doesn't like that he's, he's, he's covering all of his bases because he wants to make sure I'm that what he was he told was a lie i'm surprised he didn't say did you look at porn once or masturbate once when you were 14. Yeah. you know what i mean like yeah well yeah 
Maybe not. He would have if it wasn't he, recorded. He's super stretching. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's our, like Brendan has a good point. It's out of his desperation of like realizing in real time that there's no basis for them being there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This, this is his way of verifying. It's like, a, it's like a Hail Mary pass. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's trying. I think he honestly was trying to come clean about it. I think he, I think he was trying to have good intentions yeah. in doing it. So. Well, he's got five minutes. He's got four, five minutes left. He's got five minutes left to come clean or to figure it out. So let's see if he can do it. Yeah, that we've ever compiled uh, our thoughts regarding the church. Yes, this, this, this is, is this your thoughts or your collective thoughts, both of yours. But it's Brendan. I, I mean, I help clarify. He, he, he shares with, he shares with like references. But this is all me. Yeah, or on my own time. I, I if I can write another letter <laughs> based <laughs> on my thoughts. But if you want, was, I just want to make sure when I put this cover letter in the first presidency, if it represents both of you. you know no, I mean? I it's this that. represents that's Brendan. That's, mm -hmm. that's all I wanted to know. I have my own thoughts. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. It'd be, I don't know. It would. It'd be kind of nonsensical to bring a letter about Doug's beliefs regarding um, the church and for LGBTQ issues to my membership council. So no, it's just for me. Okay. Any other questions, Bishop, on your end? We'll get back to you guys soon. I really appreciate your time. It was very nice to meet you, Doug, and nice to see you again, Brian. He's trying to close it out. Trying yeah. Close it out. Thank you. Send out a message. Let us know what you think next. Because no, no, we'll be in touch. We'll meet again for sure. I promise you. But I'll get this off by tomorrow. I'll have it off, off to them by tomorrow, five o'clock. Yeah. Way we can get mm -hmm. I I wish we could get their perspective on everything that's gone on before, during, and after the council because the majority of my frustration for what's well, been all, going on all articulated is in the letter, trust me. Not not that specifically. I mean the the miscommunication and the contradictions and the misconstruing what the um, the council is even about. That's where the, all uh, the majority of this frustration is coming from. Th this is a, a whole, this is a compilation of what is frustrating to me about the, the church's teachings regarding LGBTQ issues. But the frustration that we're coming here about is because of what's happened before, during, and after the membership council between you two, not because of anything in that letter, if I wanted, I could probably send that to the first presidency myself, but I don't think anything's going to change because of one letter. So, so what are you thinking? What are you were saying? I think he just needs to be clarified on what you yeah, mean by what, sending what, a. What are you hoping will come of this by sending that? I'm just going to go through it and articulate the conversation before the letter that got sent to you, our conversation together, our meeting today, and this, and ask the first presidency. Hey, would you guys please point out the areas where Bishop May did the wrong thing? You know what I mean? Let us know where we've erred in church policy. Doug and Brennan feel strongly that we did the wrong thing. And if we did, we want to be the first to apologize. And that's the governing body of that the church. That is how you only said the bishop. So that, that's the way I'm writing the letter. It's not to be critical of you guys. Right. That, none, of that will, none of what's in this letter is going to communicate that. If the intention is to get clarification from the first presidency on where you two have erred in, um, in terms of uh, the handbook policies or the conducting of the membership council, that's not going to help with any of it. I think that, what he meant is to, to show that what happened in the council yeah. is you read that letter. Exactly. I don't mm -hmm. think it's it's meant to convince them of that's, anything. It's, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 so I think that's what he meant. We're asking the First Presidency, can you please just articulate where if, if we've done something wrong and we've made a mistake, please let us know. That, that's, that's the approach I'm taking with the First Presidency. Uh, that's that's what I'm going to do. But I'm going to send this as part of that. I'm just going to put a cover letter over the top of it to say, here's the sequence of events. This is what happened. These are the conversations that Bishop and I had. This was the letter that went out. This is all of it. Please let us know. You caught him saying, you know what I mean? But where are we buried? And then wait for the first presence to respond to Bishop and I. And then we can bring you back together and say, hey, first presence reached out and X, Y, and Z. That was my goal. That was my hope to try to take this and, and diffuse it in a way so that you know we're serious. When we say, we have no problem, guys, apologizing. We don't, we're not trying to die on some hill like we're, we're adversarial to, we're not. Like, we, we love the gospel, man, we're all in. We're all in. <laughs> okay. All in on what? How about all in on something? you like to do next? 
Absolutely. I think it's one thing that we need to peace of mind. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, peace of mind. Yeah. That's what we want. We just want to live our happy life. Yeah. I just wonder yeah, if he wants a some... situation would be to go back in time and, you know, wish none of this ever happened. But um, I think there's a reason for everything, honestly. <laughs> so there's a reason we're here. I really believe that, guys. Maybe it's not, you know, we're not here by uh, the way that we wanted to get here potentially, but I'm really glad because it was great to see you again, Brennan. I mean, I'm trying to think how many years it's been since I've seen you. It's been a while. It's not, it's not, it's not been a year. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think I stopped going to church right after I graduated high school. So it was in what, four years. Yeah. All right. Then we get into conversation. So. They're all in on everything, but actually listening. Yep. Yeah. With that cover letter, hopefully he wants some MP3s and some MP4s to include to the first. I presidency. know. I, I, I would. Yeah. I should have said, "Hey, by the way, I have all the recordings. You want to include that too?" <laughs> I know. Hey, we can still send them to him. Well, fortunately, um, the SCM. Can you imagine the, copy, so the first watching. presidency like reading all this stuff and listening. what are they going to do? Like, well, this like, is not so unrealistic. Is it the whole point that it's a local matter? Like, exactly. is it the bishops exactly. and state presidents? Of, so, mm -hmm. is it a local matter if they have to pump it, up, pump it upstairs to have them make the final decision? Exactly. I think the only reason the state president is recommending and wanting to do this is because at this point he realized how, like, he was completely fooled and, and completely thought that this was for something other than same sex marriage. And so, he's not ready to admit it because he's still working it through himself. Mm -hmm. The only person in the room who had the opportunity and who knows everything that was going on was the bishop yeah. and and that that's where it should have come from um i not not to fully re remove the stick president from uh you know the situation but i really i i do think that he was just as confused as we were and so i don't um, know i don't know because the bishop said at the beginning the stake president started the whole thing that's correct Right, but, but I we, mean, we already we, we already know like at know least four or five lies for, from the bishop. That bishop like, has lied. One more through it. Yeah, so I'm not convinced the stake president knew about it. Yeah, yeah, me either. But right now, what we're left at is this. You know, he's said he's going to the the end part that was cut off. He says he's going to send this off, and then um, that we will get back together very soon. Is what he said. The, yeah. I also gonna, I also know the way the yeah. church works, and this letter is not going. That's yeah. This letter is going to be forwarded back to the area authority, who will then send it down to this who, the, the seventy to the area authority, area mm -hmm. authority back to the stake president. And you'll never see you'll what never what see the it. response was when yeah. when I appealed. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't even let me have or read the letter that was the response to the appeal. Mm -hmm. They just told me we got a letter. Your appeal's been denied. I'm like, can I have a copy of the letter? They're like, no. Yeah. It still doesn't answer the question as to the status of your current membership. I mean, we know the stake president at this point has not excommunicated you, right. but yet he makes it so ambiguous in the discussion where he's saying, we need to see whether or not we erred and the first presidency will tell, tell us where we erred. Well, yes, you erred in what? In holding the disciplinary council or you erred in- uh, He asked him. Rever yeah. Revoking the membership. What? Are, where is the error and what are we- are, what, what are we determining the error to be? Because at this point, you've not received a letter saying your membership has been terminated or rescinded or whatever, yeah. revoked or whatever withdrawn. the church is calling it, withdrawn, withdrawn now. Right. So there's not, there's no decision that they're trying to appeal Reverse or, or, or appeal. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Or combat. So it's not going to do anything. And it's really, really what I think time. it is, is just they're trying to buy time for another response to figure out how they can adequately cover this up without anybody hearing well, about it. Well, I honestly it. thought but, that, yeah. That they were not, they're they're just gonna let time pass and not really. Yeah, th this will air. This is airing now. People will care about it, but they know that if they wait three months or six months or nine months or twelve months, that that people will uh, turn their attention to other things, and then they can quietly give you a letter, and no one's gonna care at that point. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say a couple things in response to my excommunication recordings. Probably the number one response was, John, I can't believe how kind and patient you were. And I want to say the same thing to you both. Given how outrageously ridiculous this whole process was, you two were amazingly poised and patient and charitable in, in how you just patiently, repeatedly tried to just educate them about how they had bungled this and hurt you. And you never got angry. You never got insulting. 
you you behave so well. I think that's fair and super admirable because I, and I look not only at this the strength and the stability of their relationship, but I look at those more vulnerable than uh, Doug and Brennan and wonder what what are their situations like. And I know what their situations are like because working in this space with LGBTQ people, especially at the intersection of Mormonism and LGBTQ Street, we deal in triage almost on a daily basis mainly at the hands of church leaders who initiate policy and procedure like this. And we literally are picking up pieces, trying to put families back together, trying to bring happiness back into a life, trying to create a solid footing where someone can walk away with their dignity and respect. And, and we don't see that too often. So I also want to echo what John, echo what John is saying and, and just commend you for your ability to stay firm and strong and to the point and, and to stand up for who and what you are. And, and that's what we need to see more of. And, and maybe that is what we've talked about in terms of threat and what the church is most afraid of. I honestly believe the church is more afraid of Douglas's and Brennan's than they are of those who quietly walk away in the night or of those who just resign their membership and never show up again. You are a threat to the church because you've defied the narrative and you've been able to stand up to the Goliath and with your single sling and your one rock, you were able to confound a bishop in front of a stake president. And that rarely happens. It shouldn't have happened. You should have never been put in this position. But again, thank you. Thank you on behalf of our community for standing up for, for who and what you are with dignity and respect. And I think that goes a long ways. Thank you. Yeah. I, I have a question really quick, Kyle, um, if it's okay. So you you have been in touch with what eight other couples that have been excommunicated for the crime of same sex marriage, right? Yeah. So I'm following your case. I think we're now 13 different couples currently, but six uh, six cases that have been ended up in excommunication, and uh, two more couples, so four more people who the bishops have just done nothing. They just walked away. So which residence. is it? I I keep hearing two things that the church is hunting season. And, and you know, Quentin Cook saying we need more disciplinary councils, like more cowbell, more cowbell, more disciplinary councils. Holland, pick up your muskets. I'm hearing that, and then I'm hearing the church doesn't do this anymore. They're going to just leave them alone. For, so my first question is, which is it? Well, it's it goes right back to how we started this episode. Um, is it a is it Oaks or is it Quentin L. Cook? Who do we listen to, Dallin H. Oaks or Quentin L. Cook? Because the messaging is completely different and. And that gets to the heart of this discussion. I know I have contact with people at 50 North Temple. When these happen, I have a phone number I can call and say, do you want the excommunication stopped? Do you want us to get involved? Because we can get involved. And typically the litmus, litmus, te litmus test in that situation is, does this member want to remain an active member of the church? And these, this stake president has been prepped and trained. He's, he's received some prior training because he asked the very same question members at 50 North Temple will ask me. Does this member want to remain a member of the church? Do they want to stay active? Do they want to have a connection to the church? If the answer to that is yes, then often there will be a general authority who intervenes in that, that excommunication and make sure it's stopped. Is that correct? Is that right? Absolutely not. We should be treating these all exactly the same. We should be on a, right. a foundation where right. it doesn't require a general authority or an apostle or a 70 to intervene to stop an excommunication just because somebody has influence or power or knows somebody else. That is absolutely not, not the right way, way of doing it. But unfortunately, that is how Mormonism is operating in this space. It is, it is, we've talked about Bishop Roulette. We've talked about Stake President Roulette. If we have an uninformed, ill-informed, unwell-intended uh, church leader who just doesn't understand this topic well enough, they're willing to do exactly what just happened in Idaho over yeah. and over and over again. And let's just be really clear. We all know how the church works. If if the church wanted, wants to make a change or make an announcement, we all know how they do it. The first presidency writes a letter, signs it, sends it to every unit in the church. And then what happens with that letter? Who wants to fill that in? It's implemented. It's or? read. It's read over the pulpit, over the pulpit. right? Yep. Mm. And I mean, oftentimes, right? Or yeah. it's put in the policy book when yeah. when the books policy books are printed out. So the first presidency could write a letter and say, option A, hey, cut that shit out. No more excommunicating same sex married couples. Leave them alone. That's one option they could do. They may not swear, but other than that, they could take that option. The second option could be, um you know, whole disciplinary councils on all same-sex married couples. But 
if they, uh, you know, still have beliefs or they still want to stay engaged, leave them alone. But if they reject the gospel or if they don't want to stay a member, then excommunicate them. That could be a second thing they do. Or a third thing they could do is, you know, uh, you know, enforce the apostasy thing, which is hold a disciplinary council only if they've met the grounds for apostasy. You all know what the grounds for apostasy are. Did they meet the grounds for apostasy and they're in a same-sex marriage? Then excommunicate them. But at that point, it wouldn't matter whether they were in the same-sex marriage. It would have been the apostasy that got mm -hmm. them out. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the point is, is they could make this crystal clear, universal, send it out to everyone, and and that's it. Maybe they don't do that because they don't want that letter being shared. They, that's not their position. That's not their intent. I think that's it it's, was. But what? And, are, they and could, I don't. I don't think there's unanimity in the quorum either. Amen to that. Yeah, I, I mean, so it's there's clear not from unanimity enough on uh, between Oaks and other apostles into what how they're supposed to handle the situation, and that's why they haven't come up with something like which that. Which is why I think it, it falls back to legacy. You have 50 years in Oaks's legacy of of just just bludgeoning the yeah. LGBTQ community. And in order for him to turn away from that, that would mean that his last 50 years of pushing this rhetoric was all for naught. Yeah. And I don't think he's willing yeah. to do that. It seems like, I mean, Quentin L. Cook and, and, and Todd Christofferson, they're all on the side of not um, holding disciplinary councils for same-sex marriages, but it doesn't seem like every apostle is on that same page. Mm -hmm. And it's similar so. to when we served missions, we had a senior <laughs> companion and a junior companion. And the problem with the, that same hierarchy exists in the quorum of the 12 apostles. You have six apostles that are senior apostles and six that are junior apostles. And if that's true, what you're saying, Brennan, that it would take a Quentin L. Cook and it'll take a Garrett Gong and it'll take um, just some Whoever. softer edges. Um, and any but let's future... not go. Let's not befool ourselves. Remember when Boyd K. Packer died, and we're like, "Oh, the church is going to become much more loving." Now Boyd K. Packer died, or oh, Dallin H. Oaks helped start Dialogue Magazine. When Dialin H. Oaks is in charge, then the church, or oh, Elder Holland is the kind one. He's the compassionate one. He loves everybody. <laughs> I remember Joanna Brooks once saying, no, "Joanna Brooks once said to me, none of them are going to save us." Yeah, they're they're none of them are going to save us. You'll be and waiting even if Uchtdorf is the silver fox and he's super loving and kind. Give him enough time, and he's gonna he's gonna fail us and disappoint us too. Forever Maybe I'll be wrong. I might be I'd wrong. Love for you to be wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, but but yeah. but history shows us once they rise to that top level of authority, they disappoint us time and time for again. For every Uchtdorf you have, you also have a Bednar. For every Quentin L. Cook you have, you're going to have... No, for every Uchtdorf you have, you have an Uchtdorf that gets old and then disappoints us. You'll, you'll be... <laughs> you... Kyle is trying to be... <laughs> I like it. I, I even giggled. So. <laughs> you will be, you'll be waiting around forever. Mm. And, Can I, you and, imagine? I, and I think the reason why this happens is because you have an apostle who gets into that leadership position and then realizes... Yeah. Everything else yeah. has happened in the past and they're going to have to die on that hill yeah. because trying to unravel everything in the past is going to be so difficult. Yeah. And if you try to unravel it or even scratch the surface, you're going to have people in the church leaving in droves. Yeah. So I mean, with the mass and vaccine, like, oh yeah, that's exactly right. And, yeah. and, and so they, they can't, they can't, even if they wanted to, even if Todd or Quentin L. Cook, if they became the senior apostle and then eventually the prophet of the church, if they were to do that, the members would complete, they, they would know everything and they would be exposed to all the lies and all the gaslighting. And then it, that would be it. That would be the church. And so they're put in this position of, we can't come out about it. We just have to keep up the ruse to, you know, hoping that these church members will stay with us and we can keep garnering their tithing to fund whatever operation we have in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Because who wants to be the prophet that ruined the church? Mm -hmm. and, exactly. And, and, and allowing same-sex marriage, I think everybody would say you're making this up. At that point, they would just be like, you're making this up. Yep. Yeah, and, and it is the question now, is that inevitable? I mean, we're seeing mainstream Christian churches go through this uh, very same, the Lutherans, the Episcopalians. Right. These evangelical uh, Christian churches are going through these growing pains. Um, we have some that are Orthodox that remain some Southern Baptist, some Jehovah Witness uh, congregations that are still remaining tight shipped. But uh, is that sustainable? And we also mm -hmm. look at membership retention in, in those uh, 
those congregations. And we also see that those who become more, mo, most orthodox and hold these traditional beliefs are also those who are losing the most amount of, of members um, and that uh, greater than natural attrition and loss uh, of, of membership. So I don't, I don't think it's a winning strategy. I, I will still go on the record that I would never want to run a church. I would not have yeah. zero interest in being um, involved in the management of an organized religion. I yeah. wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. MB writes, I still don't understand why the church doesn't just let these members walk away quietly. Why excommunicate? And I, I, I really do think if they're on the rolls, then the ward inevitably is going to look them up, go meet them, and then they have the threat of getting to know them. They still give them the option of, quote unquote, walking away quietly in the form of resignation. But if if he if be right means walking away quietly, as in living your life um, free as you will without being set up by the church, then yeah, I agree. Why doesn't the church do that? What they could do is just park your records at Salt Lake and just yeah. stop, stop pushing every, stop hounding people to find out their address where they move to stop hounding their parents and their family and neighbors to harass them to find out where they moved mm -hmm. let let the record just get sent you know if i want you to know where i'm moving i'll freaking give you my address if i don't give you my address yeah. it's nunya and freaking send the record to salt lake and just keep them all there in your little computer in salt lake and then and then your local members won't get infected won't by the yeah. you won't get infected by the gay menace, you know, of <laughs> of a gay couple living in your ward, making your kids want to be gay. And I think that's know? the part of the story that frustrates me the most. They, um, you can just you can set on one, and I don't believe it. But you can set on one shelf over here the fact that they were not hunted because they were gay. We can set that off to the side and not address that. But they were hunted. They were literally, in this story, they were literally hunted. Yeah. We had a bishop that was not their bishop, hadn't been their bishop for years and years and years, who sought them out through whatever means necessary to find them and then bring them to this court and to try them and convict them for what? What did he gain out of this? That to me is infuriating. That And, and that goes to what you're talking about, John. We should never be in a position where we're hunting down people to expose them and to let them know that we're bigger than you and we have more authority than you. And because of that, we're going to get rid of you and move on with your life. Yeah, That's what frustrates me the most about the story. Yeah, not, not just that, but to do it, but then to not be willing to admit you're doing it and to turn it back on them and say, well, it's because you didn't believe the right thing or right, you, yeah. you posted that thing once on Facebook and it's really you. We're not doing it, but we're doing it, but, but it's your fault. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. It's, it's just insane. Kyle, for the eight or 12 that you're tracking, is this pattern reoccurring where, where the leadership is, is all, um, nebulous and, and gamey about why the excommunications happen. Do yeah, you know? so it does typically, it's interesting, some of them uh, bishops will see something that's posted on social media and then they'll say, uh, they'll bring the, the couple in. Some of them are actively trying to participate in church. And I, I do see an interesting turn now that we're out of COVID or post COVID or navigating COVID, now that so some of these couples aren't going back to church yet but they were participating in zoom meetings and so that is going to be a new bellwether we need to see what cowbell is ringing at that point because is now are now bishops looking at this saying well they attended uh during zoom now they're not attending in person but they but they were married still in both situations here's the thing though dusty dusty johns who's that's another episode we should put in the show notes they were attending. That's right. And that other couple in Logan that got super mad that I made a TikTok about them. Yep. They were attending. That's correct. And so the fact that they're asking you guys, well, you don't even want to stay a member. You, you, you don't even want to attend. Well, they're guess what? They're excommunicating those who are, who attending, are well. attending. Yes. And who do still believe. Because the one couple that 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 uh live in Cash Valley, they still believe. Jeremy and Randy. Yeah, they still they still they still believe. So they're just making shit up. I hate to swear, but they're just making it up. It's exactly and so they're doing the same thing that they've tried to do with these guys. They are they're now bringing them in or searching social media or waiting for something that they think they have enough evidence to move forward with a council and then that that way they can just get rid of them. And uh, in some circumstances, it's working. We just had one in uh, in Alabama that was a excommunication 
that the bishop just moved right through. Um, we have one where another one we're watching in Idaho, one down in southern Utah we're watching. We've got one in Las Vegas. We have one in California. So it most these aren't just Utah centric either. Um, a lot of them that we saw in Utah have started to slow down, and and I think that has to do with. Uh, a lot of exposure, a lot of sunlight that we're giving this topic. And I don't think bishops want to touch this. Bishops, I guarantee there's not a bishop in Zion that wants to be the subject of a Mormon stories episode like this. <laughs> I can safely say if I were a bishop, I would not want to be the one who had their their councils recorded and then put on public display to show how what happens behind the scenes and what happens behind closed doors, because that's embarrassing for the church. You want to talk about defaming or, or uh, hurting the good name of the church. I think this bishop and that stake president uh, contributed a great deal to hurting the, the name of the church, the good name of the church by doing what they've done. Except it's the church. It's the system, not the people, because the truth is yeah, the church has these horrible, this hor these horrible policies, this horrible system, this total lack of support. They want all the money. Send all the money to us. We have all the power, but then all the blame goes down to that little bishop and stake president. Yeah, they might they might be at the forefront, but they're they're only enacting what they've been taught. Yep, and that's it. But they're also responsible for their actions and their or they their should, inactions yeah, as well. Yeah, they are still responsible. They should but take. It, an, they have. We have given them plenty of opportunities to to better understand this topic. Mm -hmm. The internet is powerful. The I have hundreds of podcast episodes of written stories available. John's got dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of stories that also match. Um, we can blame systems and I'm all on board for the systems versus people, but we also have a personal responsibility to better understand the people around us. And if these leaders aren't doing it, what will it take for them to get there? Yeah. Well, one thing that would help would be media coverage because this is an outrageous example and the trip won't cover these types of things. Deseret News certainly won't cover these types of things. The news media is bored. They're like, yawn, oh, the Mormon church is bigoted. Another uh -huh. one? Yeah. Not a news story. <laughs> and and even the trip won't cover it. So like like it there's we have no support from the news media. Yeah. Which is yeah. weird. Yeah. And the Desert News is going to agree this doesn't exist. Do you agree, Kyle, that this one was like a very uh a case that was kind of out there that's very this similar to the ones you've been looking at, like someone that's, you know, we've talked Un about it a million times, unendowed. Yeah, this, was, super, this is a super, super inactive. unique um, case. But I also have some that uh, um, some people who are very active on social media, who ha who are social media influencers, who are not touched. And I think the reasoning behind that is the church 100 percent does. <laughs> and I think Gerardo's exactly it. Yeah. Um, and you're not alone. There are some who are these social media Instagram stars that have quite a following and the church does not want that uh, painted uh, the wrong way. So they completely avoid it altogether. And so the logical question would be, is this if this is the process the church goes through in handling same sex relationships? then why aren't they attacking the social media stars? Why aren't the, they attacking those with influence? And this is why it got problematic for people in Idaho, because Dusty was a, a radio DJ. He was listened to by tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people on a daily basis in his career. And, and it was surprising to me that the church would go after a Dusty, uh, a Dust, a Dusty B for this very, Dustin Johns for this very reason, because of his notoriety and, and publicity. Why don't they go after Steve and Barb Young? Stephen Barb Young absolutely believed that same-sex marriage is good and healthy, and should and should be legal. I, that is, isn't that enough grounds for apostasy? They I, were certainly asking you about that. Mm -hmm. I think the only reason why they're not actively going over or going for people with um, with influence is because they know that if they don't do the process exactly right they're they're going to be called out for it because all these people with influence already have a following and i'm sure that um uh these these tiktokers on instagram they're not going to be abashed to tell everyone in their following how terribly wrong the church is you know doing and and even did so in their specific case um, when they were called to a disciplinary council so i think i think the church knows that if they try to go after them it's going to be even worse because mm -hmm. everyone will know then amen yeah. so when we originally talked and we can wrap this up but um the the three options Wait, it's only was, seven hours i know i've been watching this. <laughs> we, we got we got one more hour to go <laughs> So when, so when we were originally talking about the options that, that the church or church leaders have given these same-sex couples, it was the you divorce or separate or 
um, undo your marriage, you resign your membership or you face the council. I have a couple of these influencers who received letters from their uh, bishops or stake presidents that also said, and if you go public, you can. You, there's no reason for you to even consider attending a disciplinary council. We'll act on your behalf. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you put that out in the social media square, the, some of these stake presidents are trying to, to just stay ahead of that altogether and just say, even if you talk about it publicly, the fact that you are uh, under investigation or being called into a council or, or discuss it on social media uh, anywhere, then don't even worry about coming to a meeting. We'll just automatically kick you out. That's, uh, th that, that is the state of affairs we're in. All right. What's our, what's our last, what's our last thought or closing? Thought well, I'll, I'll just say one thing. I've thought about this a lot because I got excommunicated as I've said a gazillion times now. And I thought about it, the church, there, there's no good excommunication because in this scenario, number one, let's just say they're only excommunicating you because you're same sex married. Well, that's super bigoted and it's going to be a disaster for the church if that's the public perception. So then they move to, okay, well, it's your beliefs. You have the wrong beliefs. But like we know that 40% of the membership doesn't believe that the church is true. There's a gazillion members that don't believe a chunk of, of what the church teaches now as doctrine. So beliefs alone can't be what gets you excommunicated. So then what they always go to, and this is what they did with me, it's about speaking publicly about your beliefs. But think about that for a second. You can have beliefs, but just keep them quiet. And don't be honest and open about what you believe and don't believe. So you that's teaching them. you to hide or lie. And so there's there's really no good and interrupting your your freedom of speech, <laughs> your right to freedom of speech. But also it's toxic to live exactly. with thoughts and beliefs and identities that aren't you. So th this is a lose 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 for the church, <laughs> and that's why we cover it on Mormon Stories. Mm -hmm. We're going to bludgeon the church. We're going to hold up a mirror and bludgeon the church with their own dumb actions until the church changes. We got them to change the name of these things. They're no longer disciplinary councils. They're, they're membership councils. We got them to change the name of the, uh, of the consequence, which is from excommunication well, to, to membership withdrawal. Yeah. We're not going to stop. And so record your disciplinary councils. Record your meetings with your bishops or stake presidents. All you have to do is bring your phone in, pull up voice memo, hit record, Put your phone face down on the table so that they can't see the actual screen. Re record the sucker, hit stop, forward it to mormonstories at gmail.com. Let us know. And we are going to keep recording these things un until, uh, if you need to, and it's a phone conversation, put them on speaker, have another phone there, hit record, and record those conversations. Make sure it's legal in the state where you live. But we're going to keep exposing this garbage until it stops. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that if everyone just have the recordings of these closed door meetings, the church would be so much better. There would yeah. be way less abuse. There would be way less molesting. There would be way less of these physical cases just getting by, mentally, abusers just getting by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it might put some fire underneath some of these bishops, stake presidents, and branch presidents to actually better understand this topic. Yeah. They may actually take the initiative to say, you know what, I need, I need to figure out what to do. What is the right thing to do in this situation? And I think if they knew that there was a threat that they might be exposed, I think there are some bishops and stake presidents and other church leaders out there who would take the initiative to figure this out on their own mm -hmm. and, and be far more compassionate and, and better understanding and careful. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So Gerardo, what are your final thoughts? You're the one who kind of helped orchestrate all of this. We want to <laughs> okay. give you, well, we're not going to give you the last word. We'll give yeah. you the penultimate word. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, we hope the church does better, right? Like, I think that's why we're exposing it. Um, it's sad that the church often pins on people who are believers, you know, like the Logan couple who are not really out there to expose their abuse and willing to just, Stay a little bit more quiet about it or not talk openly and honestly about how the church mistreated them. Um, but the church happened to, you know, target a couple here who was willing to speak out. Um, and but also give them the benefit of the doubt until the very last minute. So, um, yeah, we just hope the church does better. And, and yeah, just like John, I encourage everyone to just record these meetings so the abuse stops you know that's a that's a really good point is is um 
how many of these happen that we don't know about that don't reach out to you Kyle that don't reach out to us probably and who a would, multiple of what's of, of what we we know about and right? who would be covering them if we weren't if we weren't taking the initiative to show what how much further would the church push this topic if we weren't in these positions if we didn't have microphones not, and, and platforms the, to do it not the Salt Lake Tribune nope nobody's doing it uh, Peggy Fletcher stack yeah. Definitely not the Deseret News. Definitely not LDS Living. Definitely not the Church News. Nobody would. Nobody would handle yeah. this. Yeah, not the Blogger Knuckle. Not the Mormon Scholar Community. Right. Yeah. Not but, even Sunstone. Uh, maybe Kyle, maybe Cardin. He might do it. Cardin and Quaker. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, Kyle, any last words before we give our guests the final? No, just want to thank our uh, our big audience for hanging through and, and sticking with the seven hours. I think this is a pivotal and an important episode, and and uh, this was a lot. This was a lot, but I think methodically it was so well done um, in terms of of just documenting uh, how we we kind of flowed through here. And I think the other part of this that I wish more Latter Day Saints and more of those uh, who are on the fringes or even of uh, far distant from the church. I wish more of us understood the history behind the LGBTQ experience in Mormonism. Now, we mentioned earlier on about on the record. I think that helps give us an, uh, some better framework on understanding what this uh, what this topic really looks like at a real time level uh, with within Mormonism. And I encourage everyone to, to really fall down that rabbit hole, because if you really want to understand why these bishops and stake presidents are doing what they're doing, you need to understand uh, the, the pathway that has been paid for them uh, in behalf of their church leaders. And, and through that pathway leads right through 50 North Temple, or it is the Grand Central Station for where so, so much of this bigotry and, and uh, prejudice, belief and ignorance comes from. It, it really emanates from the, the heart of Mormonism. And I, I hope to change that. I hope just, again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to create an, uh, something or recreate a renaissance or a, a different type of church. I just want the church to stop harming its people. I want it, I want the church to stop hurting other people. And I want to stop as a, as a gay man who has to live in this space. I want to stop wearing armor. Uh, I, I don't want to have to fear bullets and, mus and muskets and arrows on a daily basis. I just want to be able to not live in triage where we're constantly out there trying to rescue people. And we can do it together collectively if we better understand how to meet the needs of the LGBTQ uh, community. Because I guarantee you they will they will make an infinite and important impact on your life if you will allow, allow them to do that. And they will change you forever in a good way if you just better understand them. And, and that's my invitation to you and to the church as well. Um, and I, and I hope that at some point they take advantage of that opportunity and see the people that they're kicking out because they're losing the best and brightest. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll end as I did not begin by, by naming your podcast and YouTube channel correctly. It's latter gay stories. It's on YouTube, support them, donate. Kyle does all this kind of of his own good free will, but when he gets financial support, it helps cushion the blow a little bit. And Jay's been a good partner. So donate to Latter Gay Stories, support them, subscribe to them, because it's a great work. It's a great work. Yeah, we kick out hundreds of episodes and and we are constantly on the move, um, trying just to highlight a lot. We are behind the scenes in so much of this. And it's not the all we want to do is just bring sunlight to this. You've you've I think effectively termed that sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. And I want to just bring more sunlight into this situation. I don't care for adulation or praise, or I just really want the LGBTQ community to have some better footing. If they're falling out of the church, I want to let them fall out and have a soft landing where they no longer have broken bones and they're not able to recover, but they can stand up and move on. I want them to be able to have happy, fulfilling spiritual lives, wherever that takes them. I, I don't want them to hate the church and I don't want them to also feel like they're uh, a spouse to their abuser. I just want them to be solid. And, and that's why we do what we do. That's why we're spending seven hours on an episode discussing how this harms real people so that we can all together do better. But thank you for that plug. Beautiful. Sure. Thanks, Kyle. All right, you gentlemen get the last word. Yeah, I just want to start by just thanking uh, you, John and Gerardo and Kyle for giving us a platform for us to be able to voice uh, our feelings, our thoughts, which was not um, felt during this whole process with the church leaders. Um, I'm super grateful for On the Record. That was monumental for me to be able to figure out 
my stance and my beliefs with the church. And I think everyone should have a copy of it. Um, and I hope that this um, will help people to understand that ha having your voice heard can really help showing that um, what the truth is because they're so, the church is so rich and has so much bigger voices than most of the people it mis mistreat that it could cover up literally anything, you know? And so just don't be afraid to, to speak up and be proud. Happy Pride Month, by the way. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. Beautiful, Doug. Thank you. Yeah. Brennan? Brennan? No, I, I agree with all of it. Um, with all of that, um, we wouldn't be able to be here today and do as well as we did if we didn't have Gerardo's guidance or yours, yours either, Kyle, and um, helping us see the situation for what it really is. Um, I wanted to come here today to make sure that um, gay couples or gay members are not going to be persecuted anymore. But the, the sad thing is, is that we can't ensure that. If, if you're a gay member, um, wanting to pursue a family, wanting to get married, or just wanting to be a part of the church um, and live your life peacefully, you you will be at risk for this this kind of behavior um, wherever you may be, and and I and I wish I I, I could tell you that otherwise. So, um, you know, be 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 cautious and and be focused and if you ever do get called to a council record it um and uh, uh have patience with yourself and make sure to see uh, see the situation for what it is and really see through the weeds um because there's a lot of them so thank you beautiful all right thanks gentlemen thanks viewers and listeners be good to each other be kind to each other love each other Let's just uh, celebrate love in all its forms. And I say these things in the name of <laughs> Mormon stories. Amen. <laughs> Take care, everybody.